श्रेया ये दरवाजा बंद कर दो तुम चले जाओ विल गेट लेट गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबॉडी वेलकम टू डे थ्री ऑफ आर फाइव डे वर्कशॉप आई थिंक द फर्स्ट टू डेज वेर I mean, at least for me, it was a lot of learning to listen to all our resource persons who came. We had the first day. We had some very good speaker. Yesterday also, we had some very good speaker. And I think you can understand the different perspectives that we are trying to present to you, and trying to build a balance between the various dimensions of the UDA framework. Today, I am personally very, very excited because. the speaker that we have professor radhika session she is a historian but i have heard her multiple times and every time i feel there is so much more that i am learning so i would like all of you to you know be very very open minded in listening to her because she brings a very very different dimension and uh, traditional knowledge traditional practices and i am not trying to define what ma'am should speak because whatever i have heard has a lot of meaning so i don't want to put any boundary to how you are going to take your presentation forward so uh, ma'am uh, we don't introduce our speaker so i would request you to please uh, speak a little bit about yourself and before you uh, start your presentation so that uh, people get a sense of i mean the the audience is a, a strategic security uh, establishments basically army navy paramilitary forces and we have some very senior people representing and in fact i am very excited that there are officers coming from the andaman and nicobar <clears throat> because they are very much in the heart of where uda can be applied and also we are very happy to have some bsf officers also very senior officers and uh, the purpose of this workshop is also to connect with these very important organizations and i think you will all agree that there are different dimensions still to be explored and this is an attempt towards that so i think i will not take any more time and i will leave it to uh, radhika ma'am um thank you kamta das for inviting me and uh, please don't pay too much attention to his build up of me <laughs> i am a teacher i have been a teacher of history for the past 35 years and my work has been entirely on the period between the 13th and the 18th century so in a sense all my work has been on areas that are far removed from what all of you are dealing with because i do not deal with strategic security which is a national issue i predate my study predates the creation of the nation nevertheless there is a lot that i have done on india's maritime connections with the world and so i'm here as a maritime historian and as somebody who tries to bring out the ways in which our approach to the sea changed over the centuries and with that let me start what i'm going to be talking today is broadly traditional knowledge strategic security and sea power but the historical dimensions of that so there are three aspects like i said the traditional knowledge strategic security and sea power it's probably easiest to start with the last sea power how do we define sea power and what exactly does this term mean the term itself dates back to the late 19th century specifically as i think most of you would know to alfred thayer mahan who late in the 19th century published a book titled the influence of sea power on history for him control of the sea was an enabling force which permitted britain in particular to acquire mastery over much of the world by and large therefore his concept of sea power 
which remains for many the primary definition, is of military power exercised on and through the seas. Advocates of naval power in the 18th and 19th centuries largely believed that the navies have two major purposes, the protection of commerce and the acquisition of stations, colonies, and bases in different lands, ideally actually in distant lands. While the idea of sea power grew in these centuries, it must be remembered that there is a very long history behind this. Barbarossa, famous for his piracy, was reported to have said, he who rules the sea will shortly rule on the land also. Uh, Hugo Grotius, yet another famous name, in his theories of the Mare Clausum and the Mare Liberum, the open and the closed seas, and in his work, he contested Portugal's claim to monopoly of the Asian waters. Nevertheless, he tacitly implied the need to control the seas so as to contain the land-based powers and vice versa. And in an article published in 1950, Alison Reppy stated that Lord Stoyle rejected England's claim to the exercise of jurisdiction beyond a marine league from the British shore basing his conclusion on two fundamental principles of public law. One, that there is perfect equality and the entire independence of all distinct states. And two, that all nations being equal, all have an equal right to the uninterrupted use of unappropriated parts of the ocean for their navigation. It is here that we diverge from sea power and strategic security. Because we are talking, what Alison Reppy pointed to was specifically unappropriated parts of the ocean. First question has to be, what do you mean by unappropriated parts? And here is where I will go back to history, where a question that comes up typically up to the 18th century is, can the ocean be appropriated? So. I would argue that it is from here that we start up talking about security and the strategies for that, which is not exactly the same as strategic security as two distinct terms. So where do we see the elements of strategic security or of traditional knowledge? One answer to the second is historiography. Historiography is technically defined as the history of history writing. But in many ways, it is the key to understanding maritime history. And here, globally, we start with one of the earliest scholars of land and sea, the Frenchman Fernand Brodel. His work was on the Mediterranean world. And as part of that work, he stated that it was not possible to talk of land alone, for it was necessary also to look at the influences of the ocean on land he then went on to say that the effect of the Mediterranean could be felt far inland in Europe and across much of North of Africa. This is where, in another way, the idea of strategic security comes in, because security is concerned with both land and sea, and therefore of the continuum of land and sea. And that is where one needs to locate the idea of strategic security in historical terms. In India, a very important question has always been the relationship of our country to water. How has water been thought of or imagined? One of the major themes in colonial historiography was the supposed indifference of Indians to the sea, which was then touted as a reason for British success in India. Thus, that the British claimed the seas, owned the seas, therefore controlled the land and how it was possible to talk of indifference to sea with such a long coastline as we have is something that uh, in many ways and a very personal is why I started looking at maritime history. How do we ignore the sea? We, are pen we have a peninsula that just right out into the Indian Ocean. And then you say people are, are totally unaware of the sea. And the example that invariably is brought forward for this is Akbar conquered Gujarat to look at the sea. So what? That doesn't mean that there is an entire world that, yes, he looked at the sea. 
much more important, the sea is a reality in everyday life of human beings in India. Historically, we have always used sea salt. So nobody is far away from the taste of the sea, even if not from the smell of the sea. This is where, on a very personal note, this is where I started. The other part of it is something which is even more important, textiles. Indian cottons ruled the world, and Indian cottons were a low-cost, high-bulk item, high-volume item throughout history, until, again, the 19th century and the coming of Manchester cottons. Otherwise, Indian textiles were used everywhere. So Indian cottons were the currency in Sumatra until the 13th century. Indian cottons were demanded by everybody in order to get the spices of the islands. Because even if you didn't have gold and silver, you could always purchase spices with Indian cotton. Where in this is your indifference to the world? That's where, like I said, I started. Indians, it was said, were distant from the sea, even if some of the communities did live by and off the sea and its resources. But again, as I just said, given the size of the country, a large number of people were distant from it, and so most just barely knew of the existence of the sea, which is unfortunately a reality even today, because I've had students from rural Maharashtra who used to tell me, ma'am, humko uh, कोस्ट में लेके जाओ हमने समुंदर देखा नहीं हमें मालूम है कि महाराष्ट्र की बड़ी कोस्टलाइन है लेकिन हमने समुंदर कभी देखी नहीं है सो दैट फैसिनेशन कंटिन्यूज हिस्टोरिकली हाउएवर द सी वाज सीन एज बीइंग ओपन टू ऑल बट इट वाज पेरिफेरल टू द डेली लाइव्स ऑफ मेनी पीपल ऑफ द इंडियन सबकॉन्टिनेंट एंड one manifestation of this has always been the greater importance given to land revenue as opposed to that of revenue from maritime trade. Still, it is a part of it and it is a reality. And knowledge of the connection between land and sea, and this is where I will get to traditional knowledge. Traditional knowledge, not in terms of knowledge systems, but in knowledge of communications, of entities and of connections. People's places, cultures. These are the connections that are established through this interplay of land and sea, irrespective of whether the sea is distant or the land is cut off from the sea. That remains the point within which one needs to locate knowledge. When nationalist responses to colonial historiography began, some of the notions of colonial historiography were challenged. But the idea of the sea being by and large unimportant was never seriously questioned, despite the fact that, despite the fact that early scholars like Nilakant Shastri pointed out the significance of the sea to the Cholas in particular and to the peninsula in general. Fernand Brodel had said that trade follows those waterways that bring together the greatest variety of peoples, lands, and products. By this logic, the Indian Ocean world is perhaps the best placed, bringing together as it does West and East, as well as some of the most populated regions of the world. Historically, this is the old world in which the networks of trade had long been well established and extremely well traversed. Milo Kian Kearney has argued that the re region represents the largest single chunk of exploitable wealth on earth with such lucrative products as spices, gems, oil, gas, uranium, gold, tin, manganese, nickel, bauxite, and zinc. He forgot textiles, which are still prime importance. One of the earliest works which talks of the Indian connection to the sea was that of Sardar K. M. Panikar. Uh, writing in 1945, he said that Till the arrival of the Portuguese at Calicut, no naval power had appeared in Indian waters. This is the first writing by an Indian which specifically mentions the concept of naval power. And went on to say that after the Cholas, no other Indian power had made the attempt to make control of the seas 
a matter of national policy. There is a basic historical problem over here because the nation, even in Europe, had not developed when the Cholas were ruling in the 9th, 10th and 11th centuries. So there is no such thing as a national policy. There is an imperial policy. There is a kingdom based policy. There is a monarch based policy, but you cannot call it a national policy. That apart, but anyway, this perspective is indicative and representative of a particular time and space. But I'm going to shift focus now to an earlier time and talk about how the sea was considered in pre colonial and pre European entry times. Perhaps a different way of asking the same question is how do we look at sea power and security in history? and more specifically at these aspects in the Indian Ocean. Many of our sources talk of violence associated with oceanic spaces. The Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, a text of the second century CE, which talks of the Roman trade with India, was one of the earliest texts dealing with the connections between the Mediterranean Roman world and the Indian Ocean. And it says that as an, when you entered the Red Sea area, then the uh, Nabataean control over the lucrative incense trade between East and West was threatened by the rise of the new port of Maos Hormos at the beginning, at the top end of the, uh, the Red Sea. And so the Nab Nabataean state resorted to attack on ships at sea to prevent them from going further down from Maos Hormos. The same text also mentions that just like the fight over Myos Hermos. There is also the fight over the port of Kalyan. Today, for those of you who are familiar with Bombay, Kalyan doesn't look as though it could ever have been a port, but it was one of the major ones. Kalyan, Nala, Supara are mentioned in inscriptions and sources from about the second century BCE onwards. They are very important. Sopara today, uh, the creek near Nala and Sopara would um, well, it looks like a gutter and it smells like one, but nothing more than that. It is a, however, it was a creek on which ships could sail and they were regarded as being the sheltered creeks. This is no creek. Today, the only creek that you really see is the Versailles Creek, but you have it. It was definitely there. So the text also mentioned that the port of Kalyan was closed for two years because the land-based powers of the region were fighting for control over the port. Here is your first major context of not security, but strategic location, that Kalyan is important to revenue, control the port, you get access to the revenue. Epigraphic evidence gives a great deal of evidence on the sea as contested space. A record at Nashik in a Buddhist cave indicates that the Satvahan king of the time, uh, this is second to first century BCE to first century CE. Satvahan king claims here the title of ruler of the land that touches the three seas. So the term that he uses is Tri Samudradipati, the ruler of the three oceans. This title is taken on by a whole lot of the rulers later on. In the 7th century, an inscription talks of the Chalukya king Mangalisha, who crossed to the islands by a bridge of boats and who had an army that would conquer all islands. The eulogy of Pulikeshin, the Chalukya king, talks of his having invaded and conquered the island of Puri, Elephanta, and thus having made himself the master of the three seas. In fact, the uh, inscription goes into a whole lot of uh, lovely, exaggerated, but very lyrical prose, where he says that uh, the great king Pulikeshin tied the girdle of the serpent that rules the earth around his waist so that he controlled the serpent, the seas, and the lands. Lyrical, very, very lyrical and very, very exaggerated, but it's such a lovely way of expressing all of this. There are any number of inscriptions of the Shilahara kings of the Konkan coast who prided themselves on defending their coast and attacking the foreigners who came to their shores. 
And this is the first time that we get the term our shores. So there is a context of ownership, of possession, of pride that comes up with the Shilahara kings. Rashtrakuta's kings do not have that, but the Rashtrakuta kings are also the first who emphasize the importance of the control of the coast to prevent access to land. So it is coastline defense. And that is where perhaps for the first time, the notion of strategic security can be located of coastline defense rather than coast defense. Inscriptions from the North Konkan dating to the reign of the Shilahara ruler Aparaditya Deva in the 12th century portray an active engagement with the sea. In the Panhale plates of Aparaditya, he is described as having, quote, bathed in the Western Ocean at the holy place of Maruth on the occasion of a lunar eclipse, and then goes on to say that he uh, gifts a village to a learned Brahmin who enabled him to uh, bathe in the ocean at that time. Then there is a Thani stone inscription of the second Aparaditya, says that he, uh, quote, bathed in the excellent Tirtha of the great sea, donated a share of four Brahmas out of the proceeds of an orchard in Sthanaika Pattana. And Sthanaika Pattana is the term which possibly refers to the region south of, between Kalyan and Chaul. We can't, haven't been able to locate the uh, place. Okay. And then he says, an additional 25 drummers out of the produce of a rice field for the worship of the divine Somanatha Deva in Saurashtra. There is a, another inscription of the same time which talks about the Kadamba King, Goa area, wanting to go on a pilgrimage to Saurashtra, and he's in, informed by his ministers that he should not go that year because the pirates have been very active along the coast in that year. So to take the land route, but he says that I have promised that I will go only by sea, and therefore he postpones it. The following year he can't reach because hurricanes come in, and the third year he can't reach because the pirates attack him and he's shipwrecked. Finally, he manages it in the fourth year, but he does it on the coastal route. And there seems to be an indication that inscription which says that he was accompanied by ships that paralleled the royal ship. The royal ship went nearer to the coast and he was accompanied by a convoy of boats, of fast moving oared boats that paralleled his track towards the sea. So security, but not strategic security. Other inscriptions talk of a naval battle of at Exar, off the coast of Borivli in the 13th century. Unfortunately, we have no indication of who fought whom. There is the mention of the naval battle, but that's about it. And then all along the Konkan coast, we have Viragars, the hero stones, Virakal. Uh, many of these instantly have been moved into the museum at Goa, so you can see them there. And they testify to heroes dying while defending their lands against predictors from the sea. Clear from this is a constant engagement with the sea at the level of the state. It is perhaps from these that we can trace very, very infinitesimally the beginning of the idea of security. It is still not what we today call strategic security, but the idea of security can be brought up here. Coming to the East Coast, we have the example of the Cholas and their great expedition to Kadaram and Srivijaya. Kadaram is Keda. The reasons for this have been the subject of much debate, but it is significant that following the expeditions, diplomatic ex missions were sent to the Chinese court by the Cholas. Prior to the expedition, the Cholas embarked on a series of conquests along the Bay of Bengal, going as far north as Odisha, and thereby acquiring control of the entire coastline and therefore the trade and connections of the Bay of Bengal as a whole. We could see the expedition itself as the culminating point of this process, for that brought them both to one end of the Bay of Bengal world and to the beginning of the Chinese seas. So the expedition can be seen as one more dimension of the effort to gain access to and perhaps control over 
the rich trade across the Indian Ocean. While much is said about the Cholas, equally important are the Pandyas, for as rulers of Madurai, their connections with Sri Lanka in particular were very important. These connections were both diplomatic and competitive. If at one level matrimonial alliances were arranged between the two kingdoms, at another, we have information of the Pandyas attacking the Sri Lankan kingdom and taking away the crown jewels, which were apparently later seized from the Pandya and uh, by the Cholas, but never returned to the Sri Lanka. What ultimately happened to them is something that is one of the carefully concealed secrets of uh, history. The Cholas, as part of their campaign of control over the Eastern Indian Ocean, had to take control of Sri Lanka. And to do this, they first attacked and defeated the Pandyas. Then they got control of Sri Lanka. And it is important that they did not give this island tributary status as they did with other defeated rulers, but turned the island into one of their provinces, the provinces of Piram. All of these indicate aspects of sea power, but they are different from later centuries. The coming of the Europeans did change both the nature of access and the perception of control over the seas. While in earlier times, control and access were seen in terms of getting access to the lands at different points of the trading world of the Indian Ocean, with the sea being seen as the conduit for this, with the coming of the Europeans and the European notions of war at sea being of prime importance for access to land and trade, the idea of sea power as we understand it today also entered the world of the Indian Ocean. Strategic security is a follow on of these notions of sea power. Trade and the trading worlds remained, but the sea was seen now as the weapon and as the arena in which first the worlds were accessed, next conquered, and then monopolized, with monopoly over sea routes being a prime factor. Once again, it is from these areas that we move into strategic security. Who controls what trade routes? How do you defend the routes? How do you defend access to commerce? How do you prevent access to commerce? While we are used to thinking of strategic security as being primarily defense oriented, we need to remember that there is this multi-pronged dimension of commerce and defense. And very often it was commerce that was defended first and then the nation. It is not surprising that in the 18th century, the two prime examples of resistance to the Europeans took to the sea to challenge them. Kanhoji Angre by challenging by attacking shipping, Martanda Verma by denying access to the production areas. The former controlled coastal waters to deny access to land. The latter defeated the Dutch on land to deny access to both sea and land, except through his mediation. Can all these be looked at as manifestations of strategic security? I cannot talk of these in terms of traditional knowledge at all, because traditional knowledge here has no relevance to the modern context. For this knowledge deals with ways of engagement with maritime spaces that are no longer relevant. For the approaches in earlier times focused on mercantile connections and on coastal rather than on deep water engagements. It is this that we need to remember, that the sea was as much conduit as divider, and perhaps more the former than the latter. Trade, diplomacy, religion were all ways of connecting the worlds of the Indian Ocean, and armed power was just one of the dimensions. It is only, as I said, with the coming of the Europeans that things did begin to change, and in the 18th century, again, as I said, we have the examples of Kanhoji and Angri and Martanda Verma, who for the first time in India's history used European methods against the Europeans. Earlier, Queen Abaka of the Ikeri Kingdom was reported to have gone to war against the Portuguese, the first to do so. But subsequently, there was more of a tendency to play off one European nation against the other. Crucial to the engagements prior to the 19th century, was political control of Indian rulers over the production area. Control over the seas, however important and effective, did not really prevail over the entire landmass. For control of the land, even of the coast, 
was often enough to keep expansion from the sea in check. Strategy and security were much more geared, therefore, to protecting the land from marauders from the sea. For the point to be remembered is that given the extent of India's production in pre-colonial times, everyone wanted access to the land, and that could definitely be negotiated or negated. In colonial times, however, power over the land was affirmed by sovereignty over the seas, and then of seeing the seas as belonging to the land. And it is when we come to the notion of belonging that we change our context from sea power to strategic security. It is in the notion of belonging that strategy, security, and the combination of the two really start making much more, uh, well, at one level, one more, much more sense, and at another level, much more required. From the uh, sea power and strategic security as they developed became a matter of affirming and validating this belonging of sea to land through the colonial power or through the nation state, and then of the international acceptance of international maritime boundaries. From the 20th century, it is these aspects which have dominated the idea of control and security over and on the seas. As a tailpiece, I will say it is interesting to note that in the late 20th and 21st centuries, we are going back to the earlier dimensions of sea power, so that while the strategic and state-driven concerns still remain of immense importance, there is also once again a greater emphasis on the seas for commerce, culture, and more generally connected spaces. As I have been trying to say through the stock, the sea has historically been both that which connects and that which separates, both of which have led to contestations over the use of these spaces. Thank you. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Uh, basically, uh, after seeing a historian in the uh, maritime uh, studies, I have seen, uh, uh, I have two encounters. There is always I want to know more about these things. Uh, okay, are they really true? If they are true, of what period they are? One is the ma'am is the ancient uh, maritime uh, archaeological site, which is the Lothal, which I have been told it has been a port historically. It was a port during the Harappan time and all but i don't see any sea there or something to hold to believe I have, this i have recently came to know two three years back during my posting in gujarat and second is my encounter with the uh, religious text ma'am where bachpan mein maine suna tha bhagwan satyanarayan ki katha mein ek varnan aata hai koi lady hai uske pati ka ship aa raha hai sone chandi se lad kar wo puja nahi karti hai satyanarayan ki to ship doob jata hai बचपन में मेरे दिमाग में आया था कि शिप है तो इधर तो पता इज दट स्टोरी ट्रू अगर है तो किस टाइम की है क्या उस जमाने में शिप थे होते थे दिस इज टू टेक इट इन ऑर्डर लोथल मे हैव बीन अ कोस्टल साइट बट वी नो दैट द कोस्ट लाइंस हैव शिफ्टेड एंड वी नो दैट द दिस द रिवर हैज रिसीडेड लोथल वाज प्रीटी क्लोज टू वन ऑफ द आउटलेट्स ऑफ द इंडस डेल्टा it no longer is so the river has dried up and the coastline has changed so uh, dwarka was a port there are excavations at bet dwarka which have thrown up uh, stone anchors iron anchors so we've got a fairly continuous archaeological record from dwarka we've also got a record from padri which is nowhere near the coast it's near baroda it's on the river but padri has thrown up a cup of a bronze fish hook which is uh, or what 15 no 4.5 kilos now a fish hook of that size is not to be used for river fish it's too large which means you have to be catching sea fish so padri at some point was had access to the sea coastlines we know have shifted particularly on the west coast of india 
And that is partly because of silting, because uh, the uh, not so actually, no, it's uh, sandbanks and shoals along the west coast of India. We have a lot of those and we know that they have shift. Even now, uh, the naval people will be able to correct me much more, but the issues of uh, silting along the coast is something which is which we still have to deal with regularly. So the west coast. On the east coast, you have sand banks that block access to the river. And all our rivers go into the Bay of Bengal, but there's a lot of silting that happens. For the Gulf of Cambay, it's been estimated that with the uh, three rivers that empty into the Gulf of Cambay and the amount of silt and mud that they bring into the Gulf every year, the uh, Gulf of Cambay ought to have become land at least a million years ago, given the well, 10,000 years ago. But the fact is that Cambay is a tidal bore. So all that silt comes out into the Arabian Sea, which means that is also going to be part of your environmental concern of the, envir of the Arabian Sea. And then there is the reality that India has a diurnal tidal system. Every six hours it changes. And it is semi-diurnal, diurnal. So one coast is diurnal, the other coast is semi-diurnal. So all the complications of time, silt, management, all of that comes in. Perhaps in all of this, Lothal was affected. Lothal, however, seems to have been, uh, well, there are two. There is Lothal and there is slightly to the west of Lothal, there is the old site of Satkajandor, which also is a port. Neither of these is anywhere close to a river or the coast now. The coastline has changed, whether it is silting, whether it, is, it could have been earthquakes also because these are also tectonically, they used to be fairly volatile. Any of these is possible, but originally, yes, it was a port. Today, it cannot be considered one any longer. Then uh, the stories, ships have been known to the Indian systems probably far longer. Historically and worldwide, boats are your first method of transport. You would have first your log, you would have a dugout canoe, you would have your rafts tied together by rope. And the uh, catamarans that we talk about on the East Coast, your, the name is comes from katamaram, which is logs tied together. And the advantage of that is that they go on the surf, so they don't capsize easily, they don't fall in easily. So the cat catamaran is your, Easiest, fastest access, fastest has been proved by all your long distance uh, racers who use the fiberglass built catamarans these days. But it's your double hulled boat, which means that you've got balance and you've got speed. That becomes a crucial dimension for us. About the sinking of ships, there are any number of stories. Fewer, the Satyanarayan stories are few of them, but you have a large number in Buddhist and Jain texts. There is a Jain text called the Soparaka Jataka, which is a Jataka based in the city of Sopara, which talks about how a Jain merchant uh, ended up spending nine and a half months at sea because the winds were so contrary that he was driven away from land every time he came close. And so uh, at the end of it, it says that um, he did his due penance to uh, well to Mahavira and therefore decided the following year to go out to sea again because Mahavira would take care of him. Buddhist stories talk about nine kinds of dangers that the human faces and the seventh danger is shipwreck. Then there are uh, around particularly the Bay of Bengal world we have uh, what are called votive tablets, little, about that much, uh, little clay tablets, maybe stones, sometimes wood, not that much. They're called votive tablets, which basically says, our thanks to Avalokiteshvara, the guardian of the seas, for having allowed us to cross the seas. Okay. Jump to the, 
well, the 10th century, no, 13th century, and there is an inscription of the Gajapati king of Mutupali port, which says that because the, uh, it's in fact called an Abhaya Sasana, as in the great proclamation of mercy. And it says that because the Tajik traders and the word Tajik is a broad reference to all Arab traders, because they come to the port uh, braving the dangers of sea loss and shipwreck, we allow them to rent spaces to store their goods without any uh, specific application to the state. 100 years later, the same inscription is renewed to say that because they come and they have so much to trade here, we will permit them to buy houses in the city of Mutfili. There is this immense sea-based connection and both ship-based connection that exists. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, that is in Buj, ma'am. Buj. And uh, it is known that to that Lakhpat uh, Raja, he used to collect bring back uh, Anna for one day, sir, for this revenue from fish fishing, for this protein. So, in 1819, the massive earthquake took place. This and river was flowing, Indus was flowing from this yeah. uh, uh, Lakhpat uh, Kila. And in 1819, a massive earthquake took place and it shifted to west side yes. so that is the it's a real story it is a, and uh, used to now that asi is looking after that particular fort and it is renovating it and this industry the industry river was known as banganga that time it was and you've got lots of these stories the ghagar today has shifted course totally and instead of emptying into the indus it empties into the ganga so it's instead of moving westwards, it's moving eastwards now. So rivers change. It, take recently Koshi River after the last floods, the change, the river course has changed so drastically. So rivers, water is a volatile force. There's no way of controlling it. There is a way of accessing it, and there is a way of perhaps dealing with it. There is no question of controlling it. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, good morning. Uh, yeah. <laughs> ma'am, uh, we are aware about the mythological aspect of Ram Setu. Hmm. You know, uh, is a, a landmass connecting near Rameshwaram, Dhanushkodi with Sri Lanka. So what is the historical perspective and geological characteristic of that rock or something? Because specifically, there are uh, Indian Ocean is meeting with Bay of Bengal there. So in that reference, I uh okay if we really going to look at it historically actually i would say geologically rather than historically because the chances are that these monuments date back to the old split of the gondwana uh the old continent of gondwana so probably before the pleistocene age the continents began to split and that's when you have uh, Australia first moving away totally from the Asian landmass to become a separate island. And geologically, these uh, seem to be rocks that date back to the Pleistocene era. So it is a very old system. However, uh, given the kind of mythological and Faith associated details, a detailed geological study of these of the rocks has not yet been carried out. So we have not tested them as yet. Excuse me. Yeah. Ma'am, I have uh, one thing to ask you, ma'am. And may I know is there any uh, connection between the Dola Villa, Dola Vira uh, on the west coast and uh, which is the uh, India's uh, Valley of Civilization uh, with the sea? Uh, which is nearby, ma'am. Yes. I have visited that place, but there is no much of uh, information available uh, than one small museum which is there at that Dolavira site, ma'am. See, Dolavira is still being excavated, and Dolavira is going to take between them, Dolavira and Rakhigadi is going to take up the energies of the archaeologists for the next 20 years. There is a phenomenal amount to be found. At the moment, they have not yet established a clear link with the sea, but given that the sea is so close by, 
it is probable that there was a link. There is a, uh, well, a counter-reformation from the other side, as in um, Sargon II, the ruler of uh, Assyria, Babylon, there is a, an inscription of his dated to 2200 BC, which would be contemporary with Dhulavira, Lothar, all of those settlements, which says that into my great port of uh, Magan come the ships from Meluha, Dilmun, and other places. Now, Meluha apparently is the term that they used to refer to the Harappan civilization. Dilmun is the island of Bahrain. So there are there is talk of ships coming from there. That would have been coastal shipping, not cross ocean shipping, because that would have been the coastal route rather than the direct route. But it existed. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, one uh, point, ma'am. Uh, what is uh, going on? Uh, is there any research or something going on on the lost city of uh, Lord Krishna, that is Dwarka? Because we have seen uh, recently our Prime Minister also have. Uh, Dwarka no. and Beit Dwarka excavations have been quietly going on since 1950. Lost city of Krishna is the mythological dimension, but the lost city definitely exists. So we there is a distinction that is made between Dwarka and Beit Dwarka. So what they're concentrating on now is Beit Dwarka, which is the coastal fall. And that's where uh, a greater amount, I mean, Three points at which underwater archaeology is really going on is Beit Dwarka, and on the east coast, in the Tamil Nadu coast, in uh, Arangan Kulam, and uh, that's south of Pondicherry, and in uh, a little south of uh, Manigrama, south of Pondicherry. Those are the three areas where Max. Recently, they've also started the excavation at Manikapatana in Odisha. And Manikapatana shows continuous engagement with water from the 5th century CE till the 16th century. This is continuous. And today, Manikapatana is not on the coast. It's not on the coast. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma one question from my side. Uh, you being a historian, maybe you will, uh, you may throw some light. Uh, can I ask you a question about uh, lost rivers? I can try and answer. I can't okay. promise. Okay. <laughs> uh, there is a mention uh, of river Saraswati in mythology. And uh, it says that it flows uh, uh, from down, the, from Indus to it uh, goes down the Arabian Sea. And now it is lost. Now, BSF is uh, deployed all along the eastern and western borders. So, um, there is a place, uh, a state uh, called Rajasthan, where the temperature rises, rises to 55 degrees, there is shifting sand dunes. Uh, water is a scarcity. So, we, in search of water, collaborated with ISRO and uh, we tried to find out where all this uh, groundwater is available in Rajasthan. They did a survey. And they found out that uh, uh, there is a Pelu, uh, the river Pelu all along the uh, Ivy, yes. all along the Ivy, and we did some dictatorial uh, uh, this thing, um, and we found some water somewhere. So, can you throw some light on this? Is there any river sort of thing? There should have been, because GIS and satellite imaging has thrown up images of what seem to be old river courses below the Thar Desert. However, uh, okay, we know that the Indus course has shifted more westwards. We know that the Satlaj course has shifted more northeastwards. Somewhere in this, possibly, the Saraswati was one of the rivers that finally dried up because you need access well, you need access to the mountains or to the rate or to a lake from where the water will flow out and you need a connecting point as well when with the shift in environment as well as the desertification of the place there is no source of water coming down and therefore i would say that this is when the rivers dried up uh, for the harappan civilization itself it's being argued that the civilization came to an end because of migration away from 
increasing uh, dryness of the region. Uh, the old stories about Aryan invasion is all a lot of nonsense. There was no invasion, but there was definitely a moving away from that. The site of Mohenjo-daro, which is the oldest of the sites to be excavated, shows clear traces of flooding at the lower levels. Today, the Indus is 35 kilometers away from Mohenjo-daro. So rivers have changed course, rivers have got lost, and yes, they have got dried. Right. I guess it's a little bit tactical. Mm -hmm. Is it too pattern? I know pattern. Yeah. And, uh, there is a one uh, ancient park there where Baram Khan was murdered, said to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, somebody told me ke they had a very water park there made. It's a all archaeological type thing. Only remnants are now there. Mm -hmm. cannot. So, now they are dried up. So it is written there that water used to come from River Saraswati. Then I tried to find out on the Google map where is the River Saraswati nearby, but there is no. Is. But when I enlarge the map, seeing the Google, there are traces are seen from Patan and till going till Maharashtra. Traces are like that. Kya kabi nadi rahi hogi? Nadi to rahi hogi, lekin nadiya. History mein hai. Sabse problem ye hoti hai ki bahut agar purani hoti hai, to fir hume unki information मिलती है और माइथोलॉजी मिलती है इन दोनों को आर्कियोलॉजी के साथ मिलाना बहुत मुश्किल हो जाती है गूगल मैप पे ट्रेसेस मिलते हैं ट्रेसेस तो बहुत मिलते हैं आई जस्ट अ फ्यू ऑब्जर्वेशंस एंड सम क्वेश्चंस आई वाज ऑलवेज ऑन दिस कोर्स अबाउट क्लियरली व्हिच वन इज व्हिच इज चेंज एंड आई वाज कांसेप्ट ऑफ मिशन और किंगडम in some pictures we want to do the king of the kingdom or there was there some the kings were all over and they were from the nation so we are talking about i need to look up aspect of how it was the particular in the state of the prince empire and in the in the south east asian region of chala so we have to look up in in our uh, big and in nation concept of nation nation or concept of kingdom but there are a lot of differences you need about ownership and the same you know the access to those ownership Which is caused by a very recent phenomenon in terms of explosive economics, one of the two hundred and fifty miles, which goes from two hundred and fifty miles to two hundred and fifty miles. So you know, it's a very important thing to see that you know these so-called global commons also can be owned to some extent because of the deflation of middle class. So I have to look at that. But the other aspect is on this carbon footprint. Which, which is um, again, you know, which has been established in front of Chinese pottery and all that. There did be connections with China, the PlayStation companies out there. I don't know, of course, but there's no more there. You know, and in fact, they said the very first record of tsunami came over the Kenai. You know, the, the, so, so can you quote me all this and give us uh, 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 some idea of the maritime nation that you're inviting to? First, uh, the maritime nations. as we understand nations today are much more a development of the northern european context i would going by the kinds of readings that i have done i would think the first indication of a maritime nation of any kind would have come from the vikings because it is they who talk about going out from viking land and coming back into their own land so this notion of their own and of raiding outside their own region is probably something which comes from the vikings it is uh, established much more over fights over control uh, over access to fishing grounds and that is also one of the uh, things that comes up before hugo grotius's account because part of the negotiations that were happening in europe at that time was uh, Britain and Denmark trying to deny Portugal the right to sail into the North Sea to fish in the North Sea for the cod, and that was where the Mare Clause, the Closed Sea, actually really comes into existence, and it is challenged. Grotius and others say that uh, the notion of the Closed Sea, no, sorry, the uh, Portuguese say that the notion of the open sea can exist when everybody knows the limit of the nation and the sea. but all other seas are closed because they are monopolized by others grotius turns this on its head to say that 
the open seas are necessarily open to all. The closed seas are those that are controlled by nations. So Mare Liberum is now Indian Ocean and Mare Clausum is the European seas. So this is where your notion of defined maritime spaces starts coming in. This is further added to during the Napoleonic Wars. When you have the Navy, to some extent, definitely with the Elizabeth in England, but much more with the Napoleonic Wars, when Napoleon establishes the con continental blockade to try and prevent goods, French information going into uh, Britain. It doesn't succeed. And Nelson, of course, becomes the hero of these stories. But that's where your second context of defining the connection between land and sea and of sea as therefore that which you fight in to fight over. That comes up probably the Napoleonic Wars. In the colonized world, the contestation happens much more in the Atlantic over the slave trade, but even more over uh, access to the Americas, so South America in particular. And that's where you have the contests happening between Spain and Portugal and uh, Italy, uh, not so much Italy, but uh, Holland and England at the other level, which is also part of the reason for the search for the Northwest Passage. So all of that starts coming in. Uh, in the Pacific Ocean, there is less of a contest in the northern part of the Pacific, but it is much more to the southern part. So the links from Mexico to Manila, where you have the great Spanish, the Manila ship coming every year, that becomes contested areas. So these selected areas become. The Indian Ocean, by that logic, actually is defined much more rigorously after the British conquer India. That's when the Indian Ocean becomes narrowed down spaces. So, then uh, the Cholas, they are still dealing with a world which is of uh, imperial control over points at the sea. So Srivijaya, Champa, Keda, Kadaram give you Sunda Straits, Malacca Straits, and South China Seas. You control those areas, you've got it. They've already got Sri Lanka, which is your one major crossroad. They've got the Kalinga area, that is your Odisha coast, which is your other connection, which takes you into Pagan, Burma, and into South China. They've already got much of the Bay of Bengal coast. If they cross over and they get Malaysia, now Malaysia is a little bit of a problem because there's too many trade connections over there. And if they attack, then those trade connections get disrupted. So down through the Sunda Straits and into uh, Kadaram, because Srivijaya controls your second axis of the uh, Indian Ocean. One is Sri Lanka, which gives you uh, Africa coast, India, and Southeast Asia. Srivijaya would give you China Seas, Japan, and the Polynesian Islands, particularly Makassar. And Makassar is noted for its uh, excellent wood. So that's your connection. I want it. <laughs> Have I missed out any answer? <laughs> Kaveri Patanam, okay. Kaveri Patanam, the, the original Kaveri Patanam of the old, the, the Sangamera Shoras is usually called Puhar, and that is definitely destroyed by a tsunami. Story, of course, says that uh, the king did not do the, like your Satinarayan story, the king did not do the required prayers to the goddess, and therefore she sent the great storm to destroy it. Uh, later, Cholas re-established Kaveri Patnam where it is today, and that's where you've got your China connection. The original Puhar probably lay slightly further out to sea. So it's, but the current Kaveri Patnam is definitely from the Imperial Cholas onwards. Uh, both uh, on the west coast and the east coast, and uh, I think we have discussed once about uh, uh, boats uh, moving, I mean, fleets moving from the northeast hmm. right up to the Kerala coast. So can you throw a bit of light on that? Okay. 
first in front of all the Navy people. I don't think I should talk about Navy. That's not my area at all. <laughs> but uh, on a different note, I will say that there have been records historically of movement via the rivers, as in um, we have records of um, Northeast, the Brahmaputra, Tista, and down into the Sundarbans region. And then the movement from that region, it can be two way. You can go across land into uh, the Narmada and then down the Narmada. Those seem to be the most important waters. Then there is the coastal movement down southwards from the Narmada, which will go uh, Jetapur Creek, Pauna River, all of those right down till Goa. Goa is seen as the biggest natural harbor. And uh, then you move further south and you get to the Karwa region. So Karwa is an important and it is constantly fought over. Nobody has talked about it enough, but Karwar, then Honavar Bhatkar. These are the important ports that are mentioned. Mangalore, referred to in Arab and Jewish records as Al Manjarur, is a very important point for the Vijayanagar kingdom. And that has connections with uh, Cairo and with the Jewish networks of Cairo. Honavar, Bhatkal, Basrur become very important as rice um, and horse trade. So I'm not sure, and this is where I think you, all of you from the Navy would be able to correct me on this, but Bhatkal seems to be the port to which horses come because the reference that we've got in the Portuguese records says that the Bhatkal surf is not as high as Basrur, and therefore horses can be landed there easily. Basrur is the rice port because, again, the Portuguese records say that the Basrur coast, even if the surf is high, it doesn't matter. You're only loading rice. Nothing's going to happen to it. So that's your connection. What we do know is that there is a regular movement of the two sides of the coast, coastal shipping, but also around Sri Lanka during the monsoon. So many, the fishing fleets of the west coast of India move to the east coast during the uh, initial monsoon, and they move away from the east coast to the west coast with the retreating monsoon. And this, I know that Maslipatnam, when we went to, when I went to Maslipatnam in May, some years ago, we found that all the fishing boats were being realigned so that instead of being tied to the harbor this way, they were being angled to the harbor. When we asked why, we actually got this very long suffering look from the fishers saying, of course, it's because the West Coast boats are coming in. We said, why? And they got an even more disgusted look saying, Itna bhi nahi Bare shuru ho rahe hai, abhi na, idhar sare boats. So this kind of connection definitely exists. Now, I will leave this here to the experts to talk about because I think these are dimensions that the Navy needs to take into account. What I talk about is the age of sail, but what is required is the continuity of connections that exists beyond the age of sail. And those connections need to be understood, need to be tapped into to understand what happens where. And there is an immense amount of local knowledge of the movements around, and that needs to be done. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Very important. Uh, dredging is okay. Now this is specific to two rivers that I've talked about. One is the Penna River near Chennai. It's on the Coromandel Coast. Fisher folk on that river say that uh, don't dredge when the monsoon has just finished, because then you will ruin the water. So dredge when it is dry,
because that will help you to clean the riverbed enough to be able to handle the full force of water when the monsoon comes. They also, of course, said that uh, past 10 years, there hasn't been enough of a monsoon, so there hasn't been an issue. But dredging happens only at that time. And uh, they also said that the dredging has to happen when the water is low and when the tide is low. Now, what the connection is to the upstream for the tide or something that they could not explain properly. But there seems to be this thing which says that when the tide comes in, even if it is far away from the coast, there is a problem with the dredging. So some current somewhere, something flowing upwards, I don't know. And that they weren't able to explain at all. But that definitely happens. The other part of dredging is in the Brahmaputra, where they are busy using very, very heavy diggers, which is going to ruin the entire uh, environmental diversity of the region. So the Brahmaputra, basic what uh, communities that have lived in the charts of uh, the, the small islands of the Brahmaputra, what they say is apparently that the Brahmaputra left to himself will clean up the riverbed on its own. There is no need for any dredging at all. It is a very fast moving, remember, remember that the Brahmaputra is Nad, not Nadi. It's a male river. So the Nad will sort it out. Itni mahan hai, itni badi hai, itni gheri hai, apne aap sambhal lenge Brahma. So, so chhod do, is what I have said. That's about all that I have specifically done. I won't venture to talk about other rivers because I have no access, I haven't talked about them. No, that's, that's quite an important subject. It is. Hmm. When you should do it. Yes. When, hmm. They're not. They are not, which is why there is. We are. Yes. And the European experts do not have enough local knowledge and they don't have access to the local knowledge. It's up to us to look at this local knowledge and try and I'm not saying that the European methods needs to be need to be negated altogether, but we need to use a combination which will allow us to maintain the environmental balance. And we've done enough disturbance of the balance already. We need to maintain what we have left to us. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.
for the indo pacific region or more closer the indian ocean region the significant fragmentation across the stakeholders so how we can bring them together to address the challenges and opportunities of the tropical littoral waters is what we are looking at here we <coughs> drive policy interventions technology interventions and also acoustic capacity and capability building so that this niche domain can be taken forward in a very very seamless manner emasi started with a mission to spearhead the uda framework today maritime research center has carried out milestone projects trained students and young professionals hosted policy makers leaders experts on the mrc platform set up centers of excellence across the country gained nationwide attention and started conversations on issues that matter i mean the point actually is that when you are talking about something which is not yet in the in the in, in the foreground of our national consciousness or in the consciousness of our strategic community then somebody actually has to start ringing the bell and mrc is doing that i think the the prime ministerial uh, speech at the un in my view should also be taken as a directive for early implementation of uh, whatever is what what was envisaged in the sagar mala project i think this is a non explored area a sunrise sector and it's of great strategic importance that this actually uh, this kind of evangelical work needs to be needs to be further strengthened and further accelerated so i compliment mrc for this especially in the light of the indo pacific and the indian ocean uh, having become the fulcrum of global power we have to understand the underwater domain uh, i wish the uda uh, initiative all success in the future and i'm very happy to see that the government agencies of india and international agencies have all taken note of this initiative Maritime Research Center is building the future of the underwater domain. Join us in our mission today. Here is presenting our very first newsletter for quarter 1 of 2024 at the Maritime Research Center, Pune. and nirdhavani technologies we performed various ground breaking activities pushing the boundaries of maritime research this quarter has been marked by impactful collaborations we've made remarkable strides in our partnerships and launched exciting new initiatives some of the major updates from the january march quarter of 2024 are as follows These remarkable strides would have been possible without you our valued supporters so we invite you to check out our latest newsletter learn about our latest projects ground breaking discoveries and upcoming events stay informed stay engaged and be a part of our journey towards a better more sustainable maritime future thank you for your continued support together we are making waves The 21st century has seen a decisive shift in the global order. The Indian government has demonstrated significant maritime intent with the Sagar vision of the honorable prime minister. This maritime focus has resulted in multiple mega projects by the government of India. Like the Sagar Mala, Bharat Mail, inland water transport, multimodal transport, the deep sea mining mission, international seabed authority allocation. With this strong maritime intent India is well positioned geographically and geostrategically to play a leadership role in the region. 
the tropical littoral waters present unimaginable living and non-living undersea resources. The economic opportunities in the Indo-Pacific of the global commons as a facilitator for economic growth are waiting to be explored. It also comes with its fair share of challenges. The Indian Ocean region today is at the risk of facing political challenges like volatility, fragmentation, instability, lack of synergy among nations in the region, over-dependence on extra-regional powers, economic challenges like inequalities, growth challenges, lack of big investment and technological challenges. There is one promising solution. The Underwater Domain Awareness Framework proposed by Maritime Research Centre provides a solution to these challenges and opportunities. Let's understand the UDA framework in its horizontal and vertical construct. Four stakeholders of UDA are Maritime Security, Blue Economy, Environment and Disaster Management and Science and Technology. The horizontal construct looks at resource availability in terms of technology, infrastructure, capability and capacity. The vertical construct gives a hierarchy for establishing underwater domain affairs. Ground level looks at sensing underwater domain for threats, resources and activities. The second level makes sense of the data gathered for security strategies, conservation and resource utilization plans. The third level formulates and monitors regulatory framework at the local, national and global level. In this way, the Underwater Domain Awareness Framework provides a comprehensive way forward for stakeholders to interact and solve multiple challenges being faced by the nation too. The oceans, limitless, powerful, unknown. They have long awoken a sense of awe and wonder. But today, we must ask a question. How much do we really know about our oceans? To what degree are we harming them? To what degree are we utilizing them? Oceans have been protecting us for millennia. What can we do now to protect our oceans? Today, let's talk about underwater domain awareness. There are typically four stakeholders uh, when we talk about the UDA. The national security apparatus, whether it is internal security or external security. The blue economic entities, which are engaged in commercial exploitation of the maritime sector or the underwater domain. The third is the environment and the disaster management, which looks at sustainable growth. And the fourth is science and technology. National security apparatus is a key stakeholder of underwater domain awareness framework. External security helps prevent an adversary coming into our waters and creating disruptions. Internal security focuses on avoiding disturbance from non-state actors. There are tremendous opportunities in blue economy, be it in shipping industry, deep sea mining, fishing, oil, gas and many other areas. But first, we need to understand the underwater domain to steer blue economy growth in an effective manner. Increasingly, we have been seeing a lot of disasters originating from the oceans. What is our preparedness to this threat? Environment and disaster management aspect of underwater domain awareness looks at sustainable growth. Science and technology is the driving force behind all aspects of underwater domain awareness. It deals with understanding the ecosystem that exists. Understanding the interaction between components is extremely critical to steer a sustainable growth model. When we look at the Indian Ocean region, the blue economy growth has been really very, very slow. But this also gives us an opportunity now that we can really explore and exploit 
the resources that are or the undersea resources that are available to us or use the global commons that is the maritime domain for our benefit so there is tremendous potential but now when we are taking it forward we need to be very very careful to make it sustainable The tropical littoral waters have some very unique characteristics and equally unique challenges. How do we utilize technology to overcome limitations? How do we utilize the underwater biodiversity to our advantage? How can we overcome the social economic structures and work with other nations? How do we implement effective governance? With better awareness, we can plan our policy structure so that the opportunities underwater give us advantages. rather than the challenges overwhelming us the uda framework developed by mrc has two main focus one is pooling of resources and synergizing of efforts by the stakeholders so the uda framework that we are focusing on looks at acoustic capacity building in a very very comprehensive manner so that the governance can be improved In 2015, India unveiled its strategic vision for the Indian Ocean. Sagar, security and growth for all in the region. The vision emphasizes on the importance of maritime security and maritime cooperation. The Indo-Pacific strategic construct has redefined the importance of underwater domain awareness. Huge opportunities lie ahead in the Indian Ocean region. The underwater domain awareness framework can lead the path to the future. Who said modern warfare is only about firepower? Modern warfare is all about smart electronics. Be it land, air, or sea. Military operations is all about bits and bytes rather than sheer firepower. Modern wars are fought with radars, radios and computers. That's the impact of electronics. BEL is continuously pioneering innovation in electronics as a potent weapon for the defense forces delivering military electronics of the highest quality. BEL enables change through professional electronics by harnessing the power of satellites and ground-based communication technologies for the benefit of the common man. Armed with nine high-tech manufacturing plants, rolling out over 350 quality products, BEL has grown into a multi-product, multi-technology company. In any strategic army operation, timely and efficient communication rings success. 
thanks to our secure handheld mobile radios and man packs. Vehicle mounted equipment for ground to ground, ground to air and ground to sea communication which enable efficient communications during critical missions and situations. Modern warfare relies on intelligent electronics to counter the impact of enemy weapon systems. Our electronic warfare systems for signal and communications intelligence, electronic countermeasure and electronic support measure have become the most important weapons in the arsenal of the defense forces. BEL's command control communications computers and intelligent systems popularly known as C4I systems enable optimal management of firepower through artillery command control systems and secure communication via integrated secure digital communication networks. What's more, when you have to hold ground during enemy aggression, battle tanks take center stage. And our tank communication systems help achieve higher reliability while gunning for victory. The Indian Navy relies on BEL for efficient communication during war and peace. C4I systems as well as radars, sonars, decoys and sonar boys help the Navy achieve control over the high seas. BEL's two decades of expertise in optoelectronics is well known. Thermal images, night vision goggles, binoculars and laser range finders meet the surveillance needs of the defense forces to resist enemy infiltration and helping in paramilitary operations. Our electronic voting machines have made Indian citizens vote with confidence, ensuring free and fair elections. A developing economy, India's various technological needs are addressed by us. Our solar technology helps light the remotest of Indian villages and of course manage the burgeoning traffic across cities. Our e-governance systems help state governments to reach out to the people quickly and efficiently. While our air traffic management systems ensure safe takeoff and landing of aircrafts across airports in the country, at BEL, R&D and innovation is a way of life. Each BEL unit has its own R&D setup focusing on product specific requirements supported by two central research laboratories at Bangalore and Ghaziabad to explore futuristic and cutting edge technologies. Tie-ups with external agencies like DRDO helps in joint development of products. This multifaceted R&D approach allows us to drive innovation and change consistently and all our units are ISO certified. BEL's management practices are not just inspired but also driven by its customers. Planned diversification and exploration of new markets, resourcefulness, operational commitment and excellence are hallmarks of BEL's corporate functioning. BEL has emerged as a quality defense electronic supplier to the world, catering to over 40 countries across the globe who've relied on BEL products for years. As India consolidates its leadership position in the new economy, there's only one Indian company aiming for a global footprint in professional electronics. And that is Bharat Electronics, India's pride in defense electronics.
Indian Ocean region IOR, has become the theater of geopolitical and geostrategic interactions in the 21st century, and various nations, both from within and the extra-regional powers, are deploying the strategic assets in the region. Marine Spatial Planning MSP, is probably the most effective tool for governance and management for challenges and opportunities in the marine as well as the freshwater systems. The precise mapping of the resources, the quality, and availability concerns of security and sustainability, and many more can really help in their effective and efficient exploitation. All kinds of policy and technology interventions can be deployed using MSP in vast marine and freshwater systems. The UDA framework proposed by the Maritime Research Center MRC, and Nirthalani Technology Private Limited NDT, is a unique concept to address multiple challenges and opportunities in the tropical waters of the Indo-Pacific and beyond. The UDA framework has the technology-driven digital transformation at its core. Thus, MSP is better served by the UDA framework to manage the Indo-Pacific construct. Let's dive deep into what is marine spatial planning. MSP is a data-driven process of generating a spatiotemporal real-time appreciation of our marine areas to optimize the human interactions to achieve ecological, economical, and social objectives that have been specified through a governance process. The real-time MSP in the tropical waters require massive acoustic capacity and capability building given the suboptimal sonar performance. The mapping both on the surface and the subsurface require deep appreciation of the acoustic propagation characteristics to generate the spatiotemporal inputs. Along with that, the Environmental Impact Assessment EIA, has to be inclusive, backed by detailed MSP construct. The ongoing MSP efforts somehow ignore the vast and deep underwater domain. The underwater domain awareness by construct require acoustic capacity and capability to undertake any kind of MSP. The acoustic propagation underwater largely depends on temperature, density, and pressure that impact the sound velocity profile. Building up spatiotemporal maps has its own issues. In terms of availability for inputs and providing actionable inputs for the diverse users, the diversity of applications and the other user requirements makes it extremely complicated to formulate the final forms of the deliverables. On the other hand, there is constant increase in stranding of big whales and the serious acoustic habitat degradation prevalent in the west coast of India. Hence, policy interventions are urgently required. However, in the absence of nuanced cause and effect analysis such as interventions become difficult. The vested interest groups are able to build narratives that mislead the policymakers and local communities. In order to solve these issues, the proposed 2DA framework has multiple innovative contributions for real impact on governance and technology development. Number 1. The huge network of AIS system across the world gives us a very cost-effective means to scale up this model for the entire world. Number 2. The addition of the local tropical underwater channel model is a big addition to bring focus into the tropical waters and the Indo-Pacific region. Number 3. The digital transformation with focus on acoustic signal processing will allow far more science and technology inclusion into policy interventions and governance mechanisms. Number 4. The International Maritime Organization IMO, has already taken cognition of the unique tropical characteristics and is now considering a regional framework. Number 5. The real-time data-driven and quantitative and qualitative analysis of local site-specific inputs will go a long way in building digital infrastructure for effective policy and technology interventions along with the caustic capacity and capability building. The regulators can monitor long-term sustainability impact using various digital tools to derive MSP outputs. Micro and macro MSP tools need to be developed using digital and more advanced tools across the underwater region. A way ahead, the Geographic Information System GIS, based system have become very popular these days to manage the marine spatial planning. MS
Okay, we want to do Sure. 
Can you settle down? Morning. Welcome back. Uh, today is day three of our five day workshop. And we are extremely honored to have a very, very distinguished guest, Dr. Ajay Kumar. 
sir, I would like to just brief you on what we have, what was the purpose of this workshop and what we have done so far and what's the plan ahead. This five day workshop uh, is planned to, as, as planned as part of the outreach on the UDA framework. Last year, we did a three week workshop, which was a very generic because we wanted to cover the entire spectrum of stakeholders. Out of the three weeks we did, first week was on policy. In that we covered global, regional, national. We had speakers from all over the world, including Ambassador Javed Ashraf from Paris, because he was one of the key person in drafting the Sagar vision of the Honorable Prime Minister. We had people from UNESCO. We had people from Australia. David Brewster was uh, there because David Brewster is well known among the strategic community. And from India, we had very senior people, Ambassador Mudgal, who was also uh, instrumental in the drafting of the Sagar vision. We had professors from IIT. In the next, and of course, uh, uh, we had a lot of senior army and navy leaders who came and spoke about the various aspects. The second week was on the technology intervention. We had uh, Benkert coming from IBM who heads their quantum computing. We had from the CDAC looking at the supercomputing mission. In the third week, we had field interaction. We went to the Malwan coast, spent a week there, and it was very revealing for us what we saw. I mean, when we talk about development, sir, I mean, many times the native community becomes the biggest loser in that whole process. And that's when we started thinking and we thought that it is possible that we can also contribute to the very specific skilling and how they can be integrated into the UDA process. This workshop is more focused on the strategic security community and we are extremely happy to see the response. Before I talk about this workshop, I must uh, place on record a sincere gratitude to General Shekhatka, sir. He has taken personal interest and as the chairman of our strategic advisory group, he has guided us and also taken personal uh, intervention in terms of writing to every organization whom we thought are relevant. And we have invited participants from all across, including the paramilitary forces, armed forces, of course, and he has spoken to the highest level in every organization and also to the nine coastal states. And we are happy that Maharashtra is represented by a senior officer here. And uh, maybe if not this time, next time we will have participation from there. This workshop has been planned in a manner that we give them the entire dimension of the UDA framework, looking at geopolitics, looking at national security, both internal and external, looking at the various other dimensions. Today, in fact, we had uh, uh, Radhika Ma'am in the first session talking about the historical perspective, and she gave a very uh, good understanding of how we need to learn from history and how do we need, uh, when we look ahead, we have to also understand where we came from. And I was very happy to see that participants took a lot of interest and they had a lot of questions uh, to her. Uh, the first day was, of course, uh, apart from the inaugural where we had Ambassador Gautam Bambavale, General Shekhatka, sir, Mr. Mukesh Malhotra, uh, head of LNT Defense, uh, Mr. Ram Chandani, and uh, Mr. Prafu Talera, Admiral Verma, they all gave their uh, words of wisdom to us. And the rest of the day, our internal team, including me, covered the larger perspective of the UDA, and we were happy to see the response from the participants. This, yesterday was more covering the international relations or geopolitics. We had uh, Kordo Vasan, sir, who's the head of uh, Chennai Center for China Studies. He gave a very good perspective on the maritime security aspects. Then we had Ambassador Mudgal, who came from Delhi and uh, spoke to us on the Sagar vision and what went in, into uh, the entire Sagar concept or Sagar vision by the Prime Minister. And then we, in the afternoon, we had Mr. Kim Harriet from Australia. He is part of the Perth US Asia Center. 
he gave a perspective on Indo-Pacific and also in Indo-Australian relations. Then we had our own fellows, uh, research fellows who talked about digital transformation and sediment management. Today, as I said, morning we had uh, Professor Radhika session, and now we have uh, uh, Dr. Ajay Kumar sir. <laughs> After this, in the afternoon, we have Mr. J Jeffrey Pine joining us from the Northeast South Asia Center from US. They work directly under the Department of Defense. They are also considering collaboration with us. He's going to be talking about maritime security and uh, the present geopolitical scenario. And then after, uh, after that, we have two of our fellows uh, talking about sustainable blue economy and climate change. Tomorrow, we have another very brilliant uh, scholar. She's a Shakespeare scholar. She's going to be connecting the sea uh, with traditional knowledge on one end and also how art and science can work together. Then we have uh, Admiral Verma, sir, will be here and Praful Talaraji will be talking on the master keys of logistics. That's a very, very uh, profound presentation that I have seen and I've seen it multiple times, but every time I get to learn a lot. And then they are, uh, on Friday, we have um, Dr. Ajay Kumar joining us, uh, sorry, Dr. Ajay Dandekar from Shivnada University. We both are working on water security on the, both the transboundary rivers. He'll be speaking on water security. And then we have Dr. Tamori Akamatsu joining us from Japan. He is uh, he was heading policy research for Sasagawa Foundation, ocean policy research for Sasagawa Foundation. I also want to bring to your notice, sir, that uh, we are covering almost all the four quad countries. And uh, we do have a certain, in the quad, there has been a discussion on greater public good. So how do we define greater public good? That has been a matter of debate in the, uh, in the media and various, even I have written a bit on that. So we also want to, because security also has a other dimension to it. So this is also to bring their views and see how we can, I mean, how we can shape UDA to contribute to the greater public good that people talk about. So I'll not take more time and I will hand over to, I will request uh, General Shekhatkar. Uh, General Shekhatkar, apart from his uh, very distinguished career in the armed forces, I mean, in the army. Sir ha was the chairman of the Shekatkar committee, which is a very landmark uh, recommendation that they made in how to make the armed forces more efficient. And uh, I think most of the recommendations are now being implemented. Uh, I'll not talk more about that. And uh, Sir has been a mentor to us. Sir is in involved in various uh, strategic security uh, interactions and at various levels, I don't want to talk more on that. Uh, sir, I would request you to kindly welcome uh, our dignitary. Okay. Good morning, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry. Uh, it's again a pleasure. To not to speak in front of you, to introduce a great personality who is with us this morning. I'm reminded when I was a young boy, there was a couplet. Dekhte hi dekhte, ek din aisa bhi aayega, jab chamukte ho suraj ka taluk ek nahi naha sa diya jaraayega. So I'm too small a person to introduce the former Defense Secretary of India. Uh, so he's got a great uh, career. I joined in 1985. Day yesterday, when I was speaking, I was mentioning Pune is the intellectual capital of India. I forgot to mention Kerala is the knowledge capital of India. And Sir happened to be from Kerala. It is the Tiruvanthapuram, which produces the knowledge. And if you require the knowledge and you come to Pune, you can be branded as an intellectual, but you have to be from Tiruvanthapuram, actually. So he's from Karla Kadal. Sir has been a number of positions during his career. He graduated from the IIT Kanpur, and now he's a distinguished fellow at the IIT Kanpur. He has served for a long time as a Secretary of Defense Protection, 
in the Ministry of Defense, December 2017 to 2019, and then Defense Secretary from 2019 to October 22. Sir, if I remember, I handed over my report to you, the second one, second report, which was confidential. Anything you do not to act, make it confidential. It will never see the light of the day. Not, sir, I'm talking of the functioning of Delhi. You don't want any action to be taken, make it confidential. It will get into such an almira, you can't even know the place. But sir has taken an initiative and it has been implemented also. That was about the rationalization of the manpower of the Ministry of Defense and the project. First was the Shikhar Committee based on that, based on one of the para of that report, uh, the Ministry of Defense decided to another committee, which again I was chairman, but since it was made confidential, it remained confidential. It will remain confidential all the time in the thing. But sir, I'm grateful to you. We as a nation are grateful to you during your tenure and now also the amount of work the Ministry of Defense has done in modernizing itself is something unbelievable. I had the honor, sir was there. I used to meet Dr. Kalam. He was the DRDO. And every second Wednesday at three o'clock, I had to meet him. And he used to say that, he said, look, Datta, my name is Datta, first name. Today we are importing 70% of our equipment from abroad and we produce only 30%. He said, in my life, will I see a day when we import only 30% and produce 70%. His wisdom, his thought process, sir has been instrumental in creating what you hear, the Atni Dervar Bharat and things like that. And our imports are reducing, reducing, reducing. In fact, you will be able to know, because there was a defense production. The most missile is one of the most efficient missile in the world and the cheapest. Look at the number of countries who are buying. Our missile program, our DRDO under his guidance, has gone into miles and miles and miles of ways. Our space technology and underwater domain, of course, that time it was a new subject. But now it has picked up. Sir, uh, Commander Das mentioned to both of Apart from the sea, we also anticipate the threats coming from river fronts. For example, I know for 100% sure, Chinese are diverting river Brahmaputra into China. It won't take more than 10 years that water to go down because they fear there's a severe famine in 2035 in China and they will not know where to, and they are the rice eating people. So they are already diverting river Brahmaputra. So river Brahmaputra, if the water gets diverted to China, we are sunk. The river of sorrow, which is known in Assam today, it will real, it will just disappear. Similarly, sir, there is a Kaladhan project, there's a Barak project and so on. And he's dealing with all this. So without mentioning too many things about him, I would request you, sir, to kindly enlighten us. And we are grateful to you accepting our request, coming all the way from Delhi to Pure, speaking to us. And we look forward to my another request is keep blessing us, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. General Shikatkar, I must say I'm I am an ardent fan and a student of his. And he has this habit of embarrassing you when he is in process of introducing you, but I am so very grateful for the kind words. Commander Das, who's been, I think, one of the leading lights of uh, underwater domain in the country, and he's creating awareness on a subject which is not so very well understood by a large number of people who are actually dealing with the domain, let alone uh, people who are outside. So I'm grateful for you, grateful to you for having invited me here and, uh, you know, sharing some thoughts. Like many of us, I am a very new student of this subject. It is not an area where I claim any great expertise. Yet, when the more I read about it, the more I see the opportunities and potential of this subject. And more I realize how little we know about it. And I think that is where I am going to share some thoughts which I have uh, noted down with you, and I hope some of this you will find uh, resonance with. 
you know, the topic of this is, you know, the uh, UDA in a strategic security framework. And we understand that strategic security is not only actual defense security as we conventionally understand it. Today, security has got multi become multidimensional in more than one ways. And therefore, you know, given that all of you are, you know, um, having security background, I thought it may also be relevant to give you another perspective because I'm sure uh, Jalashat Katkar, uh, Kavanadas, Das and others would have spoken a lot from the security perspective. You know, I, I will briefly touch upon that, but I will also talk from the perspective of economic opportunity, which this sector holds within itself. And if we are not going to exploit that opportunity, our competitors, other nations would. And this is going to be one of the sunrise sectors in the next couple of decades. If we lose out this opportunity and the scale of this, which I am going to just share with you in a moment, is so huge that if we lose out on this, then we would be definitely way behind some of the other competing nations in this regard. And therefore, it has a huge strategic uh, relevance for me. I mean, some factoids, uh, did we know that 94% of the life exists under water? Or that oceans are critical to management of greenhouse gases that we are all so concerned with today? And it is going to possibly be the most important determinant of whether the life continues on planet Earth or not. Greenhouse gases and the way to manage it would be how you manage your oceans. Did we know that Mother Earth's longest chain of mountains, the mid-ocean ridge, stretching across a distance of 65,000 kilometers, is under the ocean? Did we know that there are approximately 3 million shipwrecks ranging from the Titanic to Santa Maria of Christopher Columbus? each of which holding a treasure trove of stories and information on history and our past, which remains inside these shipwrecks down somewhere under the sea. And do you know that what remains underwater is less explored than the surfaces of moon and the Mars. If you look at India, our maritime area encompasses around the same geographical expanse as our territories. It holds nearly 80% of our total resources. Same landmass, but 80% of our uh, total resources, but only 4% to our GDP. This is the contrast of under exploitation that we are, we need to move ahead with. So as India marches ahead to world become world's third largest economy and beyond. It is this opportunity of underwater, which has the potential to generate millions of jobs and billions, or not billions, but trillions in revenue in diverse sectors, such as fisheries, aquaculture, tourism, shipping, offshore energy, leveraging our maritime resources. But it is when we're looking at underwater domain, it is not merely our own maritime area that we are looking at. We are also looking at high seas, which have huge 
strategic and economic implications. As we all know that any nation can fish or mine in high seas. And benefit from the highly prized resources that exist there. It is understood that we could benefit from the large number of new genetic material that we can find to discover new medicines and treatments to some so far incurable diseases. Deep seas also offer billions worth in terms of millions and millions of tons of poly polymetallic nodule modules. Sulfides, cobalt, rich ferromanganese, crust, copper, gold, rare earths, and others. Technology advancement is reaching the tipping point in a lot of these areas. And it is now becoming possible to exploit these huge resources in an environmentally sustainable manner. The point is that the nation, which is the quickest to seize the opportunities in the high seas, will likely assert control over the area's resources and territory in the long run. So therefore, it is both about economics and strategic. Of course, it goes without saying that if we are looking to ha exploit these resources for our to our advantage, like many other nations are also trying, the starting point would be underwater domain awareness. We need to understand what it is about. And it is also true that this is an area which has it has not received the attention that it would deserve, it should deserve. I spent five years in the Ministry of Defense. And not once did we have a discussion on underwater domain awareness. And that is from a security perspective, which possibly is going to lead the charge as far as this domain is concerned. I am talking of the economic charge also, which is the next level of opportunity. Why UDA is important is something which all of you understand from a security perspective from navigation perspective, from the perspective of communication, telegraph, uh, from the perspective of all the assets that we have created offshore, which need to be protected, from the, uh, uh, from the perspective of the understanding the marine biodiversity, from the perspective of protecting our environment and managing our environment in a sustainable manner, from the perspective of pursuing further scientific research in this area, and we can go on and on. In fact, there is a parallel world that exists. As we have created on the terrestrial side, we have a parallel world that needs to be uncovered and discovered on the maritime side. And UDA is the basis fundam foundational knowledge that will go in actually understanding this. But if we were to look at how the world has developed this knowledge, most of it actually got developed on strategic and defense requirements. The Americas wanted to make sure that they understood the Antarctic seas so that during the Cold War, they are able to manage the threats, underwater threats that were emanating from Russia. And so they developed a number of technologies, underwater technologies, under the famous SOSUS program, which gave them an understanding of how, you know, to be able to do detection, surveillance, and counter uh, uh, attack if required using new technologies which they had developed during the 70s and the 80s. But as we all know now, these waters everywhere, the seas everywhere don't behave the same. 
and that fundamental knowledge is that the tropical waters are very different from the cold temperate waters of the atlantic or the pacific or the antarctic and therefore a number of equipment that were developed in those days which is what we have for a long time been using in our waters we today realize are actually handicapping our knowledge in this regard and handicapping not in a trivial way but in a significant way the performance can degrade anything between 30 to 70 percent for using the same equipment which works absolutely fine in the cold temperate waters and when it comes to the tropical waters its performance is totally degraded its life is totally degraded and of course not to mention as general shikarkar said you are continuously dependent on imports and this has always been treated any effort to import underwater related equipment has been treated as a strategic classified technology not easily made available and only given as a big favor to uh, nations so therefore while we go out of the ways make a strategic compromise to get these equipment what you get is actually a partly useful equipment and therefore if we have to develop a good uda for our own waters it becomes imperative that we need to have our own technology it it becomes you know to my mind it is these two things will essentially have to go together and what it means is that both for our defense and our economic needs and when i say economic needs just to say again to reiterate this point and i don't think that is recognized that the scale of economic need we are talking about is parallel or bigger than what we can do create terrestrially that being the scope i think that is the importance of developing this technology for our waters within our country it is in this regard that i recall that the first ever effort was taken by indian navy and i had the fortune to be in the government at that time and in august 2022 the navy led a extremely relevant program called sprint under which 75 idex challenges were formulated most of them relating to related to technology which will become relevant from the uda perspective to be to be developed indigenously this is important from two perspectives one is under the idex framework we were typically doing 10 12 15 challenges at a time because it was not very clear to us that whether there would be enough startups of certain minimum caliber who will be able to consume the challenges that we come out because we all know these challenges are fairly leading edge in terms of technology demands. <clears throat> so therefore, one was that instead of 15, the Navy took the giant leap in terms of creating 75 challenges at one go. And the second big step was that this was in a domain which was not tested thus far. And like I said, UDA was not the subject that we were dealing with in great importance uh, in the ministry as well. And therefore, they actually recognized the need to take this forward and in a big way. The Honorable Prime Minister launched these challenges in August 2022. I had the fortune to be part of that program. The good news which I want to share with you is that once the challenges were launched, within one month, 
all these challenges were taken up by various startups. In fact, over 1,000 responses came for these 75 challenges. Each of them well thought out, well researched, and through speedy processing, 115, and I forget the number, uh, about 115 winners were declared for those 75 challenges. Some challenges had more than one winner. Which also, why I make this point is it shows the strength of our ecosystem to develop indigenous technology that has got developed. Through some collaborations with our academic institutions, with our industry, and with all the other stakeholders. Now, let me come to the second part of the story. It does not end here. I, of course, retired from the government in October 2022. But in October 2023, the Indian Navy holds a show called Swablamban, and I'm sure our naval officers are all aware of this, which was another big show. And guess what? In this show, they actually showcase the prototypes of these 75 challenges that were taken up in August 2022. Many of the prototypes had been developed in 12 months. And the assistance that was given under IDEX, as all of you know now, is 1.5 crores. There were a few IDEX prime challenges where, where the assistance was 10 crores. No more funding of hundreds and thousands of crores. No more funding of <clears throat> for years together or waiting for years together while the SQRs keep changing with time, all in 12 months, we had prototypes showcased and several of those products I am aware are today in different stages of testing, certification and inductment. So this has proven clearly that there are capabilities that we have in our ecosystem which could help us create our indigenous technology in this regard. Actually, when we look at technology, this is all actually a reflection of some of the strengths that our ecosystem has developed and which we can leverage upon. So let me talk briefly about some of the areas where we have developed strengths and where we can, uh, uh, you know, we still need to develop or do more work. The first is, you know, we have a reasonably good ecosystem of unmanned aerial vehicles. We all know that. But what it means is we have capability in the country to develop autonomy and remote control, which can now easily be, and it has been demonstrated in several use cases, that can be used for creating autonomous underwater vehicles, re remotely operated vehicles, and unmanned surface vehicles. That is one strength that we have. The second strength that we have is our strengths in software and artificial intelligence. Both of them extremely relevant because ultimately there are not too many companies in the world who can conduct that fusion of data when the data is coming from multiple different kinds of sensors in different formats and create a solution which can help you take decision in real time for whatever purposes you need that decision. Not only that, this data is coming from sensors, it is also coming from the environment. For example, we are having data which may come from uh, meteorological data may come from meteorological department, ocean related data may come from department of ocean development, data relating to, you know, for example, there's a huge opportunity, and I digress, to capture, use our fishing community. We have over 100,000 fishing vessels which go out into the sea. And they have the potential to help us create our UDA framework in a manner we may have not conceived of as of now. With a suitable win-win model, these people could find an additional, we are looking at value addition. This data is a huge resource today. 
and with a suitable sensor mounted, they are simply carrying, while they are doing fishing, they are carrying data, collecting data in the process, which can be used by our agencies to improve our understanding of UDA in a significant manner, and we could work on it. Similarly, the state ports departments, the state fisheries department, all have a lot of, so there's data coming from different sources. And we have the capability in India, good capability to analyze it and create solutions. So there is a software capability and there is the artificial intelligence because very often today, a lot of things, the counterfactuals, the factuals are what we see, counterfactuals are which we don't see, but we postulate, we uh, hypothesize that suppose if it was so, then what would have been the situation? Let's say if the temperature of what uh, density of uh, water was uh, profile was such, what could be the situation in terms of marine life or in terms of uh, acoustics or in terms of any other parameter that is of relevance? The artificial intelligence capability in this country can actually help to create predictive solutions in this. We are good at it. So that is another area where, and these are good strengths because a lot of nations struggle in these aspects, but we are also weak and weak in some critical areas. Weak in sensors, sonars, radars, underwater communication through acoustics. And these are areas where we need semiconductor level developments. And I think armed forces are ideally suited to be able to lead this charge. And again, I will relate to you actual story. And I'm sure several of you are aware of this now, of this now, but this is how it started under IDEX. There was a need for developing a 100 megapixel camera, which we were importing from Israel for several decades. Because we did not, and camera is basically a sensor, which is taking optical images of a certain resolution. One of the chip design startups from IIT Delhi came forward and said, sir, we can do it uh, under the, and we made it as an IDEX challenge. We never thought it would be done honestly. And this was an absolutely new startup. There was no background. They didn't, this is the first project they were doing. They said, sir, we can design the chip. As you know, I mean, there is no chip manufacturing capability in the country, but designing capability existed, but no one had taken the risk. This startup came forward. And precisely in 12 months, they developed the 100 megapixel camera at one and a half crores, which is fraction of the cost for every camera that we were importing from Israel. But that was not all. They said, sir, no, sir, but we can actually develop one gigapixel camera for you. Now, it is about creating similar capability in our ecosystem. The point I wanted to make is this capability exists. Let me control, complete the story. Some of you may know it again, so I don't talk about it so often. This girl who was leading this startup by name Brinda Kapoor may ring a bell for some of you. When Prime Minister Modi was in US for the summit meeting in June, President Biden hosted a uh, reception for him in White House. And she was sitting next to President Biden on the head table. Why? Because she is now selling or doing business both with Department of Defense in US and with NASA. Look at from 2018 when she came and did her first sensor to create the 100 megapixel camera to where she is reached. Her company Third ITEC is today, uh, uh, you know, it's although it is not announced, but she, she's a unicorn in herself, but it's a different. The point I'm making is now we need to do the same, same similar revolution. We need a Brinda Kapoor for UDA. And that is possible today with the kind of chip design uh, capabilities that we have. But we have not actually taken and trusted our own people to develop these kind of sensors who could actually make this conversion. Another area where uh, you know we require, and this is a, even a more tougher area if you ask me, is bringing together in data from different sources. In India and in government particularly, this is an impossible task. You can develop all the sensors possibly, but bringing together people is not possible. 
and data impossible. No, it's because that is why, I mean, you ask Navy officers here, they have all the bathymetric data, but every time the Ministry of Oil, and I mean, since I've dealt with this, I'm sharing with you, every time Ministry of uh, Petroleum needed that data, after trying for several months and sometimes years, they would come to Defense Secretary, and Defense Secretary would hold a meeting so that that bathymetric data could be shared with Petroleum, so that we could actually do ex oil exploration. I mean, you would be surprised to know till about two years back, we had actually explored oil in, you know, it always had surprised me that, how is it that in India, we have not found oil? We have found oil on our left, we have found oil on our right, I mean, and we are full of oil, but in the same, uh, you know, uh, uh, this thing, we don't have oil in Indian Ocean region. Why is it that we only have a Bombay High or a small Godavari base in nowhere else? But the reason is we haven't really explored. We have not explored for 95% of our EZ. We have not explored oil. And like I said, even if to do one more additional exploration after months and years of efforts, it would finally reach Defense Secretary's table. A meeting would be called with all the concerned stakeholders and a compromise would be arise. So sharing data is a difficult challenge. That's all what I wanted to say. But I think here also, one of the things we have pioneered is, so this is a cultural thing, and I don't want to go too much into the detail about how, why it is difficult. Of course, part of it is the government's problem also, where every organization treats his or their domain. And I've been part of government for 40 years, so I have no reason to, you know, um, uh, but to apologize for the kind of structure that has got created over the years. But the I think the more important thing which I want to say is, we have also pioneered the best solution in the world for this problem. And that is called the open API architecture, which we have demonstrated under our all the digital India stack today, which we are championing across the world. India stack has been developed in an open API architecture, which basically means you don't have to share your data. Everyone holds their own data. And in a very simple terms, when I need some information with you, I will send you a query in a prescribed format and you will send me a response on, on the prescribed format. That's all. So which means you can hold your data, but I can ask you for information of that specific information. And if you are okay giving that information, you can share that information. This is how UPI works. This is how Aadhaar works. This is how all the various uh, India stack uh, uh, solutions work. So we could actually look at creating an API based architecture, which will enable all this data from different sources and different holders of data across the government and non-government agencies to come together and provide a holistic UDA picture, which could be of immense use. But this is an area which someone has like, you know, India stack has been created. I think you need a champion for UDA India stack who can actually bring together this information and make it available. I will like to uh, make one more point before I close. Uh, we all know of Gati Shakti, PM's Gati Shakti program, a fantastic program. I think today the need is to be able to create a UDA Gati Shakti. Uh, because we have multiple agencies doing multiple things and today, the challenge is when I go somewhere, there is a cable there or there is a pipeline there or there's a ship there or there's an underground sensor which uh, someone has put, or there may be a fishing domain, there may be a ecologically sensitive area where you know sp uh, spawning of fishes takes place or eggs take place. There is a season which needs to be managed where the uh, you know eggs uh, are spawned at some point of time. All of this needs to be under a single GIS framework and I would, you know, like, this is what Gati Shakti is. On land, you have state PWD building a road, you have national highway building a road, you have defense building a road, you have other agencies doing something, Gram Panchayat building a road, municipality, building. I'm just taking example. And everyone seems to be connecting two places in the same way without optimally utilizing the resources that are there for development. You know, same, same thing for water, same thing for electricity, same thing for any infrastructure. So what the Honorable Prime Minister said, 
let's integrate these efforts so that if I am building a road, I know what everyone else is doing and now I can optimally use my resources. And this is what a GIS based platform called Gati Shakti does, which is open and available for everyone. Everyone can see when they are doing their planning, spatial planning, but this is on water. Of course, it also has a, it, this is on land and this also has a water component in terms of coastal travel and, uh, but it's largely dealing with surface infrastructure. What I am saying is time has come to develop an underwater Gati Shakti where the activities under the water need to be integrated by various stakeholders. And this would get converted like we have a smart city mission. Today, everything is smart. I mean, you can you bring in technology in every part of it, whether you put sensor, whether you do fishing, whether you do travel on the surface or under the surface. You need smart regions in the underwater domain, like you need smart cities. So we could actually say that this particular region around Lakshadweep is a smart region for underwater development so that we can protect the ecology, exploit whatever is exploitable in that region in terms of tourism, in terms of natural resources, in terms of strategic resources, in terms of security requirements, so that we are able to actually combine all of this and create a holistic picture together on a real time basis, which everyone can use. And these concepts of maritime spatial planning through underwater Gati Shakti and smart regions, which could actually help us to take the next leap in terms of we need to catch up with other countries who have taken. I can assure you that whether it is deep sea uh, mining or whether it is uh, high seas fishing or whether it is even China is God has more knowledge of our Indian Ocean region than we have. And today, if we need to catch up, we need to speed up. And if we were to use our strengths in terms of technology, in terms of our resources, this is uh, one of the ways by which we would be able to not take or reinvent the wheel or take as much time as others have taken, but we could do much faster. Lastly, you know, Commander Arnab is doing a fabulous job in terms of doing something which is an integral part of it, and that is educating people like you and me here. I think India's greatest strength has been our resources, human resources. If we had the IT revolution in the 90s, because we could produce human resources at scale. Anywhere in the sh any ship in the world, no matter what happens when it is, you know, in some trouble, we find there are Indian crew on in it. We have created at scale people who go on the ship. I think it is time to create at scale human resource manpower in the underwater domain. We could do it for, we should do it first of all for our own requirements. And like I said, we have, this is an area where we are underprepared. So we need large number of people. And we can also, as the world will grow increasingly aware of the needs countries beyond which it is already known, a uh, handful of countries already are ahead, but other countries, we could even be exporting this manpower. So I think there is a huge potential and it is in this area that I think MRC is doing an amazing job. They have taken the first step and today, more than anything else, they are in a position to be the trainer of trainers because they have created adequate capital, uh, critical mass of knowledge and expertise in this area in different dimensions of UDA. And that is where the big enabler comes from. And that is why I thought I started by complimenting Commander Das. And I have been suggesting to him, given the fact that technology and startups have such an important role to play as a next step, MRC should look at becoming an incubator for startups in this area, which could actually energize the whole requirement needs like Navy did for Sprint, 
75 startups challenges and they could able to create a whole ecosystem of players who could actually develop technology for them. Similarly, this incubator could spawn number of startups who could from a managerial perspective, management perspective, sol software solution perspective, and many other perspectives, create solutions which would be of relevance from the various decision maker side, both from defense and security, as well as from an economic perspective. Why is touched on economic perspective? All of you have this additional responsibility because I don't think the UDA perspective is so well understood in this civil side or the non-defense side. From a defense side, from strategic, you know, you understand it more. But when your knowledge will increase, they will start leaning upon you and start depending on you. But in the end, it is a game of economics. Because everything else, that's how who's going to control the resources. And the resources under C are too important and too large to be ignored. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. I still remember when I met you first in your office as Defense Secretary, me and Profulji had visited you and you said, Ki, Arnab, yani baithenge, alag se and, we, and the amount of attention you paid to whatever we said, and, uh, I, and definitely sir, you have done a lot of reading up and uh, thank you so much for connecting uh, to our uh, whatever work we have done and it, it's very heartening to uh, get the appreciation from you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I would request uh, uh, some of our participants uh, to give a sense of, uh, the, it's almost two, halfway we are uh, in this workshop. So I would request some of you to come forward and give your impression on what has been the learning and what is your experience. So maybe, would you like to come first? Thank you, sir. Uh, let me see question to start, sir. Uh, uh, sir, let me introduce myself. I'm uh, a Coast Guard officer. And uh, I'm coming from the Anman Nicobar Command from Port Blair. Uh, I have uh, around uh, more than 30 years of service, uh, marine service. And Till now, what we have been thinking and what our thought process was only on the maritime domain awareness on the surface. Let it be oil pollution, oil spill, let it be search and rescue, let it be maritime security. Whatever in we're doing till 30 years, our thought process has not gone much into the what lies under the sea, except for the navigation purpose, okay, how much water I have under the keel of my ship. Or maybe when I'm going for anchoring, what is the nature of the ground, whether my anchor will hold or not. But after attending this UDA, first of all, I was surprised ke why I'm being a Coast Guard officer, because it is a naval subject, because till now, from the maritime security submarines, is the only which is using the underwater domain listen. But after coming here, sir, my uh, that is it was really eye opener for me. Where I came to know it's not only maritime security, they talk about uh, blue economy. And blue economy is a word which we've been uh, listening from the media, news, and other uh, sources. And one good word, sir, which I have heard here is the uh, public good. Public good. And that has attracted us a lot. And that is further gave us being a Coast Guard officer. I started thinking from the Coast Guard angle, sir. Then uh, incident which was narrated by Commodore Watson, sir, a uh, downward ship sinking. And uh, we have no capability for the search. Then the 
recovery of the bodies and the important information like black box and other things which is to be recovered. Had this underwater domain awareness been earlier started like our space mission of India, space mission and all, in space mission you see where we have reached. Same awareness and same mission, if we same way what we have started our uh, space mission, if we start now the underwater domain, sir, in Coast Guard, whatever information, whatever knowledge will be collected by them will be used in our search and rescue. And yesterday we were discussing with the commander uh, uh, Das, he said, you know, underwater we cannot say search and rescue, we can say search and recovery. And yes, thus if any ship sink uh, or any uh, aircraft sink, people will die in five to six, six minutes and only we have to recover the bodies. But think of a submarine. If submarine gets stuck somewhere because of machinery failure, it gets stuck somewhere in the coral reefs, engine failure, popular stamped out. People are there but not died. And there is a time to rescue them also. So search and rescue is very well as our future vision, sir. Second from Coast Guard angle, I see the oil spill. Oil spill, till now we have got expertise. Uh, beach cleaning, we have some expertise in beach cleaning, pan gross cleaning, other things, a lot of things on surface we have done. But we know when oil spills, the part of it which is evaporable, evaporates, which is dissolvable, it dissolves, and then it gets uh, degraded through bacteria and all. But certain solid part of it, which may be going, sinking, and sitting on our corals, Sticking around our this marine, it may spoil the marine life, maybe in some marine parks. And if to clean those, we need to have a underwater domain awareness. Then only we can think of creating some equipments, think of creating some facilities, clean those coral or this marine life and all. And third thing, sir, which basically was came to me from the underwater, this thing which triggered in my mind. Was the remote sensing? Till now, we are doing the remote sensing on the surface through satellites, through radars. We are doing the remote sensing how big forest area we have, how good mangroves area we have. But we are not done sensing how much marine life we have. And sonars, you said, you'll be developing. And that cannot be done through radars and uh, this thing. It needs to sonars and all. I have boarded a few foreign vessel, fishing vessel, foreign vessel, being a Coast Guard officer, I can't specifically remember which place and all, but foreign vessel, when I boarded fishing vessel, I have seen they got a fish finder fitted on those. And hardly our fishermen hardly have any fish finders. And through this fish finder, those foreign vessel knows where the fish are. And they only shoot their net and hooks there only, and they get a good catch. Where is our Fisherman, they do the hit and trial, jal dal do, machli aage do, thik hai, nahi hai, to nahi hai. But sir, if the remote sensing can be done, like sonar is fitted, at say, your dolphin case, sir, they should tell you have done a, some signal processing of uh, dolphins, and you know the what they radiate. Same way you can do for other kind of fish, tuna fish and all things. If you have this data available, their uh, signal processing, or their signatures of the every fish, maybe with the their interpolation with data transformation and the you know AI and everything, equipment can be developed or data can be collected where we can do the remote sensing of the, the, the how big is this school of fish, not only the how big is the school, where the fish are present, how big is it, and with the signaling we can also find out which kind of fish they are. If it is a tuna school of fish, we can send the tuna catcher to you go to that area, there's a lot of tuna there. If it is a prawns fisherman, who catches the prawns, we can tell them, okay, this area prawns is available, go there. So this signal, every animal must be radiating some signals around food video data and data transformation. I have not much of knowledge on it, but can be predicted with the signature case, this and the rest of some technical things. I think the UDA with the, many, with the evolution of the UDA, all things 
and this is the future I see of the UDSL. And thank you very much for being eye opener for us. Thank you, sir. You articulated it very well. So, from uh, BSF, if you could come. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I was wondering why uh, BSF has been invited here or called upon here. Uh, we guard borders, land borders, basically, and uh, we are the land forces. We guard on the Western Theatre, 2,293, uh, 2, to be roughly around the kilometers, ranging from zero uh, height to 18,000 feet and so on. Uh, from Shiachen to down below and up to Gujarat. On the eastern side, we are guarding 4,096 kilometers, uh, basically yeah. against uh, Bangladesh. So, uh, not very many people, those who are in uniform, they know that BSF is there, but uh, those who are in civil, uh, <laughs> they know that army is there. So, <laughs> that is the what, and we wear the same uniform, like color is the same, but the, during peace time, we are there, and uh, we have to sustain the borders till the army comes and we have to fight along with the army. This is what uh, is the mandate and this is what is the arrangement with the government. And this is how we are trained. Now, uh, why we are here and why this under uh, what you call <laughs> under what the <laughs> domain um, awareness. You see, uh, we have been given coastal region, 85 kilometers of coast is with us. Creek area is with, with us, and three fourth of the creek is with the Pakistan. So, how creek behaves during different seasons, and how we have to behave like that because the area is slushy, marshy, and for many, very many people, it's a no go area. Very till uh, recently, we were only at the baseline. Now we have moving forward in the creeks. And what we have learned from here is that water behaves differently. Water in the Sundarbans will behave differently and water in the creek will behave differently. We have been uh, getting uh, or testing uh, those equipments for underwater surveillance because basic tactics same. Basic tactics in land borders or fighting war base, one lag on the ground, fire, and then move, then fire, then move, cover and move, that is all. BSF may have borders for basic practices to have a good surveillance on the board. Other side and let not do adversary here, he should not uh, deny this surveillance. That is the basic tactics. To have that tactics, you have a 360 degree tactics because challenges are many. Air say drone is coming. Uh, baad ground say infiltration is there. Underground tunneling is there. Now underwater. This is how we are here now. This is what I perceive. Underwater domain is very, very important for us. And uh, with the creek is uh, getting hotter, sensitive. It is actually uh, disputed land territory uh, of the India between India and Pakistan long ago. 12, uh, I think 12 or 13 uh, meetings have happened, but Sarmaut uh, kaha hai, it is, it is yet to go. And uh, something happens somewhere because which way the Samoth will be decided, the country will uh, lose, some country will gain. A lot of land, a lot of uh, water and resources there. Second point just said, brought out was that uh, exploration, and we have not learned that how much. Pakistan is a very cunning country, you see. Uh, Rajasthan ke andar, and in Gujarat also along the Water, we have a lot of exploration sites of gas gases. Just say, our technocrats are there, technical people are there. They they do that surveillance or who do their exploration. Karte, they find a site. Pakistan comes to know about that without using much of their resources. They copy that, or usi ke saath they start exploring and they they take away this thing. This is what happens. So that's, we have to maintain the secrecy also. That is how the borders are no-go areas. And underwater uh, domain awareness is very much because borders, mein kya hai ki border is ratified. IB is ratified. It is uh, passed by the parliament. So 
border pillars are there on the ground and it is on their map. But what about the population? The border population, we have to keep those border population as patriotic and they should know that this is our border. Otherwise, when the minds of the border population changes, they can always side with the other adversary. So we have to keep that border population in mind because yeah, command bank, I think there are three things are very common, very, very important. One thing is your subordinate should 80% should be with you. Number two, your border population should be with you because whenever they will do something, you will have to face problem. And third is your adversary should be, should always uh, understand you because if you fire one round, he will fire a one AGL round. This is what is required here. So we deal with the, uh, all those sort of things, but underwater is very important because fishermen, like yesterday you said, you have to cultivate the fishermen to be with you. They are your uh, force multipliers. They will tell you what is where, how it is coming, who all are there. This is very important for us in the creek area and the Sundarbans area because most of the areas are no-goes and the fishermen we allow, do allow. And this, if they come on board with us, it's a wonderful achievement we will have. Thank you, sir. I'll request Vasan, sir, to be the last speaker. Ami, anybody wants to come in? Would you like to come and speak? Before I call Vasan, sir, yes. I don't want to miss out my... Uh, sir, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Roshan, and uh, I have had a very interesting journey in the last uh, six years or so, sir. Uh, we have been discussing a lot of China, and uh, I've got a, a good exposure uh, with them. Uh, in the year 2017, I was there at Doklam when that uh, thing was happening. Then. Uh, we went to the glacier and uh, Galwan happened. And as uh, luck would have pulled me, uh, my luck line is actually, it, uh, it has got a lot of uh, uh, turns. <laughs> so I did my tenure of uh, Siachin and uh, straight away moved to Galwan. And uh, uh, I was part of whatever happened over there. Now, I'm seeing one state of uh, this water, a solid state. And then uh, I got posted to Andaman Nicobar Command and that to at Campbell Bay. I was again uh, fortunate. I have seen uh, Indra call and I have seen Indra point, uh, northernmost uh, point of India and the southernmost point of India. Now, again, the as I have come down from one state to a different state, the next state I don't want to go so soon, the gaseous state in that. <laughs> but then the, the journey has been like, uh, as an as a infantry guy, again, uh, sir, I'll be in the same, on the same platform like you, okay, where I'm an infantry guy, I'm supposed to go around on the uh, earth. I can run, I can, uh, I, can, I can jump, I can hop, I can do everything. Water has been a, a bit uh, on the other side of me. I learned swimming in the academy. But then now I am very fond of going for uh, snorkeling and uh, scuba and all those things. But talking of uh, cultivating fishermen, right now uh, as a regular officer, I am uh, deputed to a TA battalion. Talking of cultivating fishermen. On the ground, we are always into this thing when, I, when we are like uh, army guys when we are at, uh, at the northern uh, sector or in the eastern sector, we make friends very easily. And then we cultivate them to uh, collect, collate uh, intelligence, information, and then make it into intelligence. So when I, uh, when I arrived there, the first thing that I did was that I started speaking to my troops. And then I learned that many of them, they come from a fisherman uh, community. And... Uh, 154 infantry battalion TA. We have already formed a, what we call as the terrier web. 
wherein we have roped on roped in uh, this uh, fisherman. And this boy, whoever comes from a particular island or a particular village, we have made him a commander in his own uh, domain. Now he is responsible for maybe 10 uh, fishermen who go out into the sea daily. It has yielded a lot of results for us. Uh, we have been able to uh, uh, get knowledge with regard to this, uh, uh, those Rohingya boats, which are uh, always on constant move into that area. Uh, there was a, there was one fisherman who went into who went early in the morning at around 4:30 into the sea, and then he saw a boat. He was not able to identify identify it from a distance. When he went near, there were people so desperate they jumped into the water and they swam towards him. Respecting the human life, he saved two of them. He saved they they came to his boat. He carried them, but as soon as he reached and he belonged to a place which is which comes under Pat prevention of uh, Aboriginal tribes. He came to that place and while, as soon as he was in the signal range, he called up the police and the police were already waiting for them at the jetty. That way we could uh, stop uh, a definite uh, uh, migration into our own area. So similarly, there was another incident in the northern group of uh, islands and that too, while sitting at Campbell Bay, we were able to manage uh, at that place. And this is at a very small level. Now, if we are talking of this small boats, a very small, we call it Donkeys, a very small boat which is able to do this. Now, at a larger uh, context, this will definitely uh, this will definitely help into the uh, safety, security, maintenance of uh, our own uh, region. Uh, next, uh, like uh, uh, yesterday, sir was saying uh, that he first saw a, a map uh, which was turned upside down of India. And then they were surprised why it is like that and they corrected it. Yesterday I went back after listening to you, sir. I actually looked at the map turned upside down and then the horizon increased suddenly. And then while talking, you mentioned that uh, this is our backyard. Now I, I actually think that this should not be our backyard. This can be our courtyard. We opened, now we are, you are like uh, sir mentioned it, 80% uh, of our resources which is lying in this courtyard and uh, only it's only contributing 4% to our GDP. So we look at that, look at it at that way. Now uh, backyard can be those sectors where just like our backyards of our houses, we keep a lot of protection over there and uh, we are less worried about that and keep exploring our uh, uh, courtyard. A small uh, doubt that I always, uh, I still have in my mind with regard to the huge uh, constructions that is coming up uh, at, at uh, the Great Nicobar Islands. So this will uh, maybe fructify in the coming years. But uh, then we also talk of uh, those uh, marine lives and all those things over there. Uh, that uh, the beautiful creature that comes all the way from uh, uh, southern continents who came, come and lay eggs hatch over there. So this will definitely uh, require some uh, amount of uh, thoughts from our side. Probably UDA will def come up with some uh, solution to uh, these things. But definitely when uh, when it comes to a nation, then a little bit of sacrifices can be taken, but not to completely harm the ecosystem. That's it. My journey probably <laughs> next, I don't know. I can go back to some desert. <laughs> One more thing to add. <laughs> the day I came down from the glacier, I was sent to MWC, Maritime, War, War Time, uh, Maritime uh, Warfare Center, and now at MRC. So uh, probably God has got some idea, some uh, plans for me that now I, I keep on diving into the oceans. Thank you so much, sir. So we'll, yeah, any young officer wants to say something who have been attending? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lieutenant Commander Abhishek, uh, HW2 Anistake. So uh, as my designation is anti submarine Warfare Officer, so I had some background of uh, underwater domain. Uh, so, uh, after doing my specialization uh, course 
in aw school linus uh, in kochi so there we uh, are taught about the basics of uh, underwater domain but that is just restricted to the sonar how we are going to find the summary how the acoustics are going to help us in detection and we learn mostly about the sensors and weapons from the naval perspective for the underwater domain uh, on my ship ins take there is a uh, etar system active towed air sonar so that we can stream up to 800 meters so that system was developed by uh, french so on that system there is a mode mammal protection mode so before we switch on that system we need to uh, before we actually transmit we need to switch on that system for 30 minutes and we need to wait for 30 minutes and then we start transmission so that any mammals around that area can be scattered and we uh, increase the detection transmission very slowly from minus 30 db to minus 10 and so on but when we actually uh, do this operations at sea uh, i'll be very frank we have hardly uh, done that mammal protection mode and we don't uh, actually follow those protocols which are concerning the maritime environment so i'll be very frank after attending uh, this domain this underwater domain awareness the concepts of uh, sediment management uh, ai intervention and other things these things are never taught in a naval perspective so these things uh, were very uh, knowledgeable and uh, maybe from now on i'll be more upfront to my commanding officer for switching on that mammal protection board i uh, thank you sir uh, so much for inviting me thank you sir Yes, I yes, sir. I think because your perspective will be very important. He represents the Maharashtra Coastal Police. Kindly introduce yourself, also, sir. Sir, uh, Jain, sir. Uh, sir, myself, Shrimas Gharie. I am Deputy Commissioner of Police, uh, Greater Bombay, uh, Quick Response Team. Uh, actually, we have one DCP Coastal also, but uh, due to some is this schedules i am over here uh, it's my proud privilege uh, to be with all of you that uh, i am attending this wonderful workshop but it's uh, training and uh, awareness uh, workshop for me after 2611 only you know from uh, you know coastal police there is one ig coastal post then coastal commissioner is there it's just for the city area bombay thane new bombay Mira Bhaiendra was there. For rest of the five districts, just uh, local uh, district police takes care of uh, uh, coastal region. Uh, it's very unfortunate that uh, Miss uh, when I see all of you over here, Miss uh, whatever uh, depth of knowledge, whatever you do have, uh, I think only one two percent of it uh, we might be having. And likewise, uh, you know, that sir said uh, two years back that um, quantitatively. we have gone but qualitatively we don't and it's with us too we have boats then we have our police personnel also but still when they are about to go to you know see till nine nautical miles they have you know stomach issues and they try to avoid it means it is the case with us so so it really needs to be developed and uh, you know uh, such trainings uh, needs to be arranged for our coal, uh, coastal police uh, you know personals so definitely there will be benefit here and uh, you know the threat for this country is uh, not from uh, you know sky but it will be definitely from the sea only which needs to be guarded that i will say that it over here and definitely this uh, i will say i will take it to my colleagues to senior officials like uh, police commissioners and uh, whatever uh, you know higher uh, authorities and uh, i will see that uh, they get benefited out of it and uh, our uh, country mostly you know bombay city it's just seven you know islands they were made together in the history and uh, the city has formed it's the economic capital capital of the whole india which needs to be protected so definitely i have so you know what some aspect and uh, some view uh, for myself and for the police also that i will take forward 
So I'm glad over here to be with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate your frank uh, uh, inputs for us. Uh, Vasan sir. Uh, thank you, Arnab, uh, for this opportunity. Dr. Ajay Kumar, Chandra Shikatkar. Uh, but I was supposed to only come yesterday, give my talk and go away. But uh, I told Arnab, said, having known your work, I'd like to understand a little more of this. So maybe I'll stay on for a couple of days workshop. You know, I think uh, that's one of the best decisions that I made personally. And thanks for encouraging me to attend the workshops. Now, what it's done is to enlarge the vision of UDA as far as all of us are concerned. I'm talking about all the participants here, uh, like uh, Commandant, Commandant Swaroop brought out uh, all this while. It was when you say maritime domain awareness, it's all about scratching the surface. So, so maritime domain awareness is really meant scratching the surface and not knowing anything about it literally and figuratively. So I think it's uh, from the point of view that this workshop has definitely uh, benefited uh, all the participants here from uh, different disciplines. You know, the BSF has a great role in understanding how the waters behave along the creeks. You know, whether it's in Sundarbans or whether it's in uh, Sir Creek area, they need to know how water behaves and what it will do to their own detection devices, their surveillance mechanism, you know, and their counters, therefore. So th this is a complete ecosystem which is overhauled when you understand what the complexities are. Uh, before I proceed further, I must first compliment Commander Arnab and his entire team for putting up this wonderful capsule. You know, this last, these three days plus two more days which are going to be there is going to be extremely useful. And I saw some of the presentations by uh, the IIT uh, researchers who are there. I think that's mind-boggling. I would go to the extent of saying that should be a national mission. On the same lines as uh, Dr. Ajay Kumar brought out, to say that Navy was able to identify those 75 key technology areas in which we allowed the SMEs and MSMEs to come up. Let's identify that perhaps. I think in this talk, he's already identified what the task of Commander Arnav Das and his team is in terms of laying down a roadmap for how we are going to ensure that the nation benefits from your initiatives in the UDA. So therefore, all the points that is brought out, I'm sure you've taken a note of this in terms of identifying what are these critical technologies that are of importance. How can we involve this ecosystem in providing the solutions for monitoring these huge tracts of ocean? You're looking, to, looking at, uh, like he said, an area equivalent to the land mass, but which is giving you 4%. But instead of telling you what your target is, increase this from 4% to 40%, from 40% to 80%, and then to 90%. Obviously, you know, all this tamasha about GDP, you know, not able to sustain GDP. Remember, I heard Ambassador Bambavale saying that, you know, we are not in a position to match this economic differential with China. Because we are not able to sustain this GDP growth. But, you know, you have this golden reserve here, and we are not doing much about it. So let's at least first concentrate on increasing our contribution to the GDP growth by increasing this from 4%. 10% to 20% progressively to 30% and go up to 80%. So from that point of view, I think the Navy has always been you know, very proud to have been in part of the service, which brought out its own first frigate in 1972. So we've been in the forefront of indigenization and I think Navy knows its uh, tasks. Oh, no, some of the, 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 the way the, the IIT researchers have you know, made that application was very impressed with this because you know what was presented yesterday uh, by uh, what is his name? I forget. Yeah, no, it was, it was an out, outstanding work because they've been able to use, you know, the existing algorithms, use Python, you know, write each code as you mentioned. You know, the biggest thing which I must, you know, the reason why I'm sharing some of this, though the participants know about, is also to let people like Dr. Ajay Kumar know, you know who has been a bureaucrat, who has been a technocrat, who is an academician, you know, and, and I'm sure he's already see. That is the sincerity. It is also making notes, and I'm sure this will reach. The, those people who matter. So you know, this is where that means there is something that UDA is taking uh, that kind of an effort to write each code on their own so that you know there are no ownership claims and we are able to modify as required based on the stakeholder inputs that's going to come. Whether it's a fisherman, whether it's a ONGC guy, I don't know whether it is somebody who is promoting bio economy initiatives. So you know, we know what we have to do now. So you know the as they say it's the notion out there. But the ocean out there is below the depth, below the surface. It's not on the surface. 
So when you, know, when you make pile claims or naval officers who are there, you also uh, said, you know, we are only looking at submarines, sonar noise, you know, maybe mines, maybe midgets, maybe something else which is there, but all this is a security concern. So what the Navy is looking at, what the Coast Guard is looking at, Coast Guard to certain extent is on the pista missions, but they're looking at the security dimensions of maritime domain. But usually you see the maritime strategy that is required for the nation. You know, I think that is where we need to change our view about what is maritime domain awareness, which is essentially looking at ships, submarines, you know, traffic patterns here and there, monitoring them at Delhi in the IMAC and then ensuring that there is no terrorist attack or there is no, uh, what are they called, uh, rogue ships uh, which are carrying pirates or, you know, connected as mother ships, etc. So, I think once you have the distinction of M what is MDA, which means the security requirement, and what is UDA, which is the future of this country. So, therefore, from that point of view, I, in my assessment, after what I have seen yesterday, I have been monitoring Commander Arnab's work for a long time, and in fact, I did invite him to the annual science and technology, uh, you know, conclave that we have in Chennai. And uh, therefore, this is now my appeal, sir, to use your good officers to make this a national mission for uh, India uh, to embark this, you know, and, you know, let it be, get included in all forums, uh, including the G20 for that matter, because you're going to get more people on board, you know, more the media. You know, that means there are expertise, and our ANAP is in an excellent position. I know the amount of hard work he has put in, and this morning, the Mr. Profugi himself, we took a walk uh, for about an hour. It was walking the talk and talking the walk. So that's where, you know, there is so much that I learned about the kind of efforts that I've gone in personally from Commander Nap and from the supporters who are here. And, you know, they uh, virtually taken this upon as a national mission. But I must also compliment the youngsters who are here, you know, who joined hands because it's their technical expertise, their passion, and, and, you know, the need to revitalize a domain that is not understood by the nation. Even today, believe you me, is not just some of us who have been made a little more aware, but 99% of this nation does not know about underground domain awareness. If you talk about UDA, they'll tell you, are they submarines? Are they submarine cables? The only uh, add-on to the knowledge is submarine cables. Uh, because we have mobiles are affected. So otherwise they would even worry about the submarine cables and the vulnerability thereof. So, you know, therefore, uh, I would definitely provide some more inputs to you separately based on my understanding of what it what can be done. But uh, I must uh, uh, thank you profusely, sir, for uh, well, virtually laying on the map, uh, roadmap for uh, uh, the UDA people to, you know, chart, talk this down and with the leadership of uh, General Saab, uh, you know, it, it is not going to be uh, difficult at all. And uh, no, like I said, this is the cerebral center of the country. And uh, with the support from Thiruvan and Tapuram, I have no, I have no doubt that, uh, you know, this will become and be translated into a national mission that's defined, uh, you know, and defined and it reaches all the states, particularly the nine maritime states and the United Union territories who are there who are dealing with. And you can, you know, now uh, suballocate all this to various people. On the point that you made, sir, about uh, you know not knowing how much of oil that we have or oil gas we have, I must go back to the 60s, where some of the American ships came here apparently, carried out the survey and said you do have no oil, and it, it finally took the Russians to come here and uh, you know carry out the surveys to tell us you have oil. Thanks, thanks to them we have the Mumbai high. So therefore we don't know what we have. So a lot of this again has to be a focus on survey, not the usual survey that we do only to see what is the depth profile, you know, what is the salinity or what is the sedimentation, but more in terms of, you know, the, the, uh, the, the livelihood that goes on there in terms of uh, marine, marine biodiversity, which is there. So there is so much which is there. And, you know, I know time is short, so I can keep talking about some of this. But I would like to personally uh, say there's a great job, extremely well done by this competent team who are there with the support of the right kind of people here. And this is the way forward. So if India has to acknowledge the fact that we are in the century of the seas, and as everybody tries to tell you that it's the century of India, uh, we are here to ensure that it's made. Because without our contribution, without UDA's contribution, upcup GDP 4% se 5% jayega. But <laughs> that is the mission and vision, and I'm sure I will take this forward. 
and uh, I must uh, thank you again for making me part of this initiative. And I'm very happy that I came here and uh, I carry back so much more uh, of what I can also, uh, you know, translate into our own ideas when you are dealing with the Indo-Pacific Ocean and in terms of what we do with uh, China. Others may be, of course, uh, for the counters, etc. Thank you so much. Jai Hind. complete this story because you reminded me that I did not complete the oil story. So, you know, uh, you know just to, to end it on a posit very positive note. So, two years back, we opened up the whole Indian Ocean region for survey because we had not done this for the last 75 years. And now, uh, uh, you know, because this, and we also realized this, that the life of any oil fossil fuel may be next 30 or 40 years after that fossil fuel may not be relevant. So, we need to really again do this very fast and so now global tenders have been given and i think are some of them have been finalized to actually get people from all over the world to actually go and survey our indian ocean ez area 90 percent of the area has now been opened up for survey so we hope if we have oil and that is answering commander Vasan's thing if we have oil we'll know if that we don't have oil that's fine too i mean but i think we'll find oil that's what the feeling is from So uh, request uh, Jan Shekhatka sir to have the last words. Okay. Uh, thank you all so much, and uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ajay Kumar sir. Uh, it's a real encouragement for us, and we definitely will try our best and continue with our uh, efforts. And uh, but definitely, sir, uh, uh, we have taken note of what you said, and definitely, I mean, uh, my meeting with you is due anyway. We'll have to. Look at the larger roadmap. Uh, so we'll we'll talk about that, sir, and we'll take it forward from there. Uh, thank you all so much, and uh, we'll break for lunch, and we have an interesting lecture after this. Thank you so much. Do we want a group photograph, sir? Sir, yes, outside. Yeah, I request all the attendees and dignitaries to gather outside the hall.
in 2015. Huge opportunities lie ahead in the Indian Ocean region. The underwater domain awareness framework can lead the path to the future. Who said modern warfare is only about firepower? Modern warfare is all about smart electronics. Be it land, air, or sea. Military operations is all about bits and bytes, rather than sheer firepower. Modern wars are fought with radars, radios, and computers. That's the impact of electronics. BEL is continuously pioneering innovation in electronics as a potent weapon for the defense forces, delivering military electronics of the highest quality. BEL enables change to professional electronics by harnessing the power of satellites and ground-based communication technologies for the benefit of the common man. Armed with nine high-tech manufacturing plants rolling out over 350 quality products, BEL has grown into a multi-product, multi-technology company. In any strategic army operation, timely and efficient communication rings success thanks to our secure handheld mobile radios and manpacks. Vehicle-mounted equipment for ground-to-ground, ground-to-air, and ground-to-sea communication, which enable efficient communications during critical missions and situations. Modern warfare relies on intelligent electronics to counter the impact of enemy weapon systems. All electronic warfare systems for signal and communications intelligence, electronic countermeasure, an electronic support measure have become the most important weapons in the arsenal of the defense forces. BEL's command control communications computers and intelligence systems, popularly known 
as C4I systems enable optimal management of firepower through artillery command control systems and secure communication via integrated secure digital communication networks. What's more, when you have to hold ground during enemy aggression, battle tanks take center stage. And our tank communication systems help achieve higher reliability while gunning for victory. The Indian Navy relies on BEL for efficient communication during war and peace. C4I systems as well as radars, sonars, decoys, and sonar boys help the Navy achieve control over the high seas. BEL's two decades of expertise in optoelectronics is well known. Thermal images, night vision goggles, binoculars and laser range finders meet the surveillance needs of the defense forces to resist enemy infiltration and helping in paramilitary operations. Our electronic voting machines have made Indian citizens vote with confidence, ensuring free and fair elections. A developing economy, India's various technological needs are addressed by us. Our solar technology helps light the remotest of Indian villages and, of course, manage the burgeoning traffic across cities. Our e-governance systems help state governments to reach out to the people quickly and efficiently. While our air traffic management systems ensure safe takeoff and landing of aircrafts across airports in the country, at BEL, R&D and innovation is a way of life. Each BEL unit has its own R&D setup, focusing on product-specific requirements, supported by two central research laboratories at Bangalore and Kaziobad to explore futuristic and cutting-edge technologies. Tie-ups with external agencies like DRDO helps in joint development of products. This multifaceted R&D approach allows us to drive innovation and change consistently. And all our units are ISO certified. BEL's management practices are not just inspired, but also driven by its customers. Planned diversification and exploration of new markets, resourcefulness, operational commitment and excellence are hallmarks of BEL's corporate functioning. BEL has emerged as a quality defense electronic supplier to the world, catering to over 40 countries across the globe who've relied on BEL products for years. As India consolidates its leadership position in the new economy, there's only one Indian company aiming for a global footprint in professional electronics. And that is Bharat Electronics, India's pride in defense electronics. बाकी आपने तो ठीक है करके उसको लाके भी दे देते हैं हाँ वो दस मिनट निकलना है
The Indian Ocean region, IOR, has become the theater of geopolitical and geostrategic interactions in the 21st century, and various nations, both from within and the extra-regional powers, are deploying the strategic assets in the region. Marine Spatial Planning, MSP, is probably the most effective tool for governance and management for challenges and opportunities in the marine as well as the Please scale up this model for the entire world. Number two, the addition Jeff, can you hear me? of the local tropical underwater channel model is a big addition. I can. Can you hear me? Yes. yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much for joining us. It's my two, pleasure. Digital transformation with focus on acoustic signal processing will uh, far more we have uh, energy inclusion into policy interventions. Set of uh, uh, participants who uh, represent uh, different strategic security in oh. establishments in India. So uh, we have officers from the Army, Navy, uh, Indian Armed Forces, of course, and uh, Water Security Force, some very senior officials from all the organizations. Uh, people are represented uh, from Coast Guard, and uh, so, and there are people online also. So we would be eagerly waiting to hear your perspective. And uh, I would also request you to kindly introduce yourself before you. Uh, that's the tradition we normally follow. I would like you to please introduce yourself, uh, your own background and your institution, and then kindly make your presentation. Thank you, Jeff. Well, thank you, sir. Uh
And good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will share some slides in a second, but uh, per my orders, um, I will do an introduction. My name is Jeff Payne. Uh, I work at the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies, which we just simply make call NISA. Um, we're one of six regional centers under yes, the- Is this a possibility to, to increase your volume in some oh. way? Is that better? Yeah, that's a little better, but. How about now? No. Better? Let me see. Yes, give me a minute. Sure. Yes. It's two minutes. I'll just... Okay, uh, Jeff, you uh, please start. Okay. Am I coming through a little bit louder? Yeah, we go ahead. Okay. Um, so forgive me for introducing technical problems. Um, but again, my name is Jeff Payne. I'm with the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies in Washington, DC. You can just call us NISA. Uh, my portfolio there is I cover maritime security issues in the Indo-Pacific. Um, we are one of six of these regional centers that covers the entirety of the globe. Um, a lot of you may be familiar, if you're not familiar with NISA, you may be familiar with our sister center, the uh, Daniel K. Inoue uh, Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Honolulu, which covers uh, the traditional Asia Pacific, but also the Indo-Pacific region. Um, Given the orders that Dr. Das has, has given me um, and knowing that this, this uh, senior audience probably has forgotten more about maritime security and um, various maritime challenges that I can ever learn, uh, I'm going to try to do a quick introduction uh, into the mindset of how the United States is approaching the Indo-Pacific as a theater and then from that uh, how maritime domain awareness 
um, is being debated, discussed, um, and, and targeted through policy. So if you will allow me, I will share some slides. Um, I think it's coming through. Can you see my slides? Yes, sir, they are visible. Okay, great. Um, so obviously all of you know the Indo-Pacific, but for Washington, and, and this is going to be a presentation based upon the biases of, of the US. Um, we haven't comprehensively uh, matched up our conception of the Indo-Pacific with the other countries that have defined the Indo-Pacific, such as India and Japan, um, even Australia. Ours still very much correlates to what was the historical boundary of US Pacific Command, which is now Indo-PACOM. Um, but to get through some, some comprehensive and immediate talking points that I'm sure will come up in Q&A, um, the narrative about the Indo-Pacific um, and the United States is that it's about competition and specifically competition with China. Um, I'm going to get, go through this quickly just because, um, while it is of interest, um, for India, vis-a-vis uh, -vis India, China competition, US, China competition. It is real, um, but the Indo-Pacific is not com comprehensively, nor would it be accurate to define the American mindset on the Indo-Pacific from the competition with China. Um, I started off as a China hand, um, living and working in China uh, when I was a graduate student. And so, when you hear about the US perspectives on China, it's usually from this cataclysmic, um, there is, we disagree on everything, the tensions are rising, uh, the teapot may be boiling soon, um, but that's not actually reflective of the US conversation. Um, and these give you some insights into how that conversation is going. Um, there are, I think for me and my own personal Jeff's bias is that one of the aspects of competition that is very real um, is in terms of China's international revisionism and essentially wanting to reshape the rules of the game and the understanding between countries to favor its own interpretations and its own interests. Um, that in and of itself doesn't make it dangerous, but it does undermine um, essentially a code book that most states by and large follow. Um, and that is a very real concern of the US. The second that I would emphasize is technological competition. That is very much a real competitive relationship between the United States and China. And you see this in all sorts of, of developments, including ones I know you've been talking about this week related to uh, digital tools um, for interpreting large data sets to um, deployment of certain sensors, um, the, the commercial revolution in low Earth orbit. There's a whole series um, of, of competitive uh, dynamics in the technological arena. Um, I can review all this later, but what is often lost, um, and this may be the U.S.'s own fault for not emphasizing it enough, is that for the U.S., the Indo-Pacific is a maritime construct. It is tied both to the global commons and also the littoral spaces um, and the tensions and challenges that exist in the maritime domain and how they are either inspired by tensions or considerations on land or how issues at sea spread onto the land and shape contemporary policy. Um, 
Furthermore, the rules-based order is, is not just a, a slogan. It is not something that President Biden or the Secretary of Defense or Secretary Blinken from the State Department uh, rolls out um, to, to talk to um, regional allies or regional partners or even potential challengers of the U.S. Um, or rivals. It is an understanding of there is a rule, a, a set of rules that govern the maritime spaces. Otherwise, it doesn't work. You know, whether you know the history of the development of UNCLOS, um, whether you understand contemporary um, traditional patterns, um, the good rules of the road that all responsible navies around the world follow, um, and even just the, the, the traditional parameters, commercial shipping, as well as either artisanal or commercial fishing, um, there is very much a set of distinct challenges coming towards uh, the United States out of the maritime domain of the Indo-Pacific. So transitioning to maritime domain awareness, um, what is the perspective of the United States? There is, the comprehensive assessment is that there's good and bad right now. Um, the issue that the U.S. has is the same issue um, when it comes to MDA that every country, no matter their location, no matter their level of development has. 15 years ago, the amount of data available to sailors in Coast Guards or in navies um, might be considered uh, low. There wasn't necessarily a ton of data outside of your own system that was constantly coming in. I think that's actually the opposite today. There is a lot of data. There's a lot of different data sources. How do we navigate that data? And then more importantly, how do we trust it? Um, is it based upon who produces it? Is it based upon the methodology in which it's compiled? Is it based upon the speed and regularity in which it's, it's provided? These are all questions that the U.S. has not necessarily figured out um, itself and, and looks around the world to see how others are approaching this and, and finding solutions. But the days of doubt, uh, data drought um, are over. Um, that is certainly the case that the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Coast Guard, um, the Department of Defense, as well as the U.S. interagency has recognized. Um, and so what the U.S. is transitioning towards is the idea of the of the sailor slash data engineer. Now, obviously, all sailors um, or law enforcement, maritime law enforcement officers, whether it be in Coast Guard or some other constabulary, they've always been data engineers as well as sailors. Um, but the issue of this being codified within the U.S. system is is gaining strength where the idea that you don't necessarily have to spend all of your time not being a sailor it just means that the amount of tools that are in your toolbox that you can reach for are more diverse those should be recognized and the sailor should understand why they're present why those additional tools are there um for the U.S., the maritime domain awareness effort, um, both domestically and, and internationally, has become crowded with interested parties. Um, it's no longer just maritime law enforcement or, or navies getting together to debate and talk about this. It is no longer purely a state-to-state -state driven phenomenon. Um, it is very much filled with public and private actors. Um, who all have varying interests, who all have varying methods of approaching the question of MDA. But the comprehensive thing that they all share in common is that what's going on at sea matters. We have to pay attention to it, and our policymakers must reflect that in the policies that they develop. Um, and then we're, we're grappling with the various methodologies that not only we, but a lot of our friends and partners around the world are developing. Obviously, you have the idea of the fusion center, such as the IFC IOR. Um, you have various forms of, of exercises um, that nations or even within a nation and interagency deployment um, 
where they integrate various new tools and approaches to MDA is becoming more regular. Various experimentations from, from the United States context, this is best represented by Task Force 59 out of NAVCENT in, in Bahrain, which was um, essentially an experiment on how can we use off-the-shelf technological products to build greater domain awareness in, in specific um, worry points or choke points or um, uh, port entries um, and network all of these tools together. And then the various applications and tech that have evolved, everything from marine traffic to sea vision to IORIS, um, to the, the, the data systems that the IFC IOR uses. How do these all work? How do they all interact? Can they interact? Should they interact? Um, these are a lot of the questions that the US is approaching. The connectivity among all of these actors is forming. Right now it's chaos, and that's my assessment, but it's chaos. But that I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because that chaos reflects that there are more people than ever paying attention and there are more people than ever trying to find solutions. And so we have to maybe tolerate this period of, of chaos and everyone recreating the wheel, so to speak, and, and replicating efforts so that the word gets out and a common kind of perspective or common methodology emerges from that that connects all of this energy together. Um, and then also the U.S. has a tendency to over rely on digital tools. Um, this was common when they emerged, you know, seven or eight years ago. Um, we're, we're recognizing that they're not magic. Um, traditional sources and methods remain vital. And so these can't be jettisoned because we have SAR imagery from low earth orbit or radio, uh, radar, radio frequency imagery, or we have new sensors that are de designed for one-off use that are cheaper and then therefore can be more readily deployed. Um, coastal community experiences, um, the, the qualitative experiences of sailors, um, the experiences of your merchant marines, um, those who have familiarity with not only your coastal waters, but your inland waters and what lessons can be translated to your maritime space. All of this is data that has to be captured and has to be integrated. And then how MDA is evolving, you know, for the U.S. it started as a, as a, a concept on a way for the maritime services to bang the drum internally to get policymakers on Capitol Hill or in the White House or at the secretary level to pay attention to the challenge sets that were happening. Because these are things that if you're not of the community, you won't necessarily understand their significance. And so it was a way for the community itself to figure out how to sell the opportunities and the challenges that existed in the maritime space. But we're going beyond that now. And a perfect example, um, that is of focus this week um, is underwater domain awareness. That is the new frontier, so to speak, on a lot of different efforts. Um, and how do we get on the same page on that? What kind of cooperation can be built? How are we going to talk about and address issues like seabed mining and, and mineral um, uh, exploitation on the seabed? Um, discussions of sonar and communication, um, undersea cables, not only their vulnerability physically, but their cyber vulnerabilities, um, who their ownership is, how are they regulated, um, and then a whole host of other things pertaining to everything from environmental protection to silt buildup and, and onwards and onwards. These are all things that the U.S. is, is moving towards. Um, from the U.S. mindset, um, there is a network of interested parties related to MDA that are developing. Um, there's a real set of them, a real powerful, mobilized, um, innovative, um, like, like our hosts of this conference that are doing a lot of great work. Um, but there is no hub um, and there is no yet global convener 
for comprehensive maritime domain awareness conversations. We don't yet, I think, have an idea of should there even be a global convener? Should there be a hub? Um, maybe there's a series of hubs. Maybe they're state led. Maybe they are not. Maybe they're commercially led. Um, maybe they're regionally defined. We don't yet have all of those details, but that's, in my mind, a positive development because it means that we've made a lot of progress on, on getting everyone to recognize the problem set. Um, so for the US, the US government um, and the interagency, whether it be the Department of Homeland Security, whether it be uh, the Department of the Interior, which often has a lot of uh, regulatory functions on our internal waterways, um, obviously the Department of Defense and the Department of State, um, our directing focus, um, trying to figure out how the U.S. is going to use all of this energy in NDA and all the innovation that's coming through it, around it, emerging from it um, into something that creates policy coherence and facilitates international partnerships. Um, the main mechanism that this is flowing forward is what we call public-private partnerships. Um, they are becoming much more efficient. It has facilitated um, a real kind of revolution inside of the United States government on how we conceive of, of contracting, how we conceive of adopting technology and adopting partnerships. Um, the regulatory functions are shifting to emphasize both efficiency, so speed, but also protection of the public good. Um, and then that's freed up essentially a lot of, of incubation of various private sector actors to experiment more and more um, with what they can come up with, whether it be from an academic mindset, whether it be from an NGO environmental uh, platform, or whether it be purely by market-driven um, uh, kind of considerations, profit. Um, so a lot of the partnerships in the US um, are tied to the tech industry, but not com comprehensively. We're getting, obviously, trying to grapple with the commercial revolution in orbit, um, how this can not only serve the U.S. interests, but also kind of the, the public good of, of the wider Indo-Pacific, if not the world. Um, the idea that for the United States, um, the price point, and I think this is also true of, of India's own space agencies um, and, and, uh, and, and space market um, companies, the cost of operating in that that sector today is far lower than it was 10 years ago and considerably lower than it was 20. So the idea of getting something into orbit um, and what you get into orbit, its functions can be multifaceted. Um, that's been a real revolution in what is possible and what kind of da data and, and connections and linkages can be created. Um, how we interpret based upon the data we get from commercial orbit, um, how that can be filtered, whether it be through um, machine learning tools, simplistic forms of AI to develop pattern recognition um, and to highlight where there are seams, where there are um, obviously bizarre variables that keep emerging. Um, and then that can assist with deploying assets in, on, or under the water uh, more effectively. Um, and then obviously a lot of our incubator structures, which tend to focus on research laboratories, um, addressing issues related to ISR, related to issues regarding uh, the blue economy, uh, protecting, uh, you know, your natural resources, such as, uh, you know, your fisheries, um, your coastal uh, uh, swamps and, and um, essentially weather uh, blockers, as we call them in the United States. Um, and then also to essentially combat climate change. Um, and then finally, essentially the longer term idea of how are we going to conceptualize this in our bilateral and multilateral engagements with other countries of like-minded nature? How do we facilitate the development of these experiments um, in other countries? Um, 
How do we work together? You know, the example between the U.S. and India is Indus X, uh, which is shows the the level of of innovation from both countries and how there are real opportunities to learn from each other, given a, a essentially a real connectivity that comes from the senior level that goes all the way down to the operation level on an economic or even security basis. Um, and then also how we up, update, if not adapt our, our legal structures, um, how we conceptualize um, operations, um, how law enforcement tools can be redefined, um, how scientific inquiry um, can be kept um, com comprehensively scientific and comprehensively trustworthy, but also move with greater speed. Um, and so all of this is the, the kind of juggle that, that the US is dealing with. And to kind of conclude some of my remarks, um, what I see, uh, and this again is just my personal opinion, this is Jeff Payne from NISA, no one else. Um, for me, and, and I think Dr. Das, given our engagements in the past would agree with some of this, um, the there is a lot of opportunities when it comes to information and data. Um, for me, the more data that's available gr gives you the greater opportunity to figure out what is there. And the great thing about all of this data accumulation is that our traditional forms of data, whether it be government, traditional government operations, or traditional coastal communities or fishing communities, uh, experiential data, um, is we know when the data set is clearly out of line, when it's anomalous. Um, because that is a real concern. You can get data that is corrupted, that is purposefully designed to create um, further confusion. And so, but for me, the more data builds the more awareness. The more awareness builds better policy and better policy increases the cost on the bad actors that we're all committed to fighting. Um, it also allows us, for me, information to break through a lot of the regional isolation that exists in the maritime space um, and among the U.S. specifically, a lot of our silos within government. Um, MDA has been a real effective mechanism to get people from various agencies, from various institutions to come together that otherwise would not be in the same room. Um, I routinely talk to people from NOAA, from NASA, um, from the Commerce Department, from our Department of the Interior, our Fisheries and Wildlife Preservation Officers, even our National Park Service are people that I routinely talk to because they have data that can be useful for me. Um, and then this data is really allowing us to start to specialize and learn respectively within our government or within the US itself, what institutions are best at doing certain things. And then also with our engagement with international partners, where do we have advantages over others and where can we learn from others who have learned or developed capabilities that we are interested in? So for instance, um, in underwater domain awareness, the idea that the US, um, its underwater sensors and its underwater um, kind of technological tools that's developing in the commercial space have historically um, been developed tied to the North Atlantic and to the Northern Pacific, um, which have a comprehensively different makeup temperature wise, um, concentration of biomass, um, as well as underwater features versus say the Indian Ocean or Southeast Asia. Um, those waters are tropical and far different um, in how they operate and what challenges exist. So learning those lessons has allowed some of our commercial and, and academic institutions to start look at things um, operating out of, say, Hawaii, which is not the Indian Ocean, but certainly has a more similar water pattern and also to cooperate such as relationships between universities in India, universities in Japan, universities um, in Australia, universities with, in Singapore, 
um, with U.S. universities and research labs to come together to to deploy these and to learn um, in these waters to gain greater understanding. Um, and then how specifically um, for the U.S., um, a lot of our regional partners uh, are island states, and they have a specific set of circumstances and a specific set of challenges when it comes to protecting their exclusive economic zones that are cataclysmic in their scale, and they often do not have the capabilities to sufficiently handle them all. So how can we be better um, in facilitating progress with these island states, both in the Pacific and in the Indian Ocean? Um, the, the final thing I will say before turning it to questions, and I look forward to the conversation and, and learning from all of you in the room, but um, for me, a persistent challenge that remains um, is the problem of, of trust and control. Um, who can we trust and can we release control or lead to another actor? And I say this as an American. Um, for me, my personal bias is that for a lot of this data, the toothpaste is out of the tube, so to speak. The commercial sector has caught up with, if in some cases even surpassed, what states are able to create um, or have developed. And so the idea of keeping everything siloed within our various departments um, is something we have to discuss more openly because we may be losing opportunities to really push forward in addressing some of these challenges because we're worried about the long-term implications. But given what I know that these commercial actors who are not tied to say the US government can put together regarding maritime challenges, um, it's pretty impressive. Um, it would make a lot of people inside of the government very impressed with the amount of data that can be accumulated. And then finally, the control aspect. Um, a lot of these issues that we're discussing in the maritime domain um, are tied very, very specifically to national sovereignty. And every state should have the right to determine what they will and what they should share. Um, the issue is that how do we discuss what, how we're going to do this in a more comprehensive um, way? Because right now it, it, it's still very much in the operational and even tactical level where small cohorts of people that are accustomed to working together develop methodologies by which they can exchange data. Um, how do we expand that to make it more common, more frequent? Um, the IFC IOR is one such example that India um, has implemented um, to, to a claim. Um, but is that something that can work for, say, the states of the Arabian Peninsula? Um, or East Africa, or the Gulf of Guinea, um, or even the Caribbean? Um, are there other models to that, that could be done besides a fusion center? Or is a fusion center the right methodology? These things, um, I think, is one of the biggest challenge sets, but also where a lot of the greatest opportunity rests. Um, and with that, um, here's my contact information if any of you want to reach out. Um, Feel free to email me with any questions, um, and you can follow me on on the Twitter if you if you use that um, that that program. Um, but I will stop sharing my slides. Thank you again for your attention, and happy to answer any questions or, or have a conversation. Yep. Any questions from the? Okay. Uh, Jeff, how do you look at India's role in this part of the world? I'm particularly asking you this because in this workshop, we have participation from all the four quad countries. Uh, you are here from the US. We had uh, Kim from the North US Asia Center. And then we'll have Tomori Akamatsu joining us from Japan. Uh, uh, Tom, I know him for a very long time, almost uh, 20 years, I can say. Uh, he's a researcher. Uh, uh, I mean, he was more of a technical researcher earlier, but now he is into policy. Uh, so, and from our Indian side, we've had some very, uh, you know, uh, 
high profile speakers in fact before your lecture today we had the former defense secretary dr ajay kumar you must uh, must be knowing him so he also had his views on how we need to take uda forward so in that context how do you see us india partnership and how do you see india's role in the core and beyond in the indo pacific well i think the the story bilaterally has been by and large um really good over the last decade there's been a lot of progress where the familiarity both um at the government level um at the at the senior level um all the way down to the operational level has really matured and you see that with all of the various announcements on a bilateral capacity um you saw that with the response that prime minister modi got when he visited the united states last year in fact i saw him personally i live right near the national science foundation um in the washington dc area and he visited uh the the national science foundation with the first lady um it was the one place he went because it was a it was a, a last minute addition um where there weren't crowds so it was kind of like just me randomly seeing prime minister modi on the street of my hometown um which i was not expecting um he waved at me um i i did yell at him and say prime minister modi um but there is a real sense that there's been a corner turn given obviously the history um the the difficult history in getting to this point um there's also a recognition that india knows these waters of the indian ocean and they are an indo-pacific power that approaches the problem sets from a unique vantage and we need to learn as much as we can and rely on india to the greatest degree we can um that is certainly the policy dimensions in terms of how we're doing that there's still a lot that has to be worked out there are still prickly issues related to how our various private sector actors can get in the other market how us companies can get more quickly integrated into india and vice versa um how the issues of certain technological components are transferred or transitioned or shared um how various understandings um regarding kind of regional dynamics um obviously the us is a global power and there can be we as an american we we can at times rush into a problem set with the intention of trying to help but not understand the localities at stake um and therefore trip up routinely and so india i've seen this firsthand where india has often um especially the indian navy um in the indian coast guard have delivered real poignant advice that has been received very very well by us pacific fleet us um uh navy central command um the united states coast guard um and there are lessons that are being directed um even if you don't necessarily see them from delhi or from pune or or mumbai or anywhere else in india that are being communicated and adapted within the us interagency so um i think keeping the momentum going and then in terms of india's role um essentially helping to define what the indian ocean means um what the challenge sets are um and where the the gaps are where either india's capabilities or an indian led cooperative effort or even a us india joint bilateral solution is the answer but helping us recognize where those opportunities exist great uh, what said yeah you come here Uh, Jeff, I'm Commodore Watson. I run the Chennai Center for China Studies and also look after the National Military Foundation of the Chennai chapter. You know, you made a lot of reference to data. You know, I think that is my focus of question in the sense of availability of data, both classified and unclassified. And as squad partners, how much are we willing to exchange? Particularly the non-sensitive data which may have been collected over decades of Cold War operations. Because that's what's going to be important for us uh, in investing in the UDA. You know, we have phenomenal amount of discussions here to say that you know, we need to understand this environment better. 
So you can't understand these environment unless you have data. And you know, all the partner nations, all the four nations have certain amount of data. You know, so therefore, I think our effort should be to try and see what kind of data can be collected, analyzed, put together, segregated, and shared amongst the crop partners. You know, but only can it be uh, some use to the, the SDG goals. You know, Commander Abnab has been uh, quite vocal in the fact to say that, you know, the SDG, all the goals of SDG can be met by investing in the UDA. So that means so I think it's data that's going to be important. So one is the future as to what should we be doing in terms of data collection. The other part is to see what is it that we have. You know, all of us have data. So how is that this can be put together and made useful for the humanity for the global common uh, this year? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, great, great questions. I don't know if I will sufficiently answer them. So maybe you can, you can you know, you can add on and, and, and give me more data to operate off of. But speaking from the US point of view, um, my own interpretation of it, um, there are limitations just like there are in India of what the US system is capable and comfortable in sharing. And this is why I, I can't speak to the larger, you know, from the, the Secretary of the Navy, from the Secretary of Defense, um, from the senior leader kind of, um, conference rooms, but the level that I, I exist at, um, this is why the U.S. Has, has transitioned so comprehensively and so quickly towards public-private partnerships. Um, this really is the mechanism by which we can push our own government into understanding what may be proprietary to our system because it was acquired by government process, but is readily available in the open source in the open source world. And there's no definitive answer yet within the United States. So therefore there's not a definitive answer on what the comprehensive solution is say between the US and India or the quad partners. Um, the default mechanism is this public private mechanism. That's the way the US is approaching it. Um, is it sufficient? No. And that gets to your second question. And that is, say the quad or even a us india bilateral relationship how can they deliver information and the public goods to the region um actually really shine a spotlight to help everyone who's legitimately wanting to help with the problem set or address the problem set how can we do this um we haven't comprehensively figured that out and i don't think anyone necessarily has and we're open to hearing it um the IFC IOR is a perfect example of one mechanism, but it's not the comprehensive solution. And neither is, say, public-private partnerships. Um, the quad itself is not the comprehensive answer. Um, the For me, I think we, like I said in my presentation, the chaos that exists right now um, comes with costs, but I think the cost are far outweighed by the, the benefits. And that is there are so many actors now with good intent who are jumping into this, this game, jumping into the level of inquiry, trying to figure out problem sets, whether it be stopping illegal fishing, stopping illicit transfer um, at sea, stopping human trafficking and human smuggling, um, stopping narcotics trafficking or protecting the environment, whatever it, ha it is um, that are, that when we figure out a way to kind of connect all of this together um it could be a real benefit to all actors at sea that are trying to maintain security um and can expose us to a lot of different mechanisms forward so i know i'm not answering your question and forgive me i i don't know if i could but um that's the best i can give you today thank you jeff uh, so, yeah, um, I mean, another point I wanted to also bring to everybody's notice is, uh, you know, the U.S.-India Strategic Maritime Partnership, it has been largely focused on the defense, uh, but I think there are far greater strategic issues beyond the defense, which also need to be addressed. And you also mentioned about uh, public partnerships, I mean, private partnerships, uh, you know, public and private partnerships, you know, that will be critical to take it forward. So, 
yeah, I look forward to our partnership and when we meet in Bangkok and, you know, taking that discussion forward and uh, we do have certain strengths in certain areas and uh, we do understand a little bit on, you know, how India is looking at things. So uh, I think definitely we working together can also contribute to the larger, you know, Indo-Pacific vision of India as well as the US or, you know, the global community is looking at the Indo-Pacific in a very, very different way. So thank you very much, Jeff. And uh, I look forward to continuing to interact with you and taking our ideas forward. Well, thank you. Um... I, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Uh, forgive me for that. Um, it's an absolute honor to to uh, to appear. Um, and yes, Dr. Das, I will lean on your expertise considerably in Thailand and beyond. And I will say a final leaving remark. Um, one thing I didn't mention was the, the IPOI, um, which is something that you would think on a diplomatic basis um, is something the US says, yes, this is a great idea. Yes, India, well done. Um, and then we continue to move about. No, it has been something that has been an organizing mechanism for how the US conceives of the IOR. Um, there is no conception in the United States of what the IOR is. It's talked about by people like me, um, but there's not a lot of us. And so India is helping to, to get us to define an approach using the tools and the strategic concepts or even the economic approaches, um, your outreach to East Africa, the way that you engage with, with the Arabian Peninsula, um, that is helping to, to refine our own policy. So I think you're right. It, it is going beyond just the defense. It's going to a lot of different sectors. So, yep, uh, uh, thank you. I mean, uh, even the IPOI in the second or third edition, I also made a presentation and I also contributed uh, chapter to that because uh, if you ask me, uh, obviously my bias to try U UDA will always be there, but uh, my paper also states that all the seven pillars can be well supported by UDA in the IPOI also. So uh, definitely, you know, we look forward to working together and taking it forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll break for uh, early tea and continue the next session. The Indian Ocean Region, IOR, has become the theater of geopolitical and geostrategic interactions in the 21st century, and various nations, both from within and the extra-regional powers, are deploying the strategic assets in the region. Marine Spatial Planning, MSP, is probably the most effective tool for governance and management for challenges and opportunities in the marine as well as the freshwater systems. The precise mapping of the resources, the quality and availability, concerns of security and sustainability, and many more can really help in their effective and efficient exploitation. All kinds of policy and technology interventions can be deployed using MSP in vast marine and freshwater systems. The UDA framework proposed by the Maritime Research Center, MRC, and Nirthalani Technology Private Limited, MDT, is a unique concept to address multiple challenges and opportunities in the tropical waters of the Indo-Pacific and beyond. The UDA framework has the technology-driven digital transformation at its core. Thus, MSP is better served by the UDA framework to manage the Indo-Pacific construct. Let's dive deep into what is marine spatial planning. MSP is a data-driven process of generating a spatio-temporal real-time appreciation of our marine areas to optimize the human interactions 
to achieve ecological, economical, and social objectives that have been specified through a governance process. The real-time MSP in the tropical waters require massive acoustic capacity and capability building given the suboptimal sonar performance. The mapping both on the surface and the subsurface required deep appreciation of the acoustic propagation characteristics to generate the spatiotemporal inputs. Along with that, the Environmental Impact Assessment, EIA, has to be inclusive, backed by detailed MSP construct. The ongoing MSP efforts somehow ignore the vast and deep underwater domain. The underwater domain awareness by construct require acoustic capacity and capability to undertake any kind of MSP. The cost of propagation underwater largely depends on temperature, density, and pressure that impact the sound velocity profile. Building up spatiotemporal maps has its own issues. In terms of availability for inputs and providing actionable inputs for the diverse users, the diversity of applications and the other user requirements makes it extremely complicated to formulate the final forms of the deliverables. On the other hand, there is constant increase in stranding of big whales and the serious acoustic habitat degradation prevalent in the west coast of India. Hence, policy interventions are urgently required. However, in the absence of nuanced cause and effect analysis, such as interventions become difficult. The vested interest groups are able to build narratives that mislead the policymakers and local communities. In order to solve these issues, the proposed 2DA framework has multiple innovative contributions for real impact on governance and technology development. Number one, the huge network of AIS system across the world gives us a very cost-effective means to scale up this model for the entire world. Number two, the addition of the local tropical underwater channel model is a big addition to bring focus into the tropical waters and the Indo-Pacific region. Number three, the digital transformation with focus on acoustic signal processing will allow far more science and technology inclusion into policy interventions and governance mechanism. Number four, the International Maritime Organization, IMO, has already taken cognition of the unique tropical characteristics and is now considering a regional framework. Number five, the real-time data-driven and quantitative and qualitative analysis of local site-specific inputs will go a long way in building digital infrastructure for effective policy and technology interventions, along with the caustic capacity and capability building. The regulators can monitor long-term sustainability impacts using various digital tools to derive MSP outputs. Micro and macro MSP tools need to be developed using digital and more advanced tools across the underwater region. A way ahead. The Geographic Information System GIS, based system have become very popular these days to manage the marine spatial planning. MSP based on the mapping tools for surface information. The comprehensive MSP is the tropical waters of the Indian Ocean region, IOR, will require a nuanced approach. The UDA framework has discussed about can certainly enhance the effective realization of the MSP and corresponding governance mechanism for the entire maritime space. Indian oceans have been protecting us for millennia. Now it is time for us to protect our oceans. Let us start conversations, strive for innovations, and vote for protection of the Indian Ocean region. Introducing Maritime Research Center, Foundation for Underwater Domain Awareness. The Maritime Research Center is a technology-driven think tank with a clear focus on the underwater domain awareness framework. Typically, what we look at in the underwater domain awareness framework is the pooling of resources and synergizing of effort across the stakeholders. We see in our region, particularly when we talk about the Indo 
Pacific region or more closer the Indian Ocean region, the significant fragmentation across the stakeholders. So how we can bring them together to address the challenges and opportunities of the tropical littoral waters is what we are looking at. Here we drive policy interventions, technology interventions, and also acoustic capacity and capability building so that this niche domain can be taken forward in a very, very seamless manner. Ebazi started with a mission to spearhead the UDA framework. Today, Maritime Research Center has carried out milestone projects, trained students and young professionals, hosted policymakers, leaders, experts on the MRC platform, set up centers of excellence across the country, gained nationwide attention, and started conversations on issues that matter. I mean, the point actually is that when you are talking about something which is not yet in the in the in in the foreground for our national consciousness or in the consciousness of our strategic community, then somebody actually has to start ringing the bell, and MRC is doing that. I think the the prime minister uh, speech at the UN, in my view, should be taken as a directive for early implementation of uh, whatever is what what is envisaged in the. Project. I think this is an unexplored area, a sunrise sector, and it's of great strategic importance that this actually, uh, this kind of evangelical work needs to be, needs to be further strengthened and further accelerated. So I compliment MRC for this. Especially in the light of the Indo-Pacific and the Indian Ocean uh, having become the fulcrum of global power. We have to understand the underwater domain. Uh, I wish the UDA uh, initiative, all success in the future, and I'm very happy to see that the government agencies of India and international agencies have all taken note of this initiative. Maritime Research Center is building the future of the underwater domain. Join us in our mission today. Here's presenting our very first newsletter for quarter one of 2024 at the Maritime Research Center, Pune and Nirdhwani Technologies. We performed various groundbreaking activities, pushing the boundaries of maritime research. This quarter has been marked by impactful collaborations. We've made remarkable strides in our partnerships and launched exciting new initiatives. Some of the major updates from the January-March quarter of 2024 are as follows. None of these remarkable strides would have been possible without you, our valued supporters. So, we invite you to check out our latest newsletter. Learn about our latest projects groundbreaking discoveries and upcoming events. Stay informed, stay engaged, and be a part of our journey towards a better, more sustainable maritime future. Thank you for your continued support. Together, we are making ways. The 21st century has seen a decisive shift in the global order. The Indian government has demonstrated significant maritime intent with the Sagar vision of the Honorable Prime Minister. This maritime focus has resulted in multiple mega projects by the government of India, like the Sagar Mal, Bharat Mail, Inland Water Transport, Multimodal Transport, the Deep Sea Mining Mission, International Seabed Authority allocation. With this strong maritime intent, India is well positioned geographically and geostrategically to play a leadership role in the region. 
the tropical littoral waters present unimaginable living and non-living undersea resources. The economic opportunities in the Indo-Pacific of the global commons as a facilitator for economic growth are waiting to be explored. It also comes with its fair share of challenges. The Indian Ocean region today is at the risk of facing political challenges like volatility, fragmentation, instability, lack of synergy among nations in the region, over dependence on extra regional powers, economic challenges like inequalities, growth challenges, lack of big investment, and technological challenges. There is one promising solution. The Underwater Domain Awareness Framework proposed by Maritime Research Center provides a solution to these challenges and opportunities. Let's understand the UDA framework in its horizontal and vertical construct. Four stakeholders of UDA are maritime security, blue economy, environment and disaster management, and science and technology. The horizontal construct looks at resource availability in terms of technology, infrastructure, capability, and capacity. The vertical construct gives a hierarchy for establishing underwater domain awareness. Ground level looks at sensing underwater domain for threats, resources, and activities. The second level makes sense of the data gathered for security strategies, conservation, and resource utilization. The third level formulates and monitors regulatory framework at the local, national, and global level. In this way, the underwater domain awareness framework provides a comprehensive way forward for stakeholders to interact and solve multiple challenges being faced by the nation. The oceans, limitless, powerful, unknown. They have long awoken a sense of awe and wonder. But today, we must ask a question. How much do we really know about our oceans? To what degree are we harming them? To what degree are we utilizing them? Oceans have been protecting us for millennia. What can we do now to protect our oceans? Today, let's talk about underwater domain awareness. There are typically four stakeholders uh, when we talk about the UD. The national security apparatus, whether it is internal security or external security, the blue economic entities, which are engaged in commercial exploitation of the maritime sector or the underwater domain. The third is the environment and the disaster management, which looks at sustainable growth. And the fourth is science and technology. National security apparatus is a key stakeholder of underwater domain awareness framework. External security has prevent an adversary coming into our waters and creating disruptions. Internal security focuses on avoiding disturbance from non-state actors. There are tremendous opportunities in blue economy, be it in shipping industry, deep sea mining, fishing, oil, gas, and many other areas. But first, we need to understand the underwater domain to steer blue economy growth in an effective manner. Increasingly, we've been seeing a lot of disasters originating from the oceans. What is our preparedness to this threat? Environment and disaster management aspect of underwater domain awareness looks at sustainable growth. Science and technology is the driving force behind all aspects of underwater domain awareness. It deals with understanding the ecosystem that exists. Understanding the interaction between components is extremely critical to steer a sustainable growth model. When we look at the Indian Ocean region, the blue economic growth has been really very, very slow. But this also gives us an opportunity now that we can really explore and exploit the resources that are, or the undersea resources that are available to us 
or use the global commons that is the maritime domain for our benefit. So there is tremendous potential, but now when we are taking it forward, we need to be very, very careful to make it sustainable. The tropical littoral waters have some very unique characteristics and equally unique challenges. How do we utilize technology to overcome limitations? How do we utilize the underwater biodiversity to our advantage? How can we overcome the social economic structures and work with other nations? How do we implement effective governance? With better awareness, we can plan our policy structure so that the opportunities underwater give us advantages rather than the challenges overwhelming us. The UDA framework developed by MRC has two main focus. One is pooling of resources and synergizing of efforts by the stakeholders. So the UDA framework that we are focusing on looks at acoustic capacity building in a very, very comprehensive manner so that the governance can be improved. In 2015, India unveiled a strategic vision for the Indian Ocean. Sagar, security and growth for all in the region. The vision emphasizes on the importance of maritime security and maritime cooperation. The Indo-Pacific strategic construct has redefined the importance of underwater domain awareness. Huge opportunities lie ahead in the Indian Ocean region. The underwater domain awareness framework can lead the path to the future.
Hi, Catherine. Can you hear me? Hi, Catherine, can you hear me? Yeah. Am I audible? I just unmuted myself. Am I audible? Yes, yes. You are, Catherine. Like, is it very clear or do I need to change my setup? Uh, no, it's clear. Thank, thank you. Okay. Perfect. I'll share my screen also. Just, uh, you can uh, just check if it's working fine. Yeah. Yes, yes, sure. Okay. Yes, Catherine, I can see the screen. Yeah, but there are just so many things open right now. Let me just. Is there um, yeah, is my screen visible? Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, I think this uh, looks good. We can, I'll, I'll let you know when to start. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Can I try and share my screen? Yes, ma'am. Uh, am I audible perfectly? Yes, yes, you are. Okay. Is my screen visible now? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, can you see the presentation? Yes, yes, I can. Okay. Uh, is the transition all right? Yes, it looks clear. Okay, perfect. Yes. Thanks, Liva. Thank you.
Start. Okay. <coughs> Good afternoon. Welcome back. The last session of day three. Uh, as uh, usual, we have uh, two of our senior research fellows making presentation on their work. First uh, is Catherine, you're ready? Or... Uh, yes, sir. Okay. So uh, I would invite uh, Ms. Catherine to make her presentation. Catherine has been working on, I mean, she's heading the research and publication at uh, uh, MRC. And uh, she's working on multiple projects. Uh, she has been instrumental in a lot of documentation in MRC and some of the work that MRC has done for various other organizations, uh, namely the FIKI task force. She has done a lot of work. Uh, we have, as an organization, you all uh, must be aware or should be aware about the blue economy policy government of India is going to announce. Uh, we were uh, hoping that it will be announced almost six months back, but uh, you know, government procedures take uh, time. And so probably it will be announced after the elections are over. So whenever such a big thing happens, there are also the industry bodies that, you know, come together and uh, work on certain things. So there was a Blue Economy Task Force. I mean, you met uh, Ambassador Mudgal yesterday. Uh, he has been in, in this for the last seven years, since 2015 or 16, I think, Fiki started this uh, Blue Economy Task Force. So I have joined it in the last edition. and uh, But as an organization, we have contributed to that. And that report that we have submitted uh, to Fiki, that was also quoted by the Honorable Finance Minister during the last budget speech. So, Kathleen has been instrumental in contributing significantly to uh, that under uh, Ambassador uh, Mudgal's uh, guidance also. And uh, otherwise also she has been working on various reports that we have been uh, working on. So, Kathleen, uh, uh, today I think you're speaking on the Indus. Uh, yes, sir. Thinking, right? Yeah. So, I'll hand over to you and then I will also, I'll introduce both of them. Uh, uh, we have Divya Rai also, uh, who's with us, and she's uh, specifically working on uh, the climate change. I mean, right now she's working on climate change, but she has also contributed to how UDA can be part of the various multilateral forums, whether it is IORA, BIMSTEC, and even bilateral cooperation between India and various countries. So she has done a reasonable publications on that and a reasonable understanding on that. So after Catherine, I would invite Divya to uh, make her presentation. So over to you, Catherine, first. Um, thank you, sir. I'll share my screen. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. It's an honor for me today to present my work today in front of uh, such esteemed guests. Um, I have been working with uh, MRC for the past couple of years on various topics, as Sir mentioned. And one of the uh, important topics that I uh, that initiated my relationship with MRC was my work on Indus Water Basin. Um, so this is an extrapolation. This is a, a, a development from my initial project where I look at transboundary rivers as a whole, uh, the concept and how underwater domain awareness uh, it, uh, will be instrumental 
in uh, uh, various developments in uh, the management of transboundary rivers. I'll be using the case study of Indus waters, uh, the data that I've collected uh, till now. Uh, broadly, my content for the presentation will include uh, the broad con context of the basin, the history, the socio uh, political history of uh, the basin, etc. And then I'll be talking about the current uh, state of affairs and then uh, and linking the underwater domain awareness to the Indus Basin uh, water management and then to transboundary water management. And finally, the way ahead. So, um, getting uh, getting a look at how transboundary, what are the different factors impacting transboundary river dynamics? There are these couple of things that we need, we 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 can focus on. Um, so, the changes that are happening have the temporal factor, temporal dynamics, the temporal, the time wise changes, the changes in the water quantity, the water quality, etc., uh, based on time, uh, which part of the year we are talking about, etc., what time of the day we are talking about. And then we have the spatial dynamics. So, um, if we have a lot of ethnic variation along the river basin, the river, um, the, the river stream, it's going to impact the uh, quantity, quality, the use, etc., of the river. So the spatial dynamics also matters a lot. And then the ecological dynamics. So it, when, when I say ecological dynamics, I'm talking about the biodiversity, uh, the uh, relationship between nature and the physical environment throughout the uh, river stream. So it changes from one point to the another. So these are the various dynamics that we are talking about and the other external uh, factors that are uh, uh, going to be impacting and also going to get impacted due to these changes are the socio-political factors, um, the economic factors, the hydromorphological factors. So when I talk about economic factors, I, uh, I mean, if we are, uh, we are, uh, we are, uh, in, uh, we are implementing projects for development th that is going to uh, take up uh, water, the, use the water resources, plus the uh, externalities due to the development are also going to impact the river back again. Similarly, the hydromorphological factors. The river stream um, historically is not uh, constant. It keeps shifting. That there are flood events and there are drastic events which keep impacting uh, the, the river systems uh, in, a, in the natural uh, ecosystem. But at the same time, we have various anthropogenic changes to the morphological features. For example, various construction or various other infrastructure projects in the upstream could impact the sediment load in the downstream areas. So such, uh, such factors will ultimately have a lot of impact on the river um, the river uh, system, the river basin. Uh, so these are the various transboundary river dynamics that we need to keep in mind while we are uh, talking about by before we engage with different countries, with the different riparian countries, to actually uh, lead, uh, lead to conversations and discussions that could lead to conflict or either conflict or cooperation. So um, one one such example of um, um, and another important factor is what kind of river are we talking about? So in the picture on the uh, right hand side, um, if you can see, there are four different scenarios of how a river stream can cross from one country to the another. And each of these situations will demand different approaches, uh, different policy approaches, different technology approaches and different uh, capacity uh, building approaches. So in India, uh, the different transboundary rivers that we are talking about um, the with, uh, with a lot of strategic security importance are the Brahmaputra uh, uh, Ganges Basin on the right hand side and um, the Indus Basin system on the left hand side. And there are more than 20, 30 major rivers flowing between these countries. And um, not all of them have uh, proper institutionalized uh, uh, transboundary treaties uh, um, in place. 
coming back to the Indus Basin, um, Indus Basin is shared between four countries. The riparian countries are uh, uh, India, Pakistan, China, and Afghanistan. India shares 39% of the basin, and Pakistan shares 47% of the basin. Indus is actually their main source of uh, water resources. So Pakistan is pretty touchy on the subject of Indus. Um, plus, uh, in, within India, um, Indus Basin is shared between uh, Jammu and Kashmir, Himachal, Punjab, and Rajasthan. Uh, Punjab's uh, irrigation is mostly dependent on the Indus Basin, as all of you know, and Indus Basin in Jammu and Kashmir is responsible or is the uh, potential scope for the hydropower generation, which is uh, equivalent to our uh, country's uh, vision for uh, uh, power sufficiency, hydropower development, etc. So in this uh, particular flowchart, uh, you can witness um, various aspects of the Indus River Basin, Indus River itself. Um, in particular, I would want you to focus on the major challenges that we are facing today, uh, which is the uh, third from the right hand side. So the major challenges today are, um, which is very obvious, the first one, mistrust between India and Pakistan. And in, uh, in this mistrust, we have China's interference and um, various other economic factors that uh, come into play. And plus, we have a lot of interstate issues, even within India, because river, uh, river uh, management, water management is a state subject. So uh, the coordination between our Indian states is also, uh, is also very important to make sure that we, uh, uh, we manage the water properly and efficiently. But which is a major challenge. Uh, Jammu and Kashmir and Pakistan may not look eye to eye on a various on various projects. So that's ground reality. So these are uh, some of the major challenges. And then we have hydropower development. At present, we have uh, more than um, we have around uh, 60, uh, 55 plus percentage of uh, development that's happening, developed and ongoing projects, hydropower projects on the Indus Basin. 45% is still uh, not uh, explored yet. And then groundwater mining. Only about 20% of the irrigated land in Punjab is through uh, the canals. Uh, the rest is through groundwater mining. And these groundwater uh, is also fed through these river channels and Indus Basin. So uh, managing the groundwater also becomes very important. And, the, uh, and various climate change factors, droughts, and... Um, uh, etc. are also uh, something that's plaguing the Indus Basin in India. Um, due to the over utilization or over extraction of water, uh, salinization of agricultural land is a huge uh, problem. Um, uh, the water quality is getting impacted in a lot of areas in Punjab. Um, and there is a lack of integrated water resource management. IWRM. So IWRM basically talks about how we all the water sources need to be integrated. The use of all the water sources needs to be integrated so that the agriculture, industrial, uh, the uh, water required for drinking, for cattle, etc., are uh, are planned properly. And this is something that we are not uh, yet uh, implementing properly on ground, or it's not being um, executed uh, properly. Um, or planned properly. Um, and then we are also facing uh, in the southwestern part of Punjab, there's a lot of seawater ingression. So if the groundwater is of um, is is of very uh, is is not usable and um, and 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 there the uh, canal water doesn't reach. So when so when that doesn't uh, reach, we'll then start talking about how to take the water from other uh, uh, channels, other rivers to uh, to to the places where uh, groundwater is unusable. So if not now, in the future, we definitely face uh, we we will face problems where you know taking water, connecting different channels of rivers, interlinking of rivers. You know when we when when we are not able to manage the water that we have right now, we will be, uh, you know, uh, pushed to, uh, to take steps that are even not more, uh, even more difficult or no, uh, 
which will have more externalities uh, on the env environment. So um, these are challenges which not just have uh, implications for the present time, but they they will um, they 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 are something that will have uh, impact on um, how we manage water for uh, maybe next fifty years or so. Um, we also are faced with low agricultural water use efficiency. Most of the canals in um, uh, Punjab are like 100 years old, uh, 100, 100 plus years old because they were constructed during the British era. And um, these haven't been repaired. So there's a lot of water loss and um, that makes the uh, agricultural water use efficiency uh, uh, low. And then finally, the most um, uh, important challenge um, when we talk about uh, today's scenario is the lack of technological innovation and efficiency. There is um, very um, negligible digital uh, involvement in the way we do things. And um, that's, that's a huge concern. Looking at how um, various other countries, um, uh, for example, our own neighbor, China, um, etc., are uh, you know using technology to make their uh, uh, work efficient and um, and and efficient, and the produce uh, the, the the water security, the food security issues are something that they are you know actively tackling. So uh, now these are the challenges, and coming back to uh, what 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 happened with Indus Basin, like what where are we and how did we come here? So Indus Basin um, is being managed, uh, is, as I already mentioned, is being shared between India, Pakistan, China, and Afghanistan. Um, leaving China and Afghanistan, India and Pakistan have an active uh, Indus Water Treaty, uh, which was signed in 1960. And um, it was signed amidst a uh, huge, um, uh, it, it, a flux like situation. It had a lot of components and a lot of factors happening. Um, 1947, we got independence, and um, at, at that, that was the time where, um, you know, India and Pakistan were trying to find their grounds. They were defining their land boundaries. After the Radcliffe Line, uh, um, uh, the, the line uh, divided the uh, land, but the water was still flowing between both the countries. So that kind of made it, um, you know, that the, the story didn't end with the Radcliffe line. So um, when um, so when the Britishers cre uh, made those uh, irrigation networks, it was basically the headworks were in India, and most of the irrigation uh, network was in Western Punjab, which is now in Pakistan. So um, after the independence, we had a lot of uh, situations where there was a, a, a lack of coordination between Indian engineers and Pakistani engineers, where the supply of water got it, got disrupted for their fields. So that ultimately led to both the countries wanting to have some kind of system where um, you know, their, their uh, agricultural products, their agricultural efficiency doesn't get affected. And this is where uh, World Bank and uh, David E. Lilianthal, an American techno technocrat, got involved. So uh, David um, actually had uh, proposed or published a book on uh, uh, how to divide, uh, how to manage transboundary rivers, and that kind of got World Bank interested and um, uh, they got involved. World Bank was relatively young at this stage, about a decade old, and that made them um, kind of, uh, you know, they wanted, and India and Pakistan being their, uh, you know, important clients, they didn't want both of them fighting over each, uh, fighting uh, uh, all the time on uh, um, about water resource uh, division. So they kind of thought that they should get involved and uh, make sure that, um, both the countries settled this uh, problem peacefully. And it took about 10 years to finally, from 1951 uh, ish to 1960, they kind of, there was a lot of renegotiations and they finally came to the, um, they, they um, came up with the 1960s Indus Water Treaty. So I'll uh, quickly uh, take you through the points of various historical factors. 
the territory and sovereignty as i explained both the countries wanted to define their boundaries they wanted to define their sovereignty and uh, the riparian positioning india is upstream pakistan is downstream so pakistan was always fearing uh, india's um, dominance uh, in controlling the headworks etc and uh, so because most of the water uh, flowing into pakistan is originating in kashmir and tibetan plateau so pakistan definite so pakistan because of this insecurity wanted its claim on kashmir so that made uh, the uh, uh, issue between india and pakistan and the uh, claim on kashmir uh, more contentious uh, and india wanted sovereignty over the eastern rivers so eastern when i talk when i say eastern river this is these are the rivers flowing through haryana punjab area where there is uh, the the uh, fertile flood plains where uh, which is uh, suitable for your paddy cultivation so in terms of food security india wanted a uh, water supply for its uh, haryana punjab area through eastern rivers but eastern river was already uh, was already being used by pakistan so pakistan had a prior appropriation uh, control over or uh, claim over the eastern rivers because the irrigation network for the eastern rivers for uh, pakistan was already there but india wanted uh, the eastern rivers so what india did was it let go of the western rivers which is the shenab jhelum indus rivers which is flowing um, which is flowing uh, into uh, pakistan uh, but uh, yeah, the uh, pakistan didn't have the infrastructure to utilize it so uh, ultimately what happened so pakistan also needed independence from the upstream control from uh, india so a lot of uh, back and forth led to uh, the decision that um, the western rivers will go to pakistan eastern rivers can be used completely by india but the for the for um, uh, for using the western rivers pakistan will be given uh, funds for infrastructure development so tarbela and mangla dams projects were uh, uh, built after uh, this particular uh, treaty and there were also a lot of internal conflicts that india wanted to curb because uh, we were uh, newly independent and um, there was a lot of uh, because we were newly independent and uh, in order to uh, you know um, uh, calm the internal arguments the border between india and pakistan was highlighted even more so that um, the internal conflicts can get subdued and there's a, there's a more there's more unity um when 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 it comes to uh, the different uh, parts of india and um, and the western policy makers were uh, who were the us etc were not involved in this particular treaty but they were definitely discussing about this so that uh, they can get prestige in uh, funding the other uh, projects uh, uh, which will be the outcome of this treaty uh plus they were also fearing cold war they didn't want another cold war between india and pakistan or you know in this part of the world so they were kind of um, worried uh, in that sense so uh, the the indus water treaty was not just um, a, a discussion that was happening here it was being discussed all over and um, donor initiative i mean uh, the um, so when pakistan accepted uh, funds uh, for its development it kind of started uh, losing a part of its sovereignty where it started getting dependent on external funds to get its uh, infrastructure built and um, a lot of influences uh, uh, st uh, started to um, uh, uh, take place and even today pakistan is getting a lot of funds from china for its uh china pakistan economic corridor and that is um and uh, even within 5 years of uh, the project initiation pakistan's one fourth debt was towards china so it was so heavy in debt so pakistan's foreign policy has been a little bit uh, towards um you know the debt culture 
and it's losing its sovereignty um, in, in in that sense. So I'm not going to get into that, but that is something that's happening, and that determines the relationship between India and Pakistan as well. And uh, finally, uh, when David uh, entered the scene, it was basically he had the idea of looking at the basin as a whole and uh, then making uh, the proper equitable division. But the politics of eastern and western rivers and what India wanted, what Pakistan feared, kind of ultimately led to the eastern western river uh, division. So if you see this map, the basin map for Indus uh, River Basin, you can see the best eastern rivers, Ravi, Bias, and Satluj, uh, which uh, India was given. So India was finally given complete um, um, sovereignty over Ravi, Bias, and Satluj. Um, whereas uh, for Indus, Jhelum, and Shana, Pakistan can use uh, all of its water. Uh, and India is supposed to let it go except for uh, its hydropower plants. So run of the river projects were allowed. So run of the river projects was the only like proper technological term that's been used in the treaty uh, because that's the science back then. But today we have had we have had a lot of developments from um, 1960 time and um, there, there, there's no mention of uh, you know flexibility to uh, you know making arrangements for technological innovations etc in the treaty so uh, when we talk about the current state of affairs the major issues in the western rivers include um, you know hydropower generation getting the infrastructure set up to meet the energy needs of the nation flood management sediment management because himalayas are a very young mountain so the sediment management issue is a huge problem uh, salal dam uh, one of the more recent dams got flooded i think after one or uh, two or three seasons uh, uh, sediment uh, it got sedimented so these are uh, serious concerns uh, very expensive concerns so these are uh, some of the issues in western rivers and also Pakistan's continual objections and contradictions to uh, interpretation of the treaty. So we've had about uh, three, four uh, major conflicts, about three uh, major conflicts between India and Pakistan raised through the Indus Water Treaty on the construction of hydropower plants in um, on the Western rivers. And these have actually stalled a lot of projects. We have modified a lot of projects to meet uh, Pakistan's concerns. And um, so that's one of the huge hurdles in our hydropower development. And then we have cross-border terrorism. Uh, so this is self-explanatory how terrorism is a huge issue between India and Pakistan. But now, um, and uh, yeah, um, it's Pakistan's economic, um, um, economic, um, issues have cropped up and uh, um, but they, they still might be getting a lot of instigation to uh, to to raise conflicts against um, India. And the major issues in um, eastern rivers include uh, so all the waters available uh, to India is allocated between Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan, Jammu and Kashmir and Delhi. Uh, the canal systems are very old around 200 years old. So uh, they suffer from silting and uh, water loss. Um, the agriculture itself is very inefficient. The, there's a need for value addition and far income, uh, farm income increase. The water and soil quality management is a huge issue. And there's a, uh, there's a lot of uh, water stress. Uh, out of um, some 123 blocks in Punjab, 105 are uh, overstressed uh, in terms of groundwater uh, management. Uh, in the Indus Water Treaty, uh, as I mentioned for hydropower, uh, uh, hydropower projects, uh, we face a lot of uh, um, hurdles from Pakistan. Um, so in the treaty itself, we've had like uh, we've, we've we've been given a conflict resolution mechanism. So according to that. 
um, both the countries are supposed to uh, form a permanent industry commission with an industry commissioner on both the sides. And the first uh, line of um, management, conflict management, is through the PICs. And if that doesn't solve the issue, a neutral expert is invited or a court of arbitration is um, called. So usually in the treaty itself, it's been given in this three tier uh, system where PIC, then a neutral expert, and then a court of arbitration. Um, but we've had, uh, so recently there's been a lot of um, uh, different uh, uh, issues with respect to conflict resolution mechanisms where India has taken a stand to amend the treaty itself because there's some. Uh, there are a lot of loopholes in how things are uh, written in the treaty and also there is a lot of misinterpretation, different interpretations of the same uh, treaty. Uh, but the treaty on, uh, itself has stood the uh, test of time uh, for about 64 years now. We've had this treaty and uh, even though India and Pakistan have had uh, some two major wars and a lot of uh, military standoffs, we've still managed to not, uh, you know, uh, change the treaty itself or, you know, abrogate the treaty. Usually when the upstream country is a little bit stronger, the treaty tends to not get, uh, uh, you know, faulted or um, uh, not get impacted. And that's the case here as well, because India being a more uh, uh, economically uh, stronger country, uh, the treaty has stood the test of time. Um, but at the same time, uh, Pakistan has been very conscious and uh, has been trying to uh, create different types of hurdles uh, by using the attendance of the treaty itself. One of the important um, conflicts that have ar arisen, and this will showcase how, uh, what I mean by how Pakistan has been trying to create her. Uh, uh, not create hurdles itself, but raise objections to um, um, because of its own insecurities, because of its own um, uh, uh, because of the distrust between both the countries. So, uh, Kishan Ganga project uh, on Jhelum River has been was envisioned by uh, India back in 2010 or so, and um, and that led, so according to this project, on a, a, a small diversion from the Kishanganga River through KHEP tunnel is envisioned, and uh, that will go to the Wular Lake and then back to the Jhelum River. Um, so when India proposed this project, uh, so India is supposed to send the project details to Pakistan before implementing. So that's also one of the tenets of the Indus Water Treaty. So when it did, uh, Pakistan raised objection that its own project uh, uh, Neelam Jhelum uh, hydropower uh, plant, which also um, works on the similar principle where they are also creating a diversion through a tunnel and then uh, taking it to a power plant and then um, leading it back to the Jhelum River. So, uh, so the uh, problem arose when they started to say that, no, we, uh, uh, your project will uh, impact our project and um, when, uh, and but now both uh, both of them are claiming that the project uh, was something that they envisioned first. That's also one of the claims. So um, what the treaty actually says is that you can develop a run of the river project. That's what's written, and you can also develop projects in such a way that it doesn't impact the existing use uh, in in the uh, other country. So um, when the court of arbitration was called upon this particular problem and um, the seven member court of arbitration set up by the World Bank um, uh, looked at all the details, they, um, uh, the, the, their verdict uh, was that uh, the treaty uh, talks about only existing uses. So the future uses will not be counted. So that was one of the... Um, main uh, um, uh, main um, main points of the verdict and um, also the treaty uh, in because indus water treaty doesn't talk about environmental flow the minimum flow that is supposed to go through the river uh, so that the ecology of the river is not impacted 
So Pakistan raised that objection. So a, a minimum environmental flow was also determined in the uh, court of arbitration verdict. And another, uh, so this was uh, partially uh, in India's favor. And another uh, important uh, issue that uh, Pakistan raised in uh, this particular um, Kishan Ganga project is that um, drawdown flushing. So this is a system uh, installed in the um, in the in the in the dams, so that uh, it doesn't get sediment. Uh, the sedimentation problem doesn't uh, impact the functioning of the dam. So Pakistan's concern was that this drawdown facility will provide India with manipulable storage of water. So on India's whim, if they want to just uh, release all the water, uh, it might flood Pakistan. And if they, uh, you know, uh, withhold the water, it, it will lead to drought like conditions in Pakistan. So this concern was raised uh, at the court of arbitration and court of arbitration actually um, agreed with Pakistan's interpretation and um, restricted India's ability, uh, uh, the limits on life storage and the drawdown flushing system. So, um, so this was a partial uh, win loss situation for India. But ultimately, this uh, this this case study actually proves that there's a lot of um, uh, 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 misinterpretations, double interpretations of the same uh, treaty. Um, so the treaty, uh, because it was uh, uh, written some 60, uh, four years back, uh, it needs a revision. So what India did ultimately in 2023 January is that it sent a notice to Pakistan uh, to amend the treaty. Uh, so this was uh, also uh, based on the Article 12 of the treaty. So Article 12 actually gives you the provision that if both the countries uh, mutually agree to amend uh, the treaty, it can be uh, uh, amended. Uh, the treaty doesn't give any option to um, uh, withdraw from the treaty, abrogate the treaty individually. So that uh, the treaty uh, doesn't give any provision as such. So India had to like give a, send out a notice um, uh, after uh, a lot of deliberation uh, for amending the treaty. And one of the key triggers was the Rattle project. So Rattle project was similar to another Bagliha project on Indus, which uh, had similar concerns with Pakistan regarding its height and um, uh, drawdown flushing, uh, flushing uh, issues, etc. So Pakistan had uh, then asked uh, World Bank to appoint a court of arbitration. But India wanted the neutral expert first. But so what um, World Bank did was it it created a, it it appointed a neutral expert plus it appointed a court of arbitration so that both the processes can happen simultaneously. Pakistan was on board, but India didn't like the um, like the idea. It it felt um, India uh, India's uh, voice was that it's it's kind of illegal to have both the opinions. I mean, both the processes happening happening simultaneously, because the treaty doesn't have like a, a proper. Uh, it, it doesn't give you a proper idea on how to go about things. So this particular situation arose, and uh, the interpretations were uh, uh, hugely misguided. Um, and um, so, um, uh, when the court of arbitration actually uh, gave the verdict, India rejected it um, uh, straight away. So that is kind of the uh, inter uh, the Indus Water Treaty's loopholes. And on the other hand, we have another huge uh, problem, uh, which is the data. Um, so here, as you can see, uh, between the different riparian countries, uh, based on various literature uh, review, um, I have uh, written the, for the same uh, 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 flow, for example, from China to India, how much water are we getting? From India to Pakistan, how much water is going uh, through Western rivers through Eastern rivers? So we have multiple uh, numbers for the same um, factor. So we don't have like proper idea about uh, how much is uh, how much our inflow is, how much our outflow is. And this is basically because of the lack of our uh, data collection system. So now. Um, in transboundary rivers, um, how does 
underwater domain awareness come into the picture. So according to underwater domain awareness framework, we are looking at uh, the uh, processes happening underwater and uh, determining these uh, stressors, the various um, the impact that various anthropogenic activities are having on the uh, water body, water systems um, through remotely uh, sense, uh, remotely sensing uh, infrastructure, non-invasive infrastructure, uh, which requires minimal infrastructure and allows a large quantity of data collection in a short amount of time. So this provides for a continuous spatial information and temporal uh, information of high resolution. And these parameters reveal a lot of external pressures such as intensive fishing, eutrophication, climate change, etc. So apart from the previously discussed um, uh, regional scenario, we are also now uh, we also require a lot of information on what is happening within our own Indus rivers. Um, and the treaty definitely doesn't have any place for. Um, for, uh, for technological innovation or responsibility and accountability. So if our, the water quality from India to Pakistan is being affected, but uh, Pakistan doesn't, uh, cannot have any kind of uh, um, claim or, you know, uh, uh, against India saying um, the water quality wasn't good or within it's India itself from one state to the another. We, we don't have any kind of accountability or ecosystem services concept where uh, we have the uh, responsibility to preserve the water quality and the uh, water quantity, the minimum, uh, the uh, optimum quantity that is required so that the river ecology isn't disturbed. So these are uh, there are a lot of concerns when we talk about the uh, underwater domain which will impact both our own country plus the other riparian countries. Um, so, uh, when, uh, so underwater domain awareness kind of provides that opportunity to uh, create a system which is um, uh, not very cost uh, uh, intensive, which has the deep GPS integration, which allows easy integration of data. And there are a lot of various systems and there are a lot of case studies that are already available on hydroacoustics, river listening, passive acoustic monitoring, acoustic Doppler current profilers. So these are various different modeling systems that are uh, available um, for uh, making sure that we understand our underwater uh, systems and uh, ultimately uh, take our decisions appropriately. So the, uh, the applications for all of these technologies include uh, uh, understanding the presence of fishes, monitoring the presence of fishes, uh, bed load monitoring. It's not be sorry, it's bed load monitoring. So bed load uh, is a very important concept uh, when, it, when we talk about the river systems. And uh, so bed load monitoring is also possible through acoustic capacity and capabilities. Uh, the river velocity, etc., can also be efficiently monitored with uh, a lot of heavy, expensive systems. Also, the river isn't homogeneous uh, because of its heterogeneous nature. We need to understand the uh, uh, whatever we are talking about. If you want to study the uh, pollution uh, uh, inside the river, or uh, if you want to uh, study underwater drones or what uh, the other uh, systems that we are talking about. Uh, in terms of strategic security, etc., a source path receiver model is required. So the source um, and the path. So how the path, the heterogeneous system that the uh, so uh, the acoustic signal is traveling from, uh, needs to be understood uh, and how it is being affected by the path and how it's being received. So uh, this is required so that we can efficiently use the acoustic capacities that we develop. So basically, uh, so transboundary rivers through underwater domain awareness, uh, we'll understand, we'll, we'll actually get like a proper lens to view the system, not just above water what is happening, but also under the water. So uh, the various challenges of the existing systems in the transboundary is that it's very invasive, expensive, um, we don't have real or near-time monitor, uh, near monitoring of the data. 
And there's a there's a lack of study of the transboundary dynamics. So my initial slides where I talk about the various dynamics that are that's happening. So we we don't have enough knowledge on uh, how interrelated all of these are. And also once uh, we have underwater domain awareness uh, being implemented, we also uh, need a lot of field protocols, data reduction tools and various settings and configurations for different riverine sites. River isn't homogenous. River has various uh, uh, various portions, various um, uh, dynamic sites which need to be uh, catered to. And also finally, when we talk about uh, uh, um, transboundary rivers, consensus between riparian countries also needs to be developed. So the final opportunity that we see here is to to see, to understand, to share, um, where uh, to see is uh, getting the data through uh, the various capacities and capabilities, acoustic capacities and capabilities that we are trying to build, and then to understand the data that we have, and then to share it uh, in a way that uh, we utilize it for various policy purposes, we use it for capacity and capability building, etc. Uh, the policy interventions should focus. So finally, uh, when we talk about the policy goals, um, we have to understand the consequences of socio-political goals uh, on environment. So um, as history um, teaches us, um, the um, the social, uh, the political goal of getting the rivers, um, getting our own development objectives uh, uh, um, you know, uh, fulfilled has had led to the eastern and western rivers division. So similarly, in our today's scenario, also a lot of socio political uh, aspects are happening on very minute scale to uh, national, regional, and geopolitical scale, uh, global scale. So all of these uh, uh, goals and aspects and agendas need to be understood properly and. Um, the consequences on the environment because climate change is a huge factor right now and um, that needs to be understood before any policy intervention is um, uh, 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 proposed. And then uh, the securities that we are addressing here are the food security, the energy security and strategic security. Indus and Brahmaputra Basin are a huge um, a uh, uh, huge um, opportunity to make sure that our food security, energy and strategic security uh, aspects are uh, put in place properly. Collaboration between riparian countries and also other regional neighboring countries for technology transactions and capacity building is something that our policies should actively look at uh, to build a rapport between uh, different uh, neighboring countries. Digital intervention. Um, so all of the technology that we're talking about is a part of the digital intervention and policies uh, have already started to uh, take up this buzz term, buzzword digital intervention, digital transformation, but these need to be understood properly and implemented after proper modeling and after proper um, deliberation. And then their, their integration with marine spatial planning plans should also be discussed because uh, for example, China is uh, 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 China is funding uh, deep ports in Pakistan so that it can um, uh, uh, leave the Strait of Mal Ma Malka and uh, you know uh, 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 use uh, the uh, use that particular port and which will definitely circumvent India and that will uh, lead to uh, a lot of security issues. And when we, uh, so that, that comes in a marine spatial plan. So when we talk about uh, uh, oceans and rivers separately, a lot of strategy gaps start to arise. So uh, uh, looking at the oceans and the transboundary rivers and the other river systems that are, you know, uh, uh, have strategic importance need, needs to be looked, uh, looked at together at some point. And then um, uh, China's interference needs to be studied. There's a lot of work happening already on how China's, um, you know, debt uh, policy, uh, giving funds to giving uh, loans to different countries, and you know, uh, uh, the debt colonization that it's doing uh, around the world needs to be kept in check. 
and uh, of course under um, uh, the today's uh, india's foreign policy is all about india um, emerging as a regional leader in terms of various policies such as our um, solar alliance um, uh, etc so uh, this is a huge opportunity for india also as to uh, to uh, to emerge as a regional leader uh, when we talk about transboundary river management so uh, the in way ahead these are the major uh, some of the major uh, points that um, um, you know underwater domain awareness and transboundary management will look at water quality management climate resilience food and energy security keeping up with the technological innovations flood and sediment management so this is like a summary of uh, most of my presentation farm practices and income management acknowledging their ecosystem services and marine spatial planning um so um just to re, uh, to to uh, recap uh, to uh, conclude my presentation i would like to just um, flash the underwater domain awareness framework um, uh, where we talk about the four important pillars which is digital transformation strategic security blue economy and sustainable in climate change and um, the to see to uh, understand and to share is uh, written through sensing analysis and regulation and finally acoustic capacity and capability building is what we are looking at so that um, we understand our uh, underwater systems uh, uh, much better so that we, our policy de decisions are sound uh, with this i would like to conclude my presentation i am um, um, happy to take our questions thank you katrin any questions sir anybody Okay, thank you, Kathleen. We'll move to the next presentation. Divya, you. you may kindly take over. Thank you, sir. Um, also, can you see my presentation? Uh, yes. Thank you so. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, Namaskar. Uh, it's a great honor for me to present in such August gathering. I want to take this opportunity and thank uh, Commander Arnab Das for uh, giving me this platform or uh, for actually believing that I can give a presentation amongst uh, such great uh, strategic thinkers. Uh, my name is Divya Rai and I'm a research fellow at the Maritime Research Center and the broad topic uh, title of my presentation is Underwater Domain Awareness for Climate Resilience in Coastal Regions where I'll take up the case study of uh, Bay of Bengal region and the eastern coast of India. So this presentation basically highlights what is the importance of underwater domain awareness in uh, addressing the challenges which are posed by the climate change in uh, specifically in the coastal region and how enhancing the UDA capabilities can help us uh, uh, can help the coastal states build resilience against the climate impacts. So the content of my presentation, I've divided it into three sections. The section A will deal with what are the impacts of climate change. The section B will be will take an assessment of the climate risk, uh, basically analyzing the case of Bay of Bengal region and also uh, understanding the um, peculiarity with respect to and vulnerability of the eastern coast of India. And uh, the section C will take up the way forward and the, what is the UDA approach that we need to adopt. So we'll begin the presentation, climate change and its impact. So I need not preach the converted, uh, definitely. So the IPC, according to IPCC, uh, the definition of climate change is a change in state of climate uh, that can be identified by changes in mean or the variability of its properties that resist for an extended period, typically decade or longer. So uh, from uh, understanding the climate uh, change is from poles to tropic, climate change is definitely disturbing our ecosystem. Even a slight shift in temperature can also cause a dramatic change that ripples uh, through food webs and the environment. And the effects of climate change are mostly apparent in the coldest regions such as the South Poles and the North Pole. Uh, the example of Arctic is uh, the Arctic is heating, uh, heating up twice as fast as uh, anywhere else on the planet, which can lead to rapid melting of glaciers and polar ice sheets where massive amount of water is stored. 
so as ice melt the darker ocean waters that absorbs more sunlight exposed and uh, which will create a positive feedback loop that speed ups the melting process so we can say that in about 15 years the arctic could be ice free in the summers and uh, uh, so the definite according to the climate change the impacts are very much visible and a lot of people uh, a lot of thinkers or the uh, researchers still uh, questions the fact whether the climate change is even real or not so the swiftly warming of a uh, climate planet uh, is an existential threat to all forms of life so we understood why climate change is uh, the understood the definition of climate change and uh, we understood how the climate change is happening and how it is impacting starting from the polar uh, poles and it is going to impact the tropical waters as well so it not only affects the environment weather but it also affects the agriculture and the human the socio economic impacts of climate change is as wide as the uh, environment and weather so climate change has significantly uh, affected our oceans like uh, in a way like the sea uh, sea level rise the temperature increase the ocean acidification the uh, impacts on marine life will have an impact on the uh, socio economic uh, culture of that particular coastal region or that particular region which is in that uh, which is at very much at the verge or very much at the forefront of the facing the impacts of climate change so a slight change in the ocean acidity and oxygen level can significantly impact the marine life for example warmer waters can lead to die off of planktons at the base of food chain which will affect the entire ecosystem and the acidification can disrupt the ability of many marine uh, animals to adapt according to the situation so all these processes are inter uh, they all interact in complex ways and are very much interlinked interlinked with these uh, with each other therefore it can have a far reaching implication uh, on the marine lives and the ecosystem so to understand <clears throat> the region these are the impacts of uh, climate change on the ocean i am not going uh, beyond ocean i'm just focusing on the marine maritime uh, 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 impacts of the climate change so uh, but every region is very different in terms of geography and has very different sets of challenges so therefore before we adapt uh, the climate strategies the mitigating strategies we need to also assess the region so assessing the region is important because to determine what your region and local authority needs to adopt Uh, in order to tackle the climate change you need to analyze what are the vulnerabilities major vulnerabilities to the, uh, that particular region and how climate change will affect the people sectors as well as the system so to determine what your regional local authority needs uh, the climate risk basically uh, as cc 2018 this figure is taken from there so as per ipcc the climate risk basically depends on three factors one is hazards vulnerability and exposure so climate hazard climate related hazards means the current uh, climate conditions and how they will change in the future and these conditions are very much likely to determine uh, an area of uh, that is being affected by the extreme weather events such as heat waves slow onsets of monsoons then sea level rise uh, while the vulnerability part uh, is can be defined as the tendency of an exposed system and its components to be adversely affected uh, basically it uh, uh, it be, uh, it vulnerability is a, a product of a sensitivity adaptive capa uh, capacity so uh, sensitivity as in the degree to which a system or a species that is very much likely to get affected or either adversely or beneficially impacted by the climate change and the adaptive capability the adaptive capability of people sector to adjust according to the potential damage to take advantage of the opportunities these all things uh, basically comes and uh, the components of vulnerability while the last uh, pillar exposure the uh, can be defined as the presence of people livelihood infrastructure assets or species or ecosystem in that place that could uh, adversely be affected by the impacts of climate change for example the exposure of vulnerable population to the heat 
or the expansion of residential and economic areas in the flood plain so depend uh, based on all these three pillars we assess the region what are the climate risk particularly to that region so uh, that so that we can uh, so that the planning of adaptation uh, in that region and the local authorities requires understanding of these three uh, pillars and the mitigating strategies will be very effective in terms of because we already know the vulnerabilities of that particular region so the adaptive mitigating strategies will be more comprehensive and more uh, specifically targeted targeted so the case of bay of bengal region so at mrc while analyzing these risks so i undertook the uh, case of strategic water body which is the bay of bengal region as we all know that uh, prime minister modi in uh, his speech uh, mentioned about the sagar and sagar uh, about the uh, security and growth for all in the region and its uh, india's focus on the indian ocean region and bay of bengal uh, region forms a very prominent part of that uh, uh, vision sagar vision so bay of bengal region is definitely as the extremely vulnerable to uh, climate change the bay of bengal region which comprises countries like bangladesh india myanmar thailand um, and has historically faced numerous cyclones so their risk to climate change is very high you must have already seen in the news from past couple of years that the amount of increase in the uh, cyclones that has happening in the bay of bengal region has significantly increased which shows that the climate change uh, and the cyclone formation definitely depends on the warm water so the climate change the warming of ocean is impacting the adverse uh, adverse uh, events uh, such as cyclones typhoons in other countries so the cyclones are definitely an uh, impacts or the uh, 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 or one of the cause uh, one of the leading impacts of the climate change so uh, the four state which are very much likely at the very high risk of uh, global temp increasing global temperature are india myanmar thailand and bangladesh and some of the specific concerns related to climate change in the region also includes the increased frequency and intensity of cyclone as i mentioned which will lead to more displacement and destruction for instance cyclone moka which caused a heavy damage uh, to lives and properties in bangladesh and myanmar and earlier to which uh, cyclone amphan fani yas etc also caused a lot of damage to these countries so the critical naval infrastructure which are existing which exists in this region are very much at the risk of climate change and due to large number of cyclones which hits the coast uh, of bay of bengal region uh, this uh, region is also titled also titles as uh, cyclones which cause around 80% cyclone related deaths and uh, the next uh, biggest cause of concern is rising sea level which threatens the coastal cities like bangkok uh, which can be under water by uh, as early as 2050 and vulnerability is particularly high uh, along the shores of major rivers <clears throat> for example in uh, i'll give you an example of bangladesh in the coastal south and southeast chittagong district the northern siliet district which uh, with, which has impoverished communities living over there the sandbars are facing the risk of seasonal floods and sea level rise could harm the environment, environment as well as the encroaching sea water which can both erode the coastal ecosystem and also invades the fresh water inland aquifers which uh, we rely on for agriculture and drinking water uh, then also the salt water incursion is already reshaping the life in nations like uh, bangladesh where one quarter of the land lies uh, it lies in 7 feet above the sea level so the frequent adverse events uh, warming of temp uh, warming of oceans are very much likely going to impacts these countries so uh, the major cities uh, i'll go into more specific uh, more specific impacts to the major cities so the major cities like kolkata and chennai are at the major risk of climate change so climate induced hazards uh, uh, which will lead to conflict over resources 
uh, land political representations are uh, one of the biggest problem bangladesh and climate change are likely to increase these issues and potential of climate related migration you a uh, climate induced migration is one of the biggest threat that uh, the countries in the bay of bengal region will face in the future because uh, the uh, climate related uh, climate induced migration will also have an impact on the security aspects uh, of that particular country uh, with respect to india with respect to india the security threats in the region uh, are very high we have already seen the issue that was taken up by uh, when the migration of rohingyas was discussed so security in the region is an uh, security in the bay of bengal region is very prominent for india specifically for its uh, uh, harmony and harmony in the neighborhood is one of the major uh, major vision of india which is the neighbor uh, neighborhood policy so the climate threats are uh, in going to uh, intensify regional interstate military competition and conflicts in the future climate induced migration and land loss will uh, intensify uh, which will lead to major river conflict uh, major river conflicts also in the future and climate change will also have an effect on the overall resilience of the displaced community the displaced community will uh, also be faced with the less resources the uh, get, uh, the poor living standards or poor living condition of those people will also have an impact on the regional social economic uh, uh, impacts it will have an social economic impacts on that particular region and the strategic assets in the bay of bengal region are definitely vulnerable to the climate threats so with respect to india the coastal states such as andhra pradesh um, then uh, Andhra Pradesh, Odisha, Tamil Nadu, and uh, north north east states, uh, West Bengal, Assam, Bihar, Manipur are very much susceptible to the climate driven changes. India, being the largest country in the Bay of Bengal region, which encompasses wide variety of climate, ethno geographic backgrounds, and economic landscape. and uh, has one of the biggest contribution to the uh, uh, development of the bay of bengal region is uh, and also if you look at the one uh, the population contribution of india is also very high not just in the terms of population contribution the economic contribution of india is also very significantly high from the other countries in the region but india faces multiple risk due to the climate change which includes droughts floods intense rainfall cyclones uh, and sea level rise so in efficient and also the inefficient disaster preparedness in india has also led to significant vulnerability to these weather events uh, as it was seen in uh, cyclone amphan in 2015 which uh, resulted in wide uh, spread destruction and displacement uh, moreover the presence of a large number of internally displaced person or, or idp uh, idps are possible or the possibility of cross border migration from bangladesh adds complexities to the situation uh, for example uh, kolkata is very much uh, kolkata is at the high risk of coastal hazards such as the coastal storms rising sea level erosion, uh, erosion that pose serious danger to the physical economical and social uh, social system of that coastal communities uh, you can see the vulnerability the uh, red area marked in the map is shows the amount of water that will be under water by 2050 and these are these figures shows the eastern coast of india mainly uh, ex Uh, the coal uh, the west bengal region is there very much at the uh, top of the figure you can see the vulnerability that it has with respect to the rising sea level and which will have an impact on its port infrastructure or the critical infrastructure that exist in visakhapatnam with respect to the eastern seaboard of uh, india uh, of the indian navy then uh, vulnerability of eastern coast to the global warming uh, is very high uh, as i uh, as you can already see so what are the solutions that we can look at uh, so which the solution mainly talked about in very various multi, uh, various forums and various multi uh, by various researchers are optimum utilization of resources 
we should uh, uh, go for less carbon footprints which and leading from the front india can be the uh, act as a uh, voice of global south which uh, and then learning from one other one country adapting to particular uh, climate race uh, climate threats can be something that india and the other countries in the region can adopt and the bimstec is the only construct that exists in the region so uh, co in cooperation on the, on the climate change on the bimstec is something that we all countries can achieve but uh, the biggest and the main question that arises is how do we achieve these solutions we need to break down into specificity if we want to achieve these uh, uh, if, if we want to achieve more um, mitigating strategies particularly related to that area so the optimum utilization and everything we need to have more specific understanding of the underwater domain so the way forward in my presentation would be the underwater domain awareness the underwater domain awareness framework which is proposed by the maritime research center exactly aims to address the need for policy and technology intervention to improve the understanding and management of the underwater environments uh, so the climate change presents numerous challenges uh add to the coastal regions and which and enhancing uda capabilities can help understand the coastal states and build uh, resilience against these impacts the underwater domain uh, uh the framework is crucial in uh, the face of increasing risk from natural disasters specifically the climate change which makes the uda capabilities essential for ensuring sustainable developments so uda plays an important and integral part uh, in understanding and preserving the marine ecosystem uh, and particularly in coastal regions like bay of bengal region uh, so but uh, and these are the some of the uh, these are some of the points that uh, through which we can achieve underwater domain or understanding of underwater domain uh, underwater ecosystem which will help us in uh, mitigating the climate change impacts monitoring uh, vulnerable species and ecosystem uda enables tracking of migratory patterns which identifies uh, endangered species which assess the health of coral reefs so uh, assessing the health of coral reefs the migration migratory patterns of the fish will help the fishery community in uh, understanding the fishing pattern or the fishing areas the uh, what are the areas that are more likely to be affected by the impacts of climate change so the uh, socio economic impacts is also catered for under the uda so disaster preparedness and early warning system is something that uh, uda provides uh, the contribution uda contributes to minimizing the impacts uh, of the devastating natural uh, disasters for mainly because of the timely warning and its targeted response so once you have a targeted response and if you have an early warning system already available with the country the preparedness for disaster is much more efficient and much more uh, comprehensive then resource management the uda which supports sustainable practices exploration and regulation uh helps in maintaining a marine uh, uh habitats so marine uh, resource management in marine habitats is something because of the coastal communities which are heavily reliant on the fishing uh, and uh, aquaculture for their sustainability resource management becomes an integral part of uda capabilities then technology advances the artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms will help us analyze vast amount of data uh provide an actionable insights into the marine ecosystem dynamics so uh, artificial intelligence artificial intelligence and uh, marine, machine learning will enable will enable the experts to identify and mon monitor the vulnerable species which will help tracking the migratory patterns then it will also assess the health of the coral reef as well as provide an early warning uh, for the natural disasters then the last uh, second last is capability uh, capacity building and adaptive strategies investment in uda capacity capabilities is necessary for the coastal systems to remain competitive and uh, adaptive in face of climate change because the pace of climate change is also increasing we also need to be more uh, fast pace in our approach so uda capabilities will help us uh, in uh, achieving that pace uh, because of the competitive nature and the uh, impacts of climate change already range uh, expanding at an exponential rate
so the uda framework which encompasses various aspects also includes offering pre uh, precise inputs on resource availabilities for effective exploitation i used effective exploitation because uh, uh, effective exploitation is something that the uda proposes and uda uh, the underwater domain awareness actually advocates for then enhancing understanding of the habitat degradation species vulnerabilities which are caused by human activities as well as by the natural uh, phenomena so understanding them will help us in better understanding the ecosystem the underwater ecosystem is if better understood the uh, so coastal areas are catered for their socio economic impacts is very limited and then focusing on acoustic cap uh, capacity and capability building as is actually the core requirement for the effective uda implementation the last one the international partnerships so international partnership is uh, uh, something that we all need to uh, together push collectively push for international part understanding the underwater domain awareness is something that we need to advocate at multiple forums the small island developing states which whose voices are not very heard uh, can uh, can actually be uh, uda can actually represent them uda is something that that's big, that's one of their biggest advantage if uh, the uda capabilities are provided to those small island developing states in the western indian ocean regions or in the pacific islands where uda can help us uh, can help them, those countries in adapting to the climate change very effectively and so therefore international partnership and advocating underwater domain awareness at an international uh, forums will help us in uh, getting our acts together and also collectively uh, acting towards the impacts of climate change and uh, with respect to the underwater uh, with respect to the bay of bengal region the collaborative efforts among the nations under iora bimstec will strengthen our maritime security which will promote sustainable uh, usage of resources which will also help us in effective response to the natural disasters and also will be able to understand what are the best practices practices being adopted by the western countries the more developed countries which can be replicated in the smaller countries or the small island developing states so in conclusion uh, these innovations are specifically beneficial because they allow faster cheaper and more accurate data collection compared to the traditional methods so the collaborative initiative can also leverage the strength of each participating countries uh, and which will create a more holistic and robust approach in maritime issues as i mentioned uh, organizations like iora and bimstec can play a very vital role in facilitating communication coordination and joint pro projects aimed at enhancing the uda capabilities through the region so uda offers very promising solutions to a complex problems associated with the marine ecosystem and coastal communities uh, it represents strategic opportunities for international cooperation that will not only benefits the individual country but it will also enhance our global efforts towards sustainability and uh, a resilient future with that i have come to the end of my presentation thank you for your attention i'd be very happy to take any questions thank you divya there's a question i ah, okay this is fine much uh good afternoon uh yeah sir sir is audible i'm audible uh, so your voice is not uh, very clear yeah, it's very uh, distorted okay okay basically my concern is uh, about the uh, in a public good basically and uh, environment basis and it is totally focused on the uh, you know what map you have shown that red okay, by 2050 yes this sir. portion and i am only concerned the the odisha and west bengal part not the myanmar and bangladesh and mm -hmm. as of now uh obviously that map red map what you have shown 2050 must have been made on the basis of some data or some uh, studies must have been done over a period of time 
तो माय कंसर्न इज कि इज देर एनी स्टडी हैज बिन डन ऑन द एनुअल बेसिस के दिस ईयर दिस पोर्शन विल गो अंडर वाटर ड्यू टू रेज नेक्स्ट ईयर दिस पोर्शन दिस पोर्शन विल गो अंडर वाटर एंड दिस पोर्शन एंड दैट इज ट्रू ऑल्सो हाउ मच एग्रीकल्चर लैंड विल गो इन दैट how much the forest so the because it is a very sensitive we should not forget here this whole area is maximum is the sundarban region which yes, which is very uh, environmentally sen sensitive yes why i am asking question is this because this will help the government to plan the rehabilitation for the affected people annual basis because in 2050 we cannot think of okay, where to displace all these people annually basis we can this year if you know that this people will go this agriculture will land get damaged these many people will affect government concerned government or government of india can plan for their rehabilitation mm. secondly those many our forest sundarban forest will go under the water we can have the alternate growing of forest somewhere equivalent to them so that our environment is protected that is why some study or some thing has been done on it agriculture land forest land air wise population affected because this will have the government for the rehabilitation or reforestation thank you um uh, sir as of now uh, from the data that i have got uh, uh, or i've understood there are no major studies that are being conducted uh, on daily or yearly basis to analyze the impacts of climate change there are multiple think tanks and there are research on an individual basis who are analyzing these data specifically from the ipcc uh, reports or what are their predictions as per at the moment the six assessment report based on those uh, assessments they have predicted that this these areas might be underwater but as of in india or in india or even globally the regions are, uh, the impacts are not an analyzed or studied uh, on an year basis or even on monthly basis and i completely understood your point that we need to have uh, these datas available with us for more proactive government policies intervention in those regions uh but i i don't think that there are any regions uh, there are any data available but that's something that uh, mrc can definitely push for the mrc mrc can uh, definitely look at uh, uh, developing reports which can help us analyze which area will be underwater will be, uh, because of the impacts of climate change and that's something that uh, sir and i have been discussing a lot that we need to come up with more major policy intervention with respect to the climate change so that's something that uh, sir and i can consider later on uh, to uh, think about and creating a report and analyzing the impacts on the coastal region specifically on the eastern coast of india thank you divya i just want to add to it's a very good question what you asked <clears throat> but there is very uh, another dimension to this typically most of these studies that are done are done by certain western consulting firms or western think tanks and the purpose is very dubious see they come up with some of their you know ideas and they try to create a bit of panic i am not trying to completely reject some of these reports but by and large it has been found that some of, most of these reports are based on certain agendas now if the government of, you rightly brought out if the government of india or any government national government or <laughs> if they have to take action uh, typically the in india what i know i mean i am part of two three such task forces so government sets up its own internal uh, system which is which consists of certain experts maybe like us but also it has to have certain government bodies into it because government of india has certain mandates i mean uh, the organizations under the government has certain mandates like even bsf is one organization like in case of water uh, if it is fresh water then central water commission is one but there are various organizations under the government csr labs are there there are research organization there are organizations we have to, which have to implement on the ground and in fact what we heard from uh, senior bso officers also is that they are also uh, being uh, you know asked to kind of monitor what's happening so 
IPCC is one organization where a lot of Indian experts are also part of it and government of India also has given recognition to it. So IPCC is also working and they also come up with a lot of reports. But precise data is not available. And that's precisely what we are discussing. I mean, even Dr. Ajay Kumar also uh, mentioned his concern about, you know, precise data not being available. So a lot of prediction, uh, it is very difficult to establish how authentic they are. And a lot of these reports keep coming out uh, every now and then, all the consulting firms, all the big fours, you know, you know, whether it's Deloitte or all that. I mean, I don't want to name or tarnish anybody. They do keep uh, producing a lot of reports. And if, in, if you follow World Economic Forum, uh, they discuss. I mean, that's where all the heads of states come. But even the reports based on which that discussion happens, sometimes some of us feel that they are really not uh, completely, you know, uh, authenticated or validated on the ground. So that's all I can say. But yes, I mean, uh, as Divya mentioned, that as the concern is getting very, very serious, I mean, today climate change is not something we need to discuss whether it is there or not. It is very much there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, government, see, finally, the government has to do it. Otherwise, nobody else can. And maybe when the government has to intervene, Yeah, yeah. No, no. The, the, the threat is very real. One feature of increase in 25 years. Of... Too big. I will give you, sir, elaborate West Bengal post No, and one more thing I want to tell you, sir. When you say one meter, no? Particularly our part of, like, she has yeah. talked about Bimstek. I mean, the Bay of Bengal area. It has 25% of humanity. The population density is very high. Aapka one meter in this part of the world and one meter somewhere else means very different. Yes. That, that, yes. The impact it will have of it going underwater. Absolutely. 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 True. Apart from what is that, Calcutta and all of these eastern part of this So eastern part of the part no, no, very much true. I mean, Bangladesh uh, is very densely populated. I mean, such a small country yeah. in terms of area, but the density of population is very high. And the danger of, uh, you know, sea level rise in those parts of the world will be... Uh, I mean, I, in fact, even in my presentation, you would have seen migration. I mean, large-scale migration will happen from these things. And that will become a security, uh, uh, internal security uh, issue. If they come and, you know, see, the, the human tolerance is only to a certain limit. After that, it is a major security concern. Yes, yes. But there's not a bear cat. What is part of the UV? Absolutely, absolutely. Absolute. No, it's me. Equal dimension, sir. This seawater is coming in, no? 
there's a lot of uh, salt intake uh, so usme kheti nahi hoti hai so the effect is not ki pani aa gaya hai it is far more uh, see, that is one thing i mean you can you, how how you can yes adapt to how how you can adapt to such a change yes certainly certainly that's it. yes No, it's uh, the I mean that is one more dimension jo coastal erosion ki aap baat kar rahe hain. Uh, uh, that's part of the sediment management uh, thing which uh, Romit had talked about. There was not enough time, so he has covered some part. But there, I mean, when we talk about sediment management, isme coastal erosion is one big problem. Riverine erosion is one big problem. Then even port management becomes a very big problem. So these are very multifaceted issues. Its impact also has to be seen in a very multifaceted way. Problem, what happens is, even when we talk about, now if, it, if I talk about UDA, I have to deal with 17 ministries. Whether it is water resource, whether it is, uh, you know, uh, family welfare, tak bhi aata hai because, you know, people get affected. So, there is, so you have to deal with so many organizations, so many ministries, and each of the ministries have their own, uh, you know, mandate and agenda. Even... I mean, I'll give you a uh, simple example. I was part of this uh, uh, under the Blue Economy Task Force and otherwise also. Now, seaweed. Seaweed has so many benefits, which uh, Shlok had presented. It is very good for even organic farming. Now, we, you know, we want to... Uh, now, to fertilizer our import, hota, I mean, phosphate and nitrogen uh, gets imported. That can be, I mean, almost 90% import. Hota. Now, to offset that, if you just put the seaweed, I mean, the discharge of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus happens maximum from seaweed. Now, you don't have to do any processing, just put it like on, in the farms. You know, that's the organic farming that we talk about. Now, today we are producing 25,000 tons of seaweed. The government's own official target is 10 million tons. Now, to cover this journey from 25,000 tons to 10 million tons, there's a lot of things that are required. Now, Isma, I will tell you how these ministries, uh, you know, operating in their own thing. Now, the uh, Ministry of Environment has come up with the Biodiversity Act. On one end, one ministry has a target to reach 10 million tons. From the Environment Ministry, this Biodiversity Act has completely put a uh, spanner in the works. You cannot grow. I mean, seaweed grow technically, you need play, uh, space. Gulf of Manar, mein, uh, they were trying to do, pe, uh, the, uh, now it is banned by another ministry. So how do you deal with it? And seaweed, mein kya hua? normally what happens, like if I talk about the deep sea mission, usme the government of India invested since 1987, we are investing in exploring. Now in seaweed, the private sector got in. Some of our partners got in very seriously with a lot of, you know, 200, 300 crores kind of investment they got in. Now, if there is a ban, what do you do? And when that investment has happened, how do you go about it? Now, in a democracy, I mean, like I yesterday I talked about, you know, politically acceptable and all that. It's not easy. And see, if we try to override, what we will become like China. And I don't think, see, today, whatever said, I mean, we can discuss India has this problem, that problem. But even today, India is the darling of the world. Anybody wants to come and work with us. Why? That's what Ambassador Mudgal also said. We have upheld democratic values. This is democratic values. We are allowing the environment ministry to have, they have genuine concerns. Yes, people are trying to respond to it. People are trying and at some point, you know, there will be a, a correct de debate and something, some solution will come out of it. That is what we need to understand. If we start uh, and that's all, you know, even in bigger organizations like yours and Navy also, there are certain audit organizations which are supposed to be independent of you. If you do not allow them to function, then we will just override everything. That is not acceptable. In the long run, we will have a lot of price to pay. Yes, our development may be slow, but we are still there. See, we can say our development is slow. We have become the third largest economy. So something is right. So we have to be very sure of that. Now, even in case of this also, as I said, 
yes there are certain issues but there is definitely there's a lot of work and i feel government is doing what it has to do even we have to also do what we can do and that's what we are trying to do no no absolutely absolutely yes yes no no we are doing that we are doing that and see the government also to take us seriously it takes a little while you know now see when you have such senior people coming and speaking the way they are speaking you know that builds up the reputation and the credibility see they will not re re risk their reputation to just come and speak without it you know i have had at least four to five meetings with him and you know i've known him for three four years that's how you know they have built a trust factor and but they have also see you've seen that he's almost spoken the language that i have spoken right but that he's done the reading and you know he's an iit graduate and a whole lot of things so and they have started connecting i mean today when he talked about we have been talking about msp right he used the word gati shakti you know what it means today there is a government infrastructure gati shakti is a government infrastructure usme itne sare layer hain which has already connected everybody matlab right from gram panchayat to everything and even organizations are connected all we need to do is put in our inputs into it and the whole uda gati shakti will happen just like that and he is going to be writing very soon on a on multiple public factory uh, uh, platforms he's already done uh, social media mein unhone already isko dal diya hai so what i'm trying to say that these kind of frameworks take a long time but once it comes now you know what is the purpose of gati shakti being done like that there are global investments into gati shakti now if gati shakti mein even if you have to build a bridge now if somebody has to do business at like aap circle ki baat kar liye kahi ka bhi aap you take an example if it is managed by a data driven platform like this everybody gets confidence ki this is transparent and this is good so these kind of things now india is moving at a very different pace you see the covid management in this country it was largely data driven the entire world thought that will collapse we have come out the best out of covid this is digital transformation in india that is happening all i am saying is that digital transformation too has to go under water so i cannot create the platforms that have been created like uh, in fact sir was uh, 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 dr ajay kumar was in ministry of uh, information technology before defense so a lot of these platforms have been created during his time e-commerce and all those platform but they are all connecting various people ek bar wo connect ho gaye platform ban gaya what you do and how you use depends on you it's simple like in your organization you make a whatsapp group now how you use the once a whatsapp group is done you established how it will be operated usme kya norms honge you know you will not allow anybody to disturb once that maturity has come after that you can use it for anything you can use it for operation you can use it for environmental monitoring you can use it but creating that platform is not easy because in a government system there are certain norms that have to be followed i cannot be allowed i mean i can keep criticizing government because mere tarah se nahi ho raha because i am not getting what i want that that's not how the government of india can work so there is a little struggle in the beginning but once you are into that system then you see the strength of the system and that's why institution building is very important once you institutionalize this then everybody can tap into it now if bsf comes on board this so many other uh, institutions like them uh, can come in and once they come in and as i said in the beginning we are all instruments of the government of india now when we come into a system you imagine the strength of the government i'll give you a very simple example i went to the northeast when i was a naval officer for some adventure once i went there i went and met the uh, aoc there air officer commanding there we had air support if there is an accident can anybody think of it to tell you but if it's a government of india organization even say bsf goes or coast guard goes you will get that support the aoc was so kind arnab you just you know these are the numbers you give a call 10 minutes our air assets will be available to you now when i am running a private organization can i ever imagine such a thing can happen it cannot happen that is the strength of government organizations like even for us i mean when i tell my boys if you have to do any kind of 
I mean, today, in fact, as I talk, I got a letter from a very almost head of Navy. If you have to do field experiment, getting assets there, if Navy says we are with you, it is a five minute job. Once the entire top leadership has said something, the local commander can make 10 uh, assets available to me and there is no cost involved. Once they are convinced that it is in the national cause, can a private agency even think of doing that? These are the strengths. So, but at the same time, if they start doing it for anybody and everybody, there is something wrong with them. So that is how we have to, so now to build that maturity, to build that credibility, it will obviously take a certain, you know, rounds of checks and balances that, you know, you are really committed to the cause. Otherwise anybody can hijack the process. So that is how it is. So now slowly we have reached, see, you can say I'm doing good for it, but you may also have certain agendas. That's what I would try. The reports that are coming, anybody can claim it is for the good, global good or greater public good, but they are driven with agendas. So you have to be very careful that you do not become part of an agenda driven aspect. So that takes a little while, but once it is done, you know, the strength of, and today, why is the whole government, I mean, whole world is looking at India, even America is looking at India for what, you know, the strength that, that we have, the, what is the market that we are talking about? The American companies, they have to do business, they have to come here, nowhere else can they go. And that's why they're taking us seriously. Now, the point is how we leverage that. Now, between China and America also, both of them want us to be with them. And that is where the government is pursuing. Strategic autonomy is very important. Now, what is happening to the same situation is with uh, Sri Lanka and other countries also. They have become victims of great power rivalry. Now, you have to position yourself correctly that you are able to balance the two. What Ambassador Mudgal he has a very different way of, you know, you can't buy friendship. You try and buy friendship, the cost will keep going up and it will at one stage it will become unaffordable and it will start hurting you. So that is, you know, we can criticize certain things are not happening, but we've also covered, I mean, there was a, somebody I met recently, he said, you can't look back and say, see, I've covered that distance and pat on your back. There's a long way to cover. So you have to look in front also, but yes. When you are criticizing, you also have to say that, yes, we see India kind of problem. You look at the diversity that we have now, like yesterday, there was a discussion on, you know, we, we are not getting a certain kind of resources. We can do this or we can compare to China. Now you imagine the kind of diversity that we have in this country, healthcare, education, agriculture. There are so many sectors, which there is so much work to be done. So. We are, we have still done well. I mean, we started our space program uh, so early in our thing. We started DRDOs were started just after independence. IITs were started uh, that time. Can you imagine our leadership thought of it? And that has paid so much dividend today. You see the American, I mean, if you go to the Bay area, all the CEOs are Indians only, no? How that is a brain power and someday they will come back. See earlier we used to uh, criticize brain drain there is that's become an asset today as i said everybody wants recognition in his own homeland right so they also want to come and do something here anybody who's going i mean i meet many of these ceos who are there they always say what can we do here so of course they sometimes feel that our ecosystem is not matured enough see today when all of you are here we have discussed definitely we will move in this positive direction that's all is required we can't say Aji sab to ho sakta. but at least we'll trigger and you know senior officers there but there are some young officers also they will grow up with this by the time they come to a decision making level probably the ecosystem also would have become much more matured and they will also contribute towards the ecosystem getting matured so you have to invest that much without any doubt so I have, I have answered your question because it's a, it's a slow process, but it's a better thing. A slow process is always better. Otherwise, you know, China is, uh, I mean, when I told you desertification, young, I work on under uh, freshwater dolphins, freshwater dolphins are very, very unique. They, they are blind. So they work, uh, use acoustic vision. Now the Yangtze river last 20 years, we have not found a single, uh, uh, freshwater dolphin in it. 
that's the price they're paying for development now very soon this will start hurting them that's already started hurting them they financially it's become a bubble now it may collapse any time but we are still on the right track demography you see we are still you know yeah. on the positive side of demography so that that's kind of thing Sir, uh, we are working. Yeah, no, no, we are working on a project which I can't speak in public. We can talk about it differently, but uh, government is very much concerned. And there was a committee uh, which I was also part of it uh, when the Indus Water Treaty was revoked. So definitely, you know, I mean, we are probably we are not the only one. There are many other people also by uh, commissioned by the government of India. I'm not saying privately. But uh, once I became part of it, so we have like Catherine is a researcher doing that work and we are uh, definitely. So now, sir, when we start a study, we look at it in a macro picture. But these kind of interactions give us a lot more, you know, understanding of which are the priority areas because you are facing it. And that's why this kind of workshops are very important. So I will definitely note down and when we can continue our conversation, we will definitely look at it. And uh, either it is part of that or something we can do with you. So we will be definitely, I mean, we do have the expertise that much I can tell you. But another issue is that on certain sensitive issues like this, we can't start working on our own because whatever happens, if whatever data we generate, it cannot be in public domain. So I have to be very careful. Like even when I work with the Navy also, certain projects when we discuss, I mean, I do things on my own and, you know, for a larger understanding. but to go very specific into something is a little dangerous for me because I'm a private entity now. I'm no more part of the government. So when I work with the government, then, you know, they also establish certain protocols of what is to be put in the, like, then we sign, like I did some projects with the government of India. So there we are given certain protocols and we follow those protocols that, you know, what can be revealed, what cannot be revealed or what can be shared or, so that's why it is important that a government agency is involved. So in certain matters, we work with the Navy or whatever the comment says, whether it's Navy Coast Guard. So we would like to work in that manner. So very specific, like you talk about a specific area that I don't think I can work with my research. Now, even as an organization, some of my research scholars will work with me for some time, then they'll go somewhere else. Now, where they go can become a dangerous issue. So I have to be very careful. Now, when I work with a on a specific project with government, then, you know, it's only me who's working and, you know, I have to maintain a certain protocol. So we do that. We consciously do that because there are very serious uh, issues and we need to follow those protocols. So when we got some certain projects, we sign a certain kind of, and then the protocol is decided. I may have given a draft to it, but, you know, that is promulgated by the government or a government agency. Maybe it can be BSF also. Then we follow those things so that no data, which is not supposed to be outside the system, should be outside the system. That, that's what I'm trying to say. Yes, Divya. Uh, so I just wanted to add. Please, to please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah. What you mentioned. So uh, apart from uh, government also taking initiative, I think there is less sensitivity with respect to the impacts of climate change. Uh, the limitation that the people who are uh, like the coastal authorities or the port authorities specifically. So there was, uh, there are a multiple incidents where they do not acknowledge the impacts of climate change on their critical infrastructure. I think that needs to come from within the government. The sensitization part needs to come from within the government. Then only the uh, comprehensive or a broad study can be undertaken uh, under the guidance of the government so that they have understood what are the targeted uh, areas that they need to work on then only a study which can actually uh, help them understand or mitigate those challenges in the future will be able will be there 
uh, but i think the first step would be sensitizing the people sensitizing the coastal authorities specifically it's lo located in those areas uh, not just the uh, general public but also the port authorities which uh, i think there are a, a lot of perception that their infrastructure is safe from climate change they are not going to impact the climate change but they do not know the kind of uh, impacts the climate change will have on their infrastructure so that part is uh, lagging uh, specifically and also the understanding that the sea level rise is not going to impact the socio economic impact but it will also have an impact on the ez which will lead to more conflict in the region with respect to bangladesh if our uh, half of our land is underwater how are we going to define the ez is it going to be the same way it was earlier or is there going to be another way so we need to deliberate upon all these issues and how the climate change will have an impact not just on socio economic factors but uh, but on the global order as well as the international law that uh, ez have an, can have an implication on the countries security aspects so i think these needs to be deliberate upon and this cannot be done alone by one organization you need multiple stakeholders ranging from industries to government to think tanks to individuals who are working on those areas and uh, until and unless everyone will uh, everyone will not come together we will never be able to find a solution yes. that's it sir no absolutely no no it's not only a red industry that is yeah. No, no. Uh, I'll, I'll just uh, yes. No, no. I, I, I'll just add to what she said. Definitely, what you said is absolutely uh, uh, in order. Uh, another thing. Now, the government has to work on mechanisms. So, government of India has come up with an organization called Capacity Building Commission. Now, these things, climate change, these are new things. You know, I mean, people who have now become senior, like my contemporaries, are all now commodores in the navy. Now, when we initially learned, did our studies, climate change was not part of our syllabus, or we never discussed all that. Now, the government, what they have done is they have set up an organization called Capacity Building Commission. Their job is to enhance the skill, knowledge, and attitude of government officials. So, there are 30 million government officials, including all of you, uh, both in the state, state and the center. So, what they have done is they have set up a, a, a platform called IGOT. Yogi. So in IGOT, they have uploaded a lot, of, including 10 of our e-learning modules. So you can access it from there also, but we are also happy to share it with you. So uh, these are 10 modules you have uploaded. But what Divya said is also important. And Divya, I think this is part of one of your e-learning modules also, uh, what we have discussed. You know, what will be the social impact, socio economic impact? I mean, what will be the impact on the community? That is part of uh, the e-learning module. So different modules are there in what is the impact of climate change and then how we can you know, take it forward. So we are trying to create this material. Absolutely, it will change. So those things are definitely being uh, discussed and the government already set up a mechanism for that. So I think we are moving in the right direction. The speed may not be you know, uh, uh, to our liking. The other thing which uh, Mudgal sir was also mentioning there is this ESG, uh, environmental, uh, social, and governance. So in that also now companies are supposed to, like you talked about boards, they have also they are also supposed to submit their ESG report. So climate change is very much part of the ESG report. But what is happening is, you know, how competent is the organization which is doing, doing the ESG evaluation is something. So now we are also working on a project where it will be an MSP-based ESG. So all these factors that we are talking about will get covered. So, yeah, I think this is a very important discussion and I'm happy that all of you have taken that much interest. But uh, we, it will be an ongoing uh, discussion and we have to continuously you know, look at it more seriously. Because the point is, it's not just us. The next generation, what we leave for them is something very important. I mean, when we talk about nations, the nations are not for 100 years, they are for thousands of years. So what we do today has to uh, you know, be relevant for that kind of time scale. Otherwise, you know, we'll go horribly wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Divya. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, sir. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. That's why, sir. Hey, now, like, see, I can talk about the coastal region. Now, India has 7,500 kilometers coastline. 
Now there has to be a master plan. Now, if I go today and say I want to set up a resort here, is it the best utilization of that land? Wape aquaculture ho sakta hai, wape tourism is just one. There can be so many other things. Somebody can put up a shipyard there. Now we uh, so there is definitely a plan, but what kitta implement hota is anybody's uh, uh, guess. But there is when we make a, even a city ka master plan hona chahiye, then where you put up a green zone, where you keep it up an industrial zone. So I can only talk about the coastal zone. So MSP can be a major uh, you know tool for government to plan a master plan. Now, there are certain areas where fishing is, uh, the, which the fish stock is better, then you allocate those areas for fishing. Uh, if there is some, some place, uh, and if there is nothing else you can do, you put up a resort. But that somebody has to plan that. There are pressures, there are whole kind of uh, things are there, but some balance has to be there. So now with this uploading, I mean, 10 of our uh, 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 things, and I I recently received a very uh, uh, important um, email from one of the very senior scientists from CSIR that your modules are very, very useful. So now I'm told more than 500 officers have gone through it. So in due course, if more officers go through these uh, uh, e-learning modules, they are far better equipped to take decisions in the right direction. So that is how it will happen. It will take a little time. Maybe it will take a little longer than what we expect. But definitely, we as a country, we are moving in the right direction. That's all I can. I mean, we have to know, uh, end it in a positive note in any case, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. No, no, sir. You are very much right. Yes. Absolutely. No, no. The, see, uh, now, uh, see, when you take, I mean, I'm not talking just about him, anybody, you will also head an organization. When you sit on that chair as a head of an organization, you have a very limited time. Two years, three years maximum? Yeah, eight sal. Now, in that one year or two years in your tenure, you have a choice. Either you can clean, clean up the past muck or you contribute something new. That balance is very important as a leader. How do you leave your mark? What is the legacy that you leave behind? I mean, all of us, I mean, all of you are leaders, you head an organization, that period that you get, like even, you know, I met one of the Naval chiefs, uh, you know, and there was a very senior person with me. He, and is now I think you'll meet him on the last day. He told the Naval chief, you have exactly one and a half years. You are under pressure to make a difference. Because see, you have to be balanced. Yes, there is anywhere you go, there will be some past mark to be cleaned and you have to look ahead also. So how do you balance the two is something, you know. So every individual has to make that choice in a more balanced way. I have to definitely clean up uh, some muck which has been created by, you know, the people. But at the same time, also continue the march forward. So how do you balance the two is not so easy. And it all depends on, then you also come with a certain strength. I mean, if three of you are there, you're going to head BSF at some point. All three of you come with a different set of skill set and, you know, understanding and capabilities. So obviously you also have to do something which is your thing. So that brings a new dimension to, you know, how the, the organization moves forward. Like when I was there, you know, I have a slight a different orientation. There will be others who have different. So everybody should leave a mark in that sense. I mean, it can't be completely biased that, you know, you do everything new. Well, like, I had this danger that, you know, I had certain new ideas. But if I put everything of that, after I leave, then what happens to the organization? And all that investment will go down the drain, which is not correct. So how do you balance all those things? So bringing everything new will not be a very great idea. So we have to be very balanced. So this requires a lot of maturity. And I think as leaders... I mean, the reason I got Radhika ma'am today and you'll meet Lakshmi tomorrow, you will say, Iskar, UDA ke saath kya connection? But that brings a different dimension, how you think in a broader perspective. Because at a leadership level, you have to think very broad, but still take a very focused decision. But you have to have that kind of input. You see, what is the importance of history? You have to understand. If you do not know how we have reached here, you will not know where to go. And that's what history teaches you. You have to get your, abhi people say, ye bhi kar do, wo bhi kar do. can I do it? I have to also know where I have come from. How will I go forward? So unless I understand the history, you know, then hundreds of ideas will come. You moment you take over a new organization, there are so many people with new ideas. 
आपके अपने भी बहुत सारे न्यू आइडियाज हाफ ऑफ एड्यूल से कि मेरे जो आइडियाज वो भी नहीं प्रैक्टिकल है वो भी मैं नहीं कर सकता हूँ बट दैट हैजू बी अ वेरी कॉन्शियस डिसीजन दैट आई डू इट इन अ वेरी न्यूएंस वे otherwise we get emotionally driven and wo it will ruin you know uh, what we are trying to do so that's something you know we need to really look at thank you